Long Road Home, Volume 2. The Plan. A post-apocalyptic adventure, written by Lance K. Ewing. Audiobook produced by Book TV. Chapter 1. Estes Park, Colorado. Honey, I'm home, announced Tex, walking through the front door of Trey's uncle's cabin. Trey heard it, straining his hearing, with his right ear pressed up against the dimly lit room door. He hadn't moved in more than two hours after trying to kick it open without success. He almost smiled, thinking how Alex wasn't able to do it either, only a week ago. He almost smiled, but didn't. In fact, he wasn't sure he ever would again. Tex was back, and wasn't quiet about announcing his return. He had made a trip back into the bar after chasing down the mayor outside. Ten minutes later he was asked to leave, on the losing end of the barback's shotgun. Quickly snatching a bottle of whiskey, the brand didn't matter, he stumbled out to the words, There's no fighting in my bar. Tex laughed. He had gotten in a sucker punch on the first guy, and the second went down like a sack of taters, he thought. So much for staying low and blending in, he mumbled, stumbling down the middle of the street. This time he had what he wanted, a new job, money in his pocket, and a new place to call home that only he and Mayor Haskins would know about. He smiled that crooked smile the kids in grade school always made fun of, thinking, I may have a new girlfriend, too. I must be doing something good, he announced, looking towards the ceiling, because I sure do feel blessed. Trey heard it, and so did Beth, jumping up out of a deep sleep, both feeling sick but neither saying a word. I'm starved. How about you, honey? He called up the stairs. What you want? Spaghetti? Why, sure, darling, anything for you he continued, as if they were actually having a conversation. Spaghetti on the grill ain't nothing but a thrill, that's right, he sang, swigging off the bottle he brought from the bar. And my girl, I've got my eyes set on you. Yes, you're lucky, cause I'll be true blue. Beth realized she'd been sleeping, or passed out maybe, and called out quietly to the only room she shared a wall with, hoping Trey was there. Knocking lightly with her knuckle once, then a pause, and twice more. There was a pause and she feared she had the wrong room. Then it came back just the same. She could hear a muffled singing voice of her captor, probably out on the patio cooking, she thought. Trey, Trey, can you hear me? She whispered. Nothing. There was no response, and she called louder, looking down at her shaking hands. Trey, are you there? Yes, Beth, I'm here, she heard back. Are you okay? Did he hurt you or anything else? Anything what? Sorry, I just mean, did he do anything? No. She replied after waiting a minute as Tex had stopped singing only to start up again. No, I'm okay, but tied up. Come over. I can't. He boarded up the door from the outside. Oh, I'm sorry. I was passed out, I guess. I didn't hear any of it, she replied. It's okay, but we need to make a plan, said Trey. There's a window in here, but the drop is a leg breaker for sure, or worse. Can't you tie sheets together like in the movies? None in here. It's an extra room and the sheets are always downstairs until someone needs them. I should have called out an hour ago. Maybe a neighbor or passerby would have heard me and sent for help, he thought, not admitting to her how scared he was to try, without knowing if Tex was here or not. Dinner coming up, darling, Tex announced thirty minutes later. Spaghetti cona marinariki with some kind of bread, he said, carefully laying the steaming plate in front of her meticulously arranged and paired with a white linen napkin and a glass of white wine. Beth thought briefly about correcting his grammar and quickly dismissed the idea. What? No thank you for the first-class meal. Maybe you've never had one before. I have, she stated bluntly. After all, it was a fact. She realized for the first time that she was unafraid, or maybe less so, if she were honest. Don't worry. I made some for your boyfriend. The old one, of course. I won't hold it against you. You hadn't met me yet. How could you have known what you were missing? He disappeared, and she heard him go out the front door downstairs, returning with heavy thumping up the stairs, followed by a loud hum, not that of a ceiling fan, but something raw, revving and whining. Beth was a city girl, but knew the sound of a chainsaw. She froze, thinking he was playing some sick joke like the last meal of a death row inmate before the final blow. She shook as it got louder right outside her door. The saw's teeth snarled, 
ripping into something with a high-pitched scream that had her hands instinctively over both ears and begging for it to stop. Thump, 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 thump flooded her ears, as if her heart would leap out of her chest. She turned away, praying for a quick end if it was to be, and a minute later all was quiet. Tex slid a plate of food under the newly cut door. Just the bottom two inches were enough. It isn't as thoughtfully prepared as my new girl's, Tex thought, but it's food, and it should shut him up for a night at least. Water in a plastic Ziploc-style bag went through next in one of those little airline bottles of gin he found in the kitchen. He wasn't the kind of man to give away booze to a stranger or a foe at any cost. He just despised gin, is all, and thought it must have come from his childhood. Either way, he felt like he did something good, although he wasn't about to let Trey go. Not now, after he knew so much. No, that wouldn't do, and everyone needs a last supper, he said under his breath. Tex insisted on feeding Beth, although she had one free arm. The task was performed with delicacy, even surprising Beth, who kept waiting for the next advance or anything she would have said no to. I have a surprise soon, my darling, he told her. What's that, babe? she answered, even shocking herself with the unfounded outburst. Too many cable shows with the victims playing into their captors' expectations just long enough to gain some trust and make a run for it, she thought. Anyway, it sounded absurd coming from her mouth, and she knew he would never fall for it. Babe, huh? he said. We'll see soon enough, but I like the sound of it, he continued, with that crooked smile that he would swear women adored. What's the news? she asked again. Well, it's a surprise, he whispered. But we may be moving soon. Don't tell the other guy, he added, winking to her and nodding towards the far wall. Is he coming with us? she asked, trying to sound confident and calm at the same time. If he wants to, of course. You don't think I would leave him here, do you? No, that's not what I meant. I just was asking, is all. We're a family, said Tex. The three of us, until we're not. You're pretty, real pretty, but I bet you already knew that. I have a family that is back home in California. They are waiting for me, I'm sure of it. I want to go home. Is that okay? What kind of family? He asked in a growl. Oh, nothing like that, she quickly responded, sitting on her hands to stop the shaking. Just my parents and two sisters. Me too, minus the adults. I'm sorry to hear that. About your parents, I mean. So are they... These dishes aren't going to do themselves, he added abruptly, standing. Do you need to use the bathroom? She nodded yes, and he untied her hand, leading her to it and giving her privacy but standing just outside the door. No running water, so just close the lid, he told her, as if she hadn't been here for a few days already. Good night, my love, he said, retying her to the bed, but with enough rope to reach the bathroom before heading back downstairs. He had used that line several times in the past, with the realization that love was something he had never felt, not even towards his mother or sisters. He liked them well enough, the sisters, but maybe that was all. Tex woke up, hung over, with a headache he couldn't shake. Gotta get straight, gotta get paid, gotta get going down the line, he sang, as he had a dozen times before. But today, it meant new digs, a fresh start, and one less mouth to feed. I'll be back he said under his breath, quietly slipping out the front door. He made a point to stay on the front side of the cabin where he couldn't be seen from Beth's and Trey's windows. Time to get mine, he said with a grin, headed on foot towards town. He laughed at the sketches he saw on the way in, five if he was counting. It's not me, not anymore, he ranted, lightly touching the scar above his eye. The mayor's office was easy to find and the hired thugs, as most men around here called them, were nothing more than a nuisance for Tex. Hey there, sissy boys, he said, meeting the first two at the door. The response was as expected, a tough exterior fading quickly as he cut the first man's hand in seconds with his switchblade. The mayor's man screamed, looking down at the nearly three-inch slice along the palm of his left hand. Hey, hey now, that's not necessary, yelled Mayor Haskins. We're all on the same page here, gentlemen. I would say we are now, replied Tex, with a wink that gave the mayor a pit in his stomach. Now, sir, let's get down to business. 
he said, sitting across from the mayor and propping his work boots on the desk. Hey, Drifter, called out one of Mayor Haskins' men. That's not allowed. Name's Trey, and I ain't no drifter. In fact, I'm a bona fide resident. Me and my girl, that is. Anyway, Mayor, we got a big rat upstairs causing problems, and I need a new place like Pronto. I'm sure you can handle one rat, Trey, the mayor started to say, trailing off as it hit him like a slap in the face. I gotta see a man about a horse, he said, rising quickly and heading for the office door. Don't go hurting anybody, Trey, he called out. Be right back. With his left hand in his jeans pocket, Mayor Haskins clutched the photograph of the sketch the artist kid made only a few days ago. Sneaking into the men's bathroom downstairs, he instinctively read aloud the sign he crudely made when it started. Use bucket and water to flush. Sparingly, please. Pulling the half-crumpled picture from his jeans front pocket, he felt his stomach churn. Shooting up a house or even taking out a rival was nothing compared to the scene he heard grisly details of out on the highway. You're not Trey. Your name is Tex, he said aloud, as the door opened swiftly. If I stayed up there any longer, you wouldn't have any boys left to run around, said Tex, getting a jump out of the mayor, still holding the picture. Not a bad rendition, don't you think? asked Tex. I don't know why I didn't see it before, replied the mayor, his voice cracking at the revelation. Did you really do those things outside of town, Tex? Does it matter? I guess it doesn't, but I can't have the man who did that hanging out all winter terrorizing my citizens. Unless you order it, right? asked Tex, with that crooked signature smile. When it's done, I'll expect you to leave town, said the mayor, more as a question. We'll see. I'm starting to like it up here. Everyone is real nice, that's a fact, but it don't mean I can't be bought out. Huh? You know, you buy your freedom and your citizens as well. Mayor Haskins looked confused having never heard anyone speak to him like this. All I'm saying is, I like it here. We both do, my girl and me, but every man has his price, and I may just tell you what mine is to leave town, but not yet. I need a new place to stay, and if you rat me out to anyone, well, I'm sure you can guess how it will end. Tex was fascinated with old gangster movies, always had been. He loved when they would threaten someone who owed them money with unnamed violence. The owner always imagined the absolute worst type of punishment, and once anyone got to know Tex even just a little, they imagined he could do the same. Do this or else, with no other explanation. And they did. The ones who knew, that is. So where's my new place, Mr. Mayor Man? I'm going to need it by morning. Well, uh, I haven't really found the exact one yet that would be a good fit. Maybe you and your lady friend could stay with one of my guys until we can find a suitable place. All right. Tomorrow morning I'll be here at your office around the same time. Either you have a vacant house close by or I'll take yours and you can stay with your special guy friend. I meant my employee, replied the mayor quickly. Yeah, that's what I done said. Tomorrow morning. Good day, sir, added Tex, walking out the door. Hey, called the mayor from behind. What about the job? I'm on it, boss man came the reply without turning around. Mayor Haskins, still confused about what just happened, met back up with his guys but didn't dare tell them who Trey really was. You want us to take care of that Trey guy, boss? asked one. I'm not sure you all could, even so, not yet. I need him around for a while, but I'll let you know when I'm done with him. That's a promise. Chapter 2 Holman Ranch a honk at Rick and Judy's ranch gate startled them both. Rick saw the sheriff through his binoculars and wondered what could possibly be next. Another arrest, maybe. Or something worse. You're not back to take me in again, are you? Asked Rick, once at the gate. No, nothing like that. I heard from the judges all and wanted you to be the first to hear it. It's not bad news, but not what I was hoping either. Well, let's hear it, said Judy, walking up just a few paces behind Rick. Well, first off, he doesn't want me to rearrest the mayor, at least not yet. Next, he and the other judges will not approve an election this week, but they set it out for two more weeks. At least that's better than spring. Okay, replied Rick. And what else? Nothing else. That's it. Although Mayor Haskins behind bars again sounds unlikely unless he does something else. I'm sorry, Judy. It's just out of my hands at the moment. I understand. We both do. Just keep doing a good job and make sure we're in the loop every step. 
Yes, ma'am, I can do that. Good day to you both, he added, leaving to drive back towards town. What do you think, honey? she asked. Honestly, it's about what I expected. We'll just have to beat the mayor the old-fashioned way, with hard work and honesty. I don't see him sticking around too long after the election, so let's work hard for a couple of weeks and give this town what it wants. What it needs for a fresh start. You in? Always, honey. You ought to know that by now. I'll tell Alex and his campaign manager tomorrow. I woke up missing Shannon by my side, but understood. She had a young girl who had gone through more heartache than most adults ever do, and Shannon was doing a balancing act between being a big sister and the fill-in for the mom Jenny lost. I'm liking this, said Scott at breakfast. Our own place, I mean. I like the Holmans, and Grady's family also, but there's a lot going on and it's nice to get a break from... He trailed off with my face change, not seeing Jenny walk up behind him. She's right behind me, isn't she? Oh, I'm really sorry, Jenny, he added, turning around. What I meant was, let's not do this, all right, she interjected, more as a statement. Let's not tiptoe around the fact that my parents are dead. They are. It sucks, and that's it, okay? Scott was at a loss for words, as was I, and we both looked to Joe for help. Thankfully for us all, Shannon came into the room, getting us back on track. What's for breakfast? she asked, as if she hadn't heard any of the conversation. Her whisper to Jenny said she had, but the moment was over as fast as it started, and five minutes later we were discussing the campaign and powdered eggs. Which came first, the freeze-dried chicken or the powdered egg? I joked, getting no positive response and a few groans. If you were expecting Seinfeld, good luck. I'm all you've got, unless... Unless what? asked Jenny. I'm glad you asked unless you guys think you can stop me. Are you suggesting a comedy standoff like that show's last comic? Standing, I finished. And yes, that's exactly what I'm proposing, unless, of course, you're all chicken. It sounded dumb coming from my mouth, like a middle-grade schoolyard dare, but I could see they were all considering it, maybe trying to recall an old joke, or even part of a routine. I've got Richard Pryor, George Carlin and Seinfeld memorized, word for word, I told them, plus a bunch of others, so don't even consider stealing something. It's original only, or go home. I don't know a single person you mentioned, said Jenny. You're kidding, right? I asked. No soup for you, I'm just kidding anyway. Who's in? Jenny raised her hand almost immediately, followed by Shannon and Joe. Come on, Scott, are you in? I asked, with everyone looking on. I don't have any jokes, he replied. Sure you do, just tell jokes about rich kids, I suggested. Ha <laughs> ha, not funny. Maybe I'll come up with something about kids of oil parents who go off to a fancy L.A. film school. I love it, I replied, knowing he was both joking and referring to me as well. I can't wait to hear it, said Shannon, giving me a wink. Okay, let's all take the day to prepare, and we will have the competition tonight, I suggested. Maybe a max of five minutes per gig. All agreed and I could see the wheels turning as each thought about their routines. I was not expecting Jenny to join in, as comedy was probably the furthest thing from her mind, but I think I got it after seeing her hand right away. Any distraction, especially one that needed to be prepared for, whether a mayoral race or stand-up routine, was better than the quietness of a tortured mind. My whole life, I wanted to try stand-up comedy in a dive bar. With my luck, I would end up on the losing end of a viral video, or be like one of those TV competition singers who have been told their whole life by their family that they had a voice the world needed to hear, only to be embarrassed, getting cut from the show in the first round. Here was different. We were all friends, and Jenny already thought I wasn't funny, so there wasn't much to lose or gain, I guessed. We campaigned a bit more casually this day, after Rick told us the election would be another two weeks out. Our comedy challenge was soberly sidelined with the news that Jenny's parents were released from the coroner and would be laid to rest on the Holman Ranch late this afternoon. The neighbor brought a restored backhoe for the digging, and Jenny was satisfied with the dimensions of the holes. It always seemed strange to me. The dimensions part of a grave. Six feet deep was standard, I knew. But was it just from books or movies, and did it ring true in a typical modern graveyard? I wasn't sure, but I thought it sounded reasonable. We all attended the service, and Jenny even said a few words in front of everyone. 
honoring her mom and dad and thanking them for raising her to be a confident and caring young woman. Rick had kept the details of the incident as brief and watered down as one could when telling a young girl how her parents met their maker. The problem with the teenager, Rick thought, is that they question everything and ask twice as many follow-ups as adults. Still, his lawyer instincts kicked in, and he felt confident he had given her the truth in just the way she needed to hear it. After all, it wasn't like she was going to read about it ten years later with an online search. The truth was what she knew right now, and that was all it would ever be. When we returned home, she hugged her dog, Mama, and together they disappeared to bed. The next morning Jenny was all business, planning out the day's campaign itinerary and rescheduling our contest for tomorrow night, not taking no for an answer. I was the senior here, at least compared to her, but I looked up to her handling of not just the cards she was dealt, but how she approached life in general, like an ant building a colony. Wreck its house, and it pivots and builds a new mound. Wreck that one, and it makes another. She had that mentality and work ethic and kept it separate somehow from the horror of night and the dreams she must have. One thing was clear. We were becoming family, all of us, and Jenny was now an equal part. So much for living out a carefree early twenties lifestyle, I told Shannon that night. It's like we skipped a decade and are well into our mid-thirties, and poor Jenny missed her sweet teens. We just need to be whatever she needs, not necessarily one or the other, she added. I think I follow, I replied, but just for clarity. <laughs> she may need us to be parental figures every now and then, and like a brother and sister the rest of the time. I get it, I replied. Like taking in a stray dog, I almost said aloud, before realizing how stupid it sounded. You two have the afternoon off, said Shannon, pointing to Scott and me after campaigning all morning. Mrs. Holman has invited the girls out to lunch here in town. Rick and Grady are doing some work on Grady's family home, so go have fun and meet us back here for supper. Well, buddy, what's it going to be? I asked Scott. A nice lunch or maybe some darts and pool? I can eat any time, but it may be a while before we get another chance to be swinging bachelors, he replied. I don't know about swinging, but let's get a drink and relax a bit, I told him. We headed to the only open bar we saw downtown, putting our money on the bar. Ah! Are you guys old enough to drink? asked the seasoned mixologist. Barely, but yes, I said, putting my ID up on the bar. Still checking IDs, huh? Until someone with some authority tells me not to. Beer is warm, but the spirits are good. What can I get you guys? Scotch for me, I said. Yeah, me too, please, said Scott. On the rocks if you have it. Nope. Got the scotch, but no rocks anymore. The bar was two-thirds full this afternoon, and I wondered how long it would be open without the stock getting replenished. Conversations swirled around the dimly lit room. I'll bet if they knew this was coming, they would have added more windows to the front, said Scott. I'll bet he started again before I raised my hand to give me a minute. The first conversation was an older couple discussing the options of spending their last cash at a bar or on food. I guessed I had my answer since they were discussing it here. The second, a group of middle-aged women, maybe in their fifties, I surmised, surrounded one older one dressed to the nines, wearing enough jewelry to stand out even in an expensive mountain town. Wine bottles, both red and white, filled the middle of the table and the conversation nearly made me blush. So that's what they talk about when they go to book club, I joked. It's just funny how everything can change and some things are exactly the same. It is kind of dark in here, though. The conversation on the other side was a bit darker. Three men surrounding a pitcher of beer at the bar were complaining about their boss, from what I could hear. Typically, I wouldn't give it another thought, like a conversation at any bar before the day, but I heard the words Rick and Mayor followed by the words money, tray, and a special job. Are you hearing that? I said to Scott, nodding my head toward the far end of the bar. Kind of, he replied. But there's so much noise in here I can't make anything out. Nah. They're talking about the mayor, Rick, and Trey, and seem a bit pissed off, I said, straining my ears to hear more. Chapter 3 Downtown Nice watch, 
came a voice from Scott's left side as a man stumbled into a bar seat, nearly knocking it over and creating a loud bang. You okay? asked Scott, trying to help him into his seat. Nice watch, he said again without answering. Thanks, replied Scott, turning to talk to me. Let me take a look at it, the man said, reaching out his hand. Nah, I never take it off, replied Scott, taking his entire left arm off the bar and resting it on his knee. Do you know who I am? The man slurred, raising his voice and grabbing for Scott's wrist. In a split second, Scott has the drunk's hand pinned to the bar top. You should never grab for another man's watch. Didn't your daddy ever teach you that? Asked Scott. The mayor is my employer, and that makes me untouchable around here. Is that so? The same mayor who was recently incarcerated? Until, of course, the time of his breakout, replied Scott, now realizing he may have said too much. Let go of my arm, the man yelled, getting the attention of his buddies seated at the end of the bar. No, not here, said the bartender with a quick survey of the situation as the other men stood. This is a family establishment, he said aloud, quieting the city crowd spread out across the large room. Even the wine club ladies quieted and took notice. Gentlemen, the bartender said, your ensuing conversation is to be held outside. Picking up a shotgun, but pointing it towards the ground behind the bar. I wonder what your boss would think about you guys drinking in the middle of the day, said Scott to all of them. They paused, with the watchman removing his jacket ready for a fight. Scott did the same, asking me if I was ready. Us two against all those guys, I asked in a whisper. Yeah, I'll take three and leave you one, said Scott. Great, I exclaimed unenthusiastically, slowly removing my jacket. I kept an eye on the group, not wanting to make the first move. The three held the watchman back as he hurled obscenities in our general direction, and for a minute it looked as if we would go our separate ways. Scott played it cool, like a UFC fighter just before a match. So calm, one might swear he was stretching out for a casual run. What's the play? I asked, just before the watchman broke free, running across the bar and straight towards my friend. A quick right pivot and well-placed punch awaited the crazed man, putting him down with a thud. Only three left. Here comes yours, he told me, as the next one ran towards me. Maybe he didn't want any part of Scott, I thought, as he clumsily approached, giving me ample time to grab him under the arms, turn and throw him to the ground. A true fighter would have followed up with some ground and pound, but I was just happy to have him off me. Not bad, huh? I turned and said to Scott when it happened. I didn't black out when the sucker punch came, hitting my left temple. It was one of those blows you didn't see coming. That has you wondering what happened before the pain takes over, like banging your head on a rafter in a cramped attic space. I returned a right hook to his chin, sending him back and onto the ladies' club table, knocking over several bottles of wine before the women scattered in every direction. I'm really sorry, ladies, I called out. Scott had two more to deal with, holding his own, and not even getting hit from what I could tell. The distinctive rack of a shotgun had everyone pause just before the blast into the ceiling. That's enough, boys, said the bartender, keeping his weapon up in the now even darker bar, minus one overhead light. The front door swung open, with the sheriff and several deputies pouring in, zip-tying our foes' hands behind their backs and walking them out the front door. Thank you, Sheriff, I said. It could have gotten bad, added Scott. It already is bad now. Settle up with Joe, the Sheriff demanded, pointing to the bartender. And let's go. In the truck, boys, the Sheriff commanded. I think we're okay to walk home, but thanks for the help, I replied. You don't understand, Alex. I'm not asking. Now get in the truck. What about the other guys? Scott asked. They have it easier than the two of you, that's for sure, replied the Sheriff. They will spend a night in the drunk tank, only to be sprung and yelled at by the mayor for drinking and fighting on the job. But he knows he needs them, so they won't get fired. You two, on the other hand, have embarrassed not only the town you are running for office in, but more importantly, Mr. Holman. Locking you up for the night would be doing you a favor. You will get a ride home with one stop at his place, and he is waiting for you. Oh no, I said quietly like a bad boy waiting for his father to come home and surely end his life or worse. 
I saw the same look on Scott's face. A night in the jailhouse was surely better than what we faced, although that was pure speculation, I would admit. Sheriff Bradley dropped us at the Holman Gate. No more of that nonsense, boys. Understood? Yes, sir. Scott and I both replied. Mr. Holman is waiting down at the house. The walk from the front gate to the Holman compound was the longest I could ever remember. Mr. Holman was my lawyer, and not even a friend yet, really. But he and Judy took us into their home and shared all they had with us. The likelihood of them making any money off of my case vanished the first day, so the hospitality was without prejudice, as the lawyers might say. Besides, Mr. Holman was the closest thing I had to a father up here, eight hundred miles away from home. The door opened as we approached the house, with a stern Judy announcing we could take a seat in the study. I fully expected Rick to be waiting for us, ready to drop the bomb. At least it would be over quick, I thought. I was wrong, and Scott and I sat alone in the large, eerily quiet study for more than twenty minutes before the door swung open, startling us both. Rick sat behind his impressive, mahogany, I think, wooden desk, looking at us both and not saying a word. Uh, Rick, I mean, sir, I finally choked out. He held up one hand, stopping me mid-sentence. From the beginning, he said. I took the lead, and Scott didn't seem to mind. I left nothing out and did my best not to add any speculation into the story. Hmm, is all he said when I finished. Let's talk tomorrow, he added, walking out of the room. Scott and I stayed seated for another minute, not sure if we should stay or go. I was expecting something like a, this meeting is over, or I'll show you the door response, but he just walked out. Good night, boys, said Judy, as we exited the front door. Well, that was not what I expected, I told Scott. I was hoping it would be done. Now I'm not sure what to think. That's the point, isn't it? He replied. I mean, he gave us time to stew on it in his office, and now an entire night. Yeah, I see your point. We need to stay away from town for a while unless it's campaigning, he added. Crap, I said aloud. What? Jenny is what? I replied. She's going to be mad. Scott laughed aloud. So now you're more scared of a 13-year-old girl than your lawyer? I didn't say that, I fumbled. You're faced it, buddy. One of my worst personality traits, I replied. Always has been. Oh, I know. I can read you like a book. The explanation of what happened was similar when we told Shannon and Joe, with the exception of adding in the extras, like, we didn't have a choice, and they started it, much like a young boy may tell their mom when caught fighting at school. We showed up at the Holman Ranch early the following morning. I saw Jenny on the way out who apparently didn't know yet, and just told us to be back soon for work. Gentlemen, said Rick, this time sitting out on the back porch. This house, this property, he started, waving his right arm around the compound, was built with precise calculations and persistence. I'm not just talking about the structure, but what it took to earn money to have it built. Both of your fathers have done the same, and all of us made mistakes along the way. What happened yesterday in a bar at home before wouldn't be a big deal. Maybe get you a night in the drunk tank, and you probably wouldn't even need an attorney. Here now it's different. And Alex, it's the second time you've been involved in an altercation in a public setting. I know, and I'm sorry, I said. It's not like me. Before all of this happened, I only got in one fight at school, and for the most part I was just ducking and covering. I'm not saying either of you asked for this, replied Rick. I don't want to beat you up about it, but it's hard to run for office on brute force, and I need you two to earn the respect of the citizens here. So, I have a plan. Yes, sir, we both said, with me trying hard to stifle my excitement that this could possibly end well. She will be here in a few minutes. Hold tight, boys, he said, walking out of the office and closing the door. Who's she? asked Scott aloud. Judy, I replied. I guess she has a plan to fix things. She just wanted us to sweat for a while. The office door opened abruptly, with Jenny shutting it behind her and taking her place behind Rick's desk, like a boss. Uh, I started, looking back and forth between her and Scott. Uh, what? she asked, straight-faced. 
I was just expecting someone else, is all, I replied. I know, but you have me, so listen up. You, Alex, have witnesses, a lot of them, in both screw-ups. That's the black and white part. What isn't so much is what the townsfolk understood, watching them. We will know for sure when campaigning this morning, but I think we can spin this. Spin it, asked Scott. Wouldn't that be deceitful? No, it would be politics, she replied. Plus, the way I see it, you were in the right both times, just in the wrong place. Alex Cade, the Estes Park Crusade. Hmm. Alex Cade, the Estes Park Crusade, she repeated, twirling a pencil through her fingers. Alex Carr, I've got it, she said, jumping up from Rick's chair. Wait, wait. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, let's get going. We have campaigning to do, she added, walking quickly out the door. Wait! What? I said aloud, looking at Scott. What just happened? he asked, throwing his hands in the air. We caught up to her, walking briskly halfway back to our house. What do you have, Jenny? I asked. The slogan. Want to hear it? Uh, yeah, we do. Okay, you already know the Alex Cade, Estes Park, yada yada, but the add-on goes, we'll fight for our town, even if it means taking out the trash himself. Taking out the trash? I asked. Yeah, the tough guy for the right reasons, like John Wayne. You know John Wayne, but not Seinfeld? asked Scott, shaking his head with a smile. Everyone knows John Wayne, she replied. Now it's time for damage control, so let's get to it. She was right to have a plan, as it turned out. Everyone heard about what happened at the saloon yesterday, and they were asking questions. Do you want a man for mayor who talks about the law, or one that gets his hands dirty, protecting innocent lives? She told the first two people, a man and a woman, probably in their mid-thirties. Pulling Scott aside, I asked, what was that? She's really trying to win and playing dirty. Yeah, if I didn't like the guy, maybe it could be okay. I mean, most political races are a lot dirtier than that, but Rick is a friend, and at the very least a mentor of sorts, and I don't like this, I replied. I made my feelings known to Jenny, with Scott backing me up. Yeah. Okay, maybe it was a little over the top, she admitted. I'll tone it down, but I'm not dropping the new slogan. Fair enough, I agreed. Just don't compare us to Mr. Holman, please. The rest of the afternoon went smoothly, and the townspeople seemed content with her explanation of the incident yesterday. Chapter 4 Campaigning Hey, I'll catch up to you two in thirty, said Scott towards day's end walking down the street without explanation. Where's he going? I asked Jenny. It's probably to get some beer, or something stronger even. Maybe he's dying to get a pedicure, who knows? I'm not chasing after a full-grown man, if that's what you're asking. No, it's just not like him to disappear for no reason is all. There's always a reason. He just didn't feel the need to tell you. Suck it up, buttercup, and wipe those tears, frat boy. We've got a few more people to win over she replied. Frat boy. Sorry, that was kind of bitchy. We're almost done for the day, so let's make these last few count. We finished out the day strong, adding at least one more confirmed win to our column. I thought the lady was ninety, maybe older, and she told us she didn't care about politics, but she liked Jenny's shoes. So you'll vote for Alex, right? asked Jenny, holding up one foot for a closer look. Oh, sure, sweetie. Why not? Now, how do you spell that name? Is it Alden or was it Alman? Jenny told her to wait just one minute, fumbling in her campaign bag. What are you doing, I asked. Nothing, just securing a vote, she added, pulling a black sharpie from her bag and gently holding the woman's palm face up. Alex, she said as she wrote it on her skin upside down. Alex, she said slowly. A-L-E-X. Now I want you to look at this hand several times a day because the election isn't for two more weeks and I don't want you to forget. Oh, thank you, dear. I'll be sure to do that, she said, saying goodbye and slowly walking away. What was that? I asked Jenny. What was what? We're just going to tag all the eligible voters with a permanent marker now. Semi. Semi. Semi-permanent, she stated, adding. I used to write boys' names on my hand all the time. It's gone in a few days, a week at most. TMI. Huh? I asked. T for two, M for much, and I for information, she said slowly. I put my face in my hands, sighing. 
Okay, let's just agree. Please do not tag my name semi-permanently on another human being. Can we do that? Sure, probably, well, maybe. I'll think on it, she ended. Our shift is over and right on time, pointing down the street to an advancing Scott. Hey, man, where have you been? I asked. Just needed some air is all, he replied, shifting his campaign bag subtly. Air, huh? asked Jenny. We're outside at one of the highest elevations in the entire country, and you need some air? Forget it. Let's go home, boys. I'm starved. I whispered to Scott about the old lady in the marker, getting a no way. That's funny out of him. I resisted the urge to ask where he had disappeared to, saving that for later. Have a seat, campaigners, said Shannon, pointing each of us to a comfy chair in front of the fireplace. One scotch for you, Alex. One for you, Scott, she said, handing us each a half-full glass. No fighting, though, house rules. And for the head honcho, the campaign manager extraordinaire, she said, as if announcing the start of a circus. One Diet Coke, chilled outside to the perfect sipping temperature. Thank you, said Jenny, sitting and propping her sock-covered feet on the coffee table. We had quite a day, she added, and I'm pretty sure we brought a few, maybe even a dozen or so, into our camp today. Dinner is coming up in about twenty, called Joe from across the house. No, please don't get up, she added sarcastically. I looked at Scott as comfortable as I was, and we both noticed it was Jenny jumping up to help. You thought she wasn't talking to you guys, right? said Jenny, cracking the first smile I had seen today. I'm happy to, said Scott to Joe, but this chair is just super comfortable, so I want to be sure you need the help first. I second that, I called out, as if to gain some brownie points for doing nothing. We're good, sweetie pie, Joe replied as Jenny jumped in on the salad without being asked. Smells great, I said, starting to warm up by the fire. What is it? Mac and cheese, old school, with a splash of before-the-day fancy, Joe replied, getting a huh out of both Scott and me. The pasta is real for sure. The cheese is close. The bacon freeze-dried, but tastes about the same, in my opinion. The shellfish is substituted with canned crab, added Shannon. And if you don't get over here and give me a hey, honey, I'm home kiss, Alex. All you'll be doing is smelling this dinner. Lobster mac is my favorite, said Scott, jumping up. Oh, now you want to get up, teased Joe. I figured I'd beat Alex to the punch with an I'm home smooch of my own and a guaranteed spot at the dinner table. Just one for now, she said, smiling, and go get changed for supper. That goes for you too, Alex, Shannon said before Scott and I headed to the back of the house. I wanted to ask where he went today, but not in front of the ladies. Changing quickly, I resisted the urge to ask why it was necessary, never having changed for supper before the day unless we were going out, but I didn't argue the point. What do you have there, bro? I asked, catching Scott off guard, still in his room. Nothing, he said, holding the book I got a glance of behind his back. I haven't seen any books in this house. Did I miss a library room? And nah, it's just something I picked up today from the library in town. I like to read at night, you know. No, I don't know. I know you read things for school, like textbooks and the little numbers scrolling on the stock app. But a book just because? Nah, I don't buy it, I argued. We both paused, neither one speaking. It's awkward and none of my business, I confessed. But I'm going to need to see the title. And if it's some smut book, well, then there will be some jokes down the road. Count on it. It's not anything like that, he said, still not divulging the title. <laughs> Last chance before I tell the girls you picked up a smutty, bully billionaire, bare-chested, reverse harem guy romance, I said, stringing the words together and stopping when I cracked myself up. <laughs> Fine, but if you say anything, I'm going to have to tray you. What, tray me? Yeah. You know when he had the gun back up at the cabin, and I was all like Bruce Lee with the moves, subduing him and protecting everyone. Oh, just like Bruce, I joked but didn't push it since Scott was the closest thing I had ever met to that level of fighter. Okay, I won't say a word. What do you got, bro? He slowly held the book out so I could read the cover. There was that awkward pause when one friend could hammer the other, embarrassing them, but realized it wasn't going to be funny to either man at the last second. I read the title aloud. 267 jokes known around the world. 
I put my hand to my face, sighing, same as when Jenny marked up the senior earlier, and paused. Okay, two questions, I said. Okay? Yeah, sure, he replied, with a sheepish look I had never seen. One? Why 267? Why not just stop at 250, or maybe write some more until the author got to 300? Yeah, right, he replied, looking somewhat relieved. Secondly, I started, then pausing. I can't remember number two. Anyway, these are supposed to all be original, I added. I know. I was just hoping for some ideas, and maybe I could put a few together and make them semi-original. You're nervous about this, aren't you? I asked. Yeah. I told you guys I didn't want to do it. Now I have to come up with something. Hold on, I have an idea. Follow me, I told him, heading back towards the kitchen. Chapter 5 The Contest Ladies, I announced, we have a contest idea, or more of a wager, I suppose, that we shall discuss over dinner if that's okay with you. Sure, they replied. Sounds interesting, added Shannon. A wager? Scott whispered to me as we sat back in our living room chairs. Yes, us and them, boys versus girls, but we perform as a duo or trio for them. It means we get to work together. Oh, I get it, like Abbott and Costello, right? Yeah, only not as funny, I'm sure. And the bet? He asked. If we win, our girlfriends have to give us back massages every night for a week. And if they win, we massage them. Sounds like a win-win, he said, smiling. Yeah, it would be, but I'm just joking. It's more likely going to be cooking or doing dishes, maybe hand-washing the laundry or the like, for a week. Okay, still all right with that, as long as I don't have to do it alone. We presented it to the ladies, getting a, you're going down, response from all three. So, let's push it out another day. So, not tomorrow night, but the next. Everyone okay with that? I asked. All agreed, and the ladies started working on their routine as soon as dinner was over. See? I told Scott that this was as bad as it could get as we cleaned the dishes, asking him to keep the book in case we got writer's block and needed some ideas but to hide it well. We vowed to stew on the idea and start in earnest the following day. What do you think their jokes are going to be about? asked Scott. Us. And that gives me an idea, I added. When talking or joking about someone you like or care about, there is a fine line in how one approaches it. In the show I used to watch on Comedy Cable, it was a roasting of somebody famous by people who were friends, or at least not out to get them like enemies. The jokes were tougher than the traditional White House press dinners and not enough to make them cry, but somewhere in between. I always enjoyed the mock skits, usually on that Saturday night show, where comedians portrayed someone famous, or at least well-known, and did their best to mimic their language and mannerisms in a humorous way. Of course, it could always backfire, but it was easier than Scott and me coming up with five minutes of original one-liners with the short preparation time. You better bring the noise, boys said Jenny an hour later. I just got off the radio with the Holmans, and they are going to be judging the contest. The first prize is an all-expense-paid night out. We girls with Mrs. Holman, and you guys, should you win, which I highly doubt, but if successful, you will have a night out with Mr. Holman. Steak dinner and drinks, paid in full. We took the afternoon off the following day, with snow gusts and wintry cold, down into the teens chilling us to the bone. As Jenny pointed out, nobody was outside anyway, apparent by more chimney smoke than I had ever seen in one town. Scott and I prepared our routine, if you could call it one. We had more material about Jenny, only knowing her briefly than our own girlfriends we had known for years. Jenny started, holding no punches. Sorry I'm late, said Jenny, breathing heavily. I just got chased down by a huge mountain lion. How old was it? Oh, I don't know. It was big, though. What? It was a baby weighing in at five pounds? I don't think so. Anyway, I fought it off with my bare hands, so there's that. He could have given me quite a scratch. What do I do with my spare time? I like to drink and fight. I'm not great at it, but I still give it my all. Anyway, my best friend is super rich. No, not the self-made kind that comes from hard work day after day, but more like the hay. I've got the coolest supercar on campus that costs more than ten houses, but I really deserve it. 
Scott's kind of like Mr. Holman Rich, we all know. But he's different in that he didn't earn it. Not any of it, not one penny of it. Jenny curtsied at the end and smiled, as if she had given the most generous of compliments. Okay, my turn, said Scott. I've only got a couple, so I'll start out. We hadn't rehearsed the skit like I wanted to because he was so nervous about it. The fact that he was going to start was a complete surprise to Joe and me. Jenny with A. Your mama is so dumb. She waits in line for common. He trailed off. Maybe it was my elbow in his side or the expressions of everyone else that brought him around. I nervously looked at him, Mrs. Holman, a grimacing Joe and Shannon, and finally at Jenny. Her nose crinkled and time stopped. I told you I wasn't good at this, said Scott, crumpling his cue card and shoving it deep into his front jeans pocket before walking briskly to the back of the house. Sense, said Jenny, getting our attention. What, I asked. Sense. Your mama's so dumb she waits in line for common sense, she said. It's funny, kind of original for sure. Now, who's going to go tell him I'm not mad? Wait, you're not mad, not at all, I asked. No, he's a guy, same as you, and guys say dumb things at the worst times. I can't wait to hear yours, she added. So are you going to bring him back or what? Yes, I'll try. Be right back, I announced, finding Scott swearing at himself in the back room. Fear and loathing in Estes Park, huh? I asked. Something like that. It was just stupid. I panicked and didn't even see it until it was too late. Sense, right? Huh? Waits in line for common sense, right? Uh, yeah, that's it. She was right then. Jenny, that is, I added. What? Yeah, she finished your joke for you. Wait. So she's not mad? Scott questioned. That's what I asked. And apparently she thinks we guys say dumb things and can't help ourselves. She wants us to continue. Maybe I should take over, though, if you're okay with that. You're either going to bring the whole thing home or lose it, because I'm not about to open my mouth again until this thing is over. Fair enough. Now let's go. Jenny, I'm so... Scott started to say before she put her hand up. No apologies here. This is a roast, and hurt feelings are to be left at the front door, she replied. What else have you got? Me? I raised my hand, and I'll take it from here for the win. Oh, confidence. I like it, said Jenny with a wink, giving Scott a hug and whispering they were good before sitting down once more. Mm, I said, clearing my throat. My name is Jenny with A, not Anna, not Annam, but Toons and AJ, I started. I'm a 13-year-old girl going on 38, and it's easy for me because I know everything. I gauged the audience as I continued. Not getting many laughs, no what-the-heck looks, or nervous audience members. When I first met Alex, I was shocked. Shocked by his rugged handsomeness, strong chin, and chiseled biceps. This did get a few laughs and a, that's it, keep going, whoop from Jenny. He never told me firsthand the story of fighting off the fiercest creature in these mountains because, well, he's just not that type of man. He would rather have his actions speak for him, whether fighting off a rabid animal alone in the deep woods or taking on dozens of men in a bar brawl just to defend the honor of a woman. So terrified are those who dare step into his path that news crews from all over the country should seek to tell his story of bravery and heroism. For it has been said that the legend of his memory will live far beyond his mere mortal flesh. Go on, she said, laughing out loud and writing notes on a black notebook. He, his, I said laughing too. I can't. I don't have any more. I rest my case. Bravo, said Mr. and Mrs. Holman, clapping their hands and whispering to each other the verdict, no doubt. Give us a minute, they added, moving to the other room. Were you taking notes? I asked Jenny. Of course. I'm going to use some of this in our campaign. Is it all true? Every word, said Scott, relaxing a bit, and happy the conversation was off of him. A few minutes later, Rick and Judy had a winner. Both were interesting, she started. There were a few surprises, but overall not bad. Rick and I have decided that we are declaring a tie, at least for this first round. Everyone gets the promised dinner out tomorrow night. We'll be at the same restaurant, the only one in town that knows how to cook a steak nowadays, but opposite sides of the room. That way my man and I can flirt across the restaurant. Ooh, gross, said Jenny, with none of the rest of us agreeing. 
I wasn't much older than her, but I knew that when long-time married couples still pined for each other, it was a big deal. We spent the rest of the night with light-hearted conversation and a sense we were all okay. Rick stopped by his favorite restaurant the following day, around noon, the one he and Grady frequented whenever they were together. How's it going? Rick asked, catching the manager taking in a side of beef from a local rancher. Oh, hey there, Mr. Holman. If you're here for lunch, it's going to be a bit. Just ran out of steaks last night, and we need to get this side of beef processed for dinner tonight. Not lunch, he replied. I'm bringing Judy and some friends by tonight for dinner, and just wanted to check your beef supply. Looks like I have my answer. Sure thing. How many are we serving? Two parties on opposite sides of your restaurant, kind of a guys and girls thing. Anyway, four ladies and three of us guys. Maybe four if I can get Grady out for the night. How is he anyway? We haven't seen him for a while. I guess he's back in Denver. No, he's up here near us, said Mr. Holman. Lost a young son recently. Maybe a night out would be up his alley. We'll see. Sorry to hear that. I truly am. Give him my best if I don't see him. What cuts do you want? The best all around. You got it, sir. I got a new guy, a butcher, in the back. Hey, he yelled back to the kitchen. We have Mr. Holman. He's a regular and a friend of mine, and let's just call it eight of the best cuts for dinner tonight. I'm on it, boss, came the reply. The voice sounded familiar, but Rick couldn't place it. Got a new guy, huh? Yeah. Not a cook, just a butcher. He says he can be here a couple of days a week. I don't know him, but saw him work this morning carving a fat sow, and he's some kind of Picasso with a knife. He'll get you all good cuts. I'll make sure of it. All right, friend. I'll let you get back to work. We'll be back around six tonight. Psst. If you're enjoying this audiobook, can you do us a favor and share it with a friend? The more you share, the more free audiobooks we can publish for you. Now, back to the story. Chapter 6 Cabin Remodel Mr. Holman, Mr. Holman, said Tex, mumbling at first, then turning it into a little ditty. Mr. Holman, this is your favorite place in town. I know this because I always ask around, he sang low, slowly sharpening the ten-inch blade. You may think you're going to be mayor, but I'm one with the ten-inch blader. It didn't quite rhyme, and Tex didn't care. Besides, who was going to call him out on it? Boss he asked a few hours later. Do you need any help tonight, like a server or something? I could use the work and wouldn't mind being paid in some food. Yes, that would help. I think we're going to have a full house tonight. I gotta run home and check on something, but I'll be back around five if that works. Sure thing, Trey. See you later. Not if I see you first, he joked, heading out. Tex was back at the house with an hour to spare. I'm home he declared, walking in the front door. He never announced when he left, but figured it didn't matter when he returned as long as there wasn't a pattern established. Dinner is going to be a little later tonight, he told Beth, untying her to use the bathroom. Are you going out? she asked. He paused, not responding. I mean, if you're busy, I could help you make dinner, she said, hoping her recovery worked. Oh, okay, he replied. Yeah, maybe tomorrow. I have some things to take care of downstairs later. Paperwork and such on the new house I'm buying for us, so we can eat after that. Buying, she almost said aloud, wanting to add, with what money? But she didn't dare. You'll like it, I'm sure. It's rustic and secluded. Oh, is all she could say in response. Have you told Trey yet? Nope. Want it to be a surprise, he added with that crooked smile. Careful with that candle over there, pointing across the room. These cabins can go right up in flames, he added, making an exploding gesture with his hands and a boom with his puffed-out cheeks. It's true, he thought. They could burn through most anything, and the reason he tied her up with a metal chain and not rope. Back in a while, he said. Okay, see you soon, babe, she replied. He didn't flinch or question it, just saying, Yep. Beth wasn't sure what to think, but so far he hadn't hurt her physically. Minus, of course, the kidnapping and bondage. She knew that he wasn't buying a house, and he wouldn't spend hours downstairs doing paperwork. Neither she nor Trey, she assumed, had eaten since breakfast, and she had a suspicion, not confirmed with words or even actions, but a gut feeling, that Trey was not moving with them to the new house. Babe, 
She called out an hour later, getting no reply. Babe, she said again, louder, a few minutes later, then a near yell after another five. There was no response, only silence. Her heart beat in her chest, thump, thump, as she got up the courage to knock on the wall of Trey's holding room. Trey, knock, knock, she tapped, hearing nothing back. Trey, she said, knocking a little louder. Two knocks back and a, yes, I'm here, Beth, she could hear beyond the wall. Trey, you need to listen to me. I think something bad is going to happen to you tonight or tomorrow. She paused, straining to hear his answer. Trey, did you hear me? Yes, I did, loud and clear. So? So what? Something bad has already happened to me. I'm a prisoner in my own home, or family home. Still, what's the worst that can happen now? I miss a few more meals. I know, but I think you're about to be a log in the fire when this place goes up in flames. Maybe me too. I don't think so, he replied. Well, I do. He has no use for you and can't let you go. He's told me several times that we are moving soon, and he just said something this morning about a candle burning down log houses. You need to get out of here. We both do, and not tomorrow. Let me think on it, he replied. I'm really tired, Beth, but I'll give it some thought for sure. This isn't about only you, she said, louder than she wanted, and paused to see if footsteps came up the stairs. After several minutes of silence, she continued. This is about me, too. I don't want to live like this, chained to the bed, only to be fed once a day and not know what will happen tomorrow. I want to go home, and I need you to help me. Look out the window. What do you see? A couple of houses maybe half a mile or more away, he replied. Okay, good. Do you ever see anyone out walking? Sometimes I do, but I don't dare call out. How about now? Do you see anyone now? She asked, with more confidence that Tex was not downstairs. No. Wait, I think I do. Yes, but they are a ways off. It looks like one person. Can you open the window? No, it's not that kind. Okay, bang on it or break it to get their attention. No way, I'm not breaking this. It's freezing outside and I'll freeze to death tonight or worse if Tex sees it. It's already cold enough as it is in here, he conceded. Beth sighed, shaking her head. Okay, then knock on it. I have a window but can't get close to even look outside. Trey knocked lightly at first, then harder, as the man he could now see with a big brown coat and a winter hat came down the road towards the house. He's coming this way, said Trey excitedly. What do I do? Just keep knocking until he sees you, then yell help. Trey kept knocking as the man approached. He fogged the window with his heavy breathing, wiping it away every few seconds, only to fog it up again. I'm waving my arms and knocking but this window won't stop fogging up. I don't think... Wait, he's stopping. I can't see a face, but I think it's a man. He has his hand up to his ear. Hey, hey, Trey yelled. Can you hear me? The figure stood still with one hand up to his ear. Hey, can you hear me? He continued, banging hard on the window. He can't hear me, Beth, called out a panicked Trey. Right on the window, said Beth. If it's fogged, they should be able to read it. What? Write help, being held hostage. Trey did as she said, careful to write it backwards so they could read the message easily. The figure seemed to be reading it, then nodded their head up and down. They see it. He or she read it and nodded yes, said an excited Trey. Wait, what? he said. What's happening? asked Beth. They're nodding their head, but now side to side. They don't believe me, Beth. They're turning a different direction. What do I do? Break the window, she commanded. Don't think. Just do it. Throw something through it now. It's our only chance. Okay, okay, there is a desk chair. I can try that. Trey lifted the chair, pointing the heavy metal legs towards the window, and arched his back for the swing. Crash! It cracked the window like a spider web, getting the person's attention once more. Hold on, yelled Trey, hitting it again two more times before making a chair-sized hole in the once weatherproof window. Hey, can you hear me? Trey called out through the jaggedly opened window. The figure looked up, nodding their head up and down before removing his hat and smiling that crooked grin, the same one that gave Trey nightmares every time he fell asleep. Oh no, oh no, said Trey, panicking and backing away from the window. Oh no, he repeated. What is it? What's wrong? asked Beth. It's him, is all Trey could get out. It's him. 
Trace snuck back to the window gingerly, peering out, as if the whole thing may be a case of mistaken identity. Tex hadn't moved an inch. He shook his head no with that crooked grin and lit a single wooden match, watching it burn to the stub before flicking it to the ground, all the while staring up to Trey's room. Chapter 7 Growing Up Tex had forgotten his knife, the one he never forgot and carried with him always since the day, and most days before. It had belonged to his father, even had his dad's first name carved deep into the mahogany wood handle. It was the same knife that took his father's tongue the day he escaped the barn, and not long after his very life. At thirteen, he had played the victim. Hostage was a word he liked more, and prisoner more than that. After all, he didn't have a choice. A victim always did. He would tell a stranger at a bar that even a hostage had some wiggle room a lot of the time. But a prisoner, that was on another level. It could be somewhere like Supermax, can't take a pee without asking, or a POW camp in a far-off land, where every man weighs the decision to make a run for it, not knowing the terrain and each day getting weaker in body and mind from weeks, months, or years of continuous abuse. He knew all about this, Tex did, and considered his childhood, at least the last couple of years, as a POW prisoner waiting for rescue that he doubted would come, or a colossal slip-up from his captor. He got it one ordinary day, not the rescue but the slip-up from his father after nearly two years. When it happened, he waited like a fox when the fat hen came into the hen house, as it had done hundreds of times before, but this time so drunk that he left the key in the lock. Tex had played the scenario over in his mind a thousand times. It was the routine, same as always. His father would open the front door, leaving the keys in the lock set, a bag of food scraps that were half the time not fit for swine feedings. But scraps nonetheless. He would check the water hose and occasionally empty the latrine before departing. Tex would count the seconds it took to close the door. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. With the final sound of the handle lock and deadbolt engaging with a mind-numbing thud, the chains on his ankle gave him room to use the hose, to receive the food of the day, or every few days sometimes, use the bucket and sleep on the mattress, one leg hanging off at the end of the chain. Every few times his father came close enough to grab him if he were quick, but then what? Tex was a thirteen-year-old kid at eighty-five pounds on a good day, and getting weaker by the month. He didn't dare make a stand, a final one he was sure it would be. After all, who wants to take care of a barn animal they despise for two years? He wasn't missed, that was obvious. And whatever stories had been told about him running away must have been reasonable, or he would have been rescued long ago. The boy didn't even speak anymore after the first few times, but the hate inside consumed him. Tex would bide his time, one year, two years, ten if it came to it, and when the iron was hot, he would smash it for freedom for the revenge of his sisters. The day it happened, he was seventeen days from his fifteenth birthday. Tex wasn't the smartest kid in his town, or even his old home, and he knew it. But he was meticulous, down to the last detail of whatever he was planning, working towards, or had an interest in. This mindset wasn't lost on his incarceration, wrongly accused, of course, but he notched every morning sunrise with a mark, one, two, three, four, and a slash across for five plus two, making seven. Every seven days were circled into a one-month box, with the date ranges from the very beginning. All were scratched into the barn wall, with several nails strewn about the floor. Thirty days hath November, June back to April and September. Screw the rest, have thirty-one except for February at twenty-eight or twenty-nine on jump year. He didn't quote the saying exactly. He could have but chose not to, making up his own version. Tex was proud of his calendar, confident he hadn't missed a single day. The fact that his father saw it from day one and didn't seem to care told Tex he never expected him to leave and certainly not to be found. This day, his father left a brown paper sack with something that didn't even matter today, it turned out, but food anyway. He checked the hose as he stumbled around the barn near dark and later than almost every other day before. The smell of whiskey was not uncommon but today it emanated from his breath as usual, but also from his shirt and boots. The stumble and slurring, not talking to Tex but to himself, was almost enough for Tex to make a move and grab him for the final struggle either way. 
The opportunity was more fantasy as any other day, and his father walked out the door as always, shutting it with a clang. Tex counted the seconds until the lock and got to 4-1000 when he heard the man fall, cuss, stand once more only to fall again, and stumble out of the barn area. The lock. He hadn't heard the lock. Did it happen, and he forgot, or didn't hear? Was Tex losing his mind, or was this the moment, the one he had dreamed of and had nightmares about and seemed utterly impossible? Tex couldn't reach the door. He was four feet away, at least. If he could get something to push it just a little, he would know for sure if it was truly unguarded. He reached the short stick to retrieve the lunch bag, as always, never bored with the contents. Some days it was old potatoes and shriveled carrots, leftovers probably days old that his mom got from the church. And on rare occasions, leftover halves or thirds of greasy fast food burgers, someone in the house didn't care to eat. He had one three months and thirteen days ago, according to the crude burger scratching he did next to the day that he wouldn't forget. It was half a hamburger cut perfectly and seemingly untouched. He bit inside to find a small, folded piece of paper in between two patties, with a note from his twin sister. It simply read, We love you, Terence, and we're sorry. Your sisters. The note was his prized possession, and he read it five times per day, hiding it under his mattress. Get, he said, reaching for his paper sack. Get, Stanley. You too, Mimi, he said, kicking towards the nearly obese rats, sniffing around his meal. They were friends, he guessed. Tex had killed every rat he could stomp for the first six months, tossing them all into the same corner of the room, to decompose as nature saw fit. The pile, nearly fifty at its heyday, created a putrid stench during the spring and summer months that was hard to mask with body odor and a half-full latrine. They were gone, all of them, or too smart to show up in this room but the last two. The stupid rats, thought Tex, that won't take no for an answer. Stanley and Mimi, he called them, always believing they had named themselves. He was convinced of their sex, because they always seemed to be bickering and making up. They had some little ones running around every few months, but never close enough to Tex for a problem. He always threw them some scraps, no matter how small his meal was. There was always something for them. In return, he could talk all he wanted, and they would listen, so it seemed. Opening his bag today, he knew something was off. Not the multiples of leftovers scraped off of half-eaten plates, he always assumed. This was the closest to a real lunch he could ever remember. His father was always one or two sheets to the wind, but today it was three, maybe even four. The lunch could have almost passed for any child headed to school. There was a sandwich, three quarters but almost full, an apple not rotted, some crackers, a bag of corn chips, and a bottle of cola still chilled and unopened. He hadn't had anything but hose water since he'd gotten here. Okay, okay, Stanley, and hold on, Mimi, he said, tossing a few chips their way. The two of them used to take one piece and scurry away when they had little mouths to feed. But now in their retirement years, it was just the two, and they stayed put, feeding their faces and adding ounces with each sitting. Tex wasn't sure what happened to all the littles, but in fairness, he never asked. The scrawny boy took two large bites of the apple and threw the remainder hard as he could at the door. It hit with a thud, splintering to the core, but pushing the door that was never opened without his father inside just enough to show it unlocked. We have a winner, he said aloud, looking over at his nearly two years of calendar check marks. Well, Stanley, Miss Mimi, it doesn't get any better than this. If I get out of here, I'll make sure you die old and happy in a puddle of gravy. Yes, I will. The door was open, and the keys were still in the lock, but it didn't change the fact that he couldn't get to them. It seemed a cruel punishment like winning a brand new supercar that you had to drive off the lot right away, but were given the keys to a random vehicle. His lunch-reaching pole wouldn't work, and his non-domesticated rats were not about to shuffle over like trained monkeys in those old movies to get the keys and free him from the leg restraints. Minutes later, his father returned, mumbling to himself. Stinking rats, he slurred, as he bent over no more than five feet from the door. Tex could see his shadow on the wall setting something on the ground. He wanted to call out to stop, but the keys shining in the partially open door had him frozen. If you're a lucky boy, you'll be having rats do tomorrow. 
he grumbled, stumbling out of the barn. Stay right here with me, Stanley. You too, Mimi, Tex commanded, tossing them more bits of bread and chips. Stanley devoured his and some of hers before giving a Tex lecture on sharing. His little nose sniffed the air, turning his head first left, then right. Stay right here, said Tex, as the rat scurried under the door. Stanley, you get back here right now, called out Tex, not caring if his father was still around. Stanley, don't go near that, he pleaded. Mimi, you better stop him. He's going to get... The snap of the trap, followed immediately by high-pitched squeals, told Tex it was too late. The sounds went on for several minutes, with Tex sick to his stomach and covering his ears. Damn you, Stanley. I told you not to go out there, he cried, throwing the rest of his meal at the far wall. Tears rolled down his dirty face, and the loss was agonizing, the worst he had ever felt in his short life. His sadness turned to anger, and the last words echoed in his mind. You'll be having rat stew tomorrow. Tex kept Mimi from leaving, giving her a new scrap every time she tried to leave. Not too much, not too little, just the right amount over the next several hours. Hey, Terence, he heard, straining his eyes to see past the door. The sweet voice was familiar, and yet hadn't been heard in so many months. Hey, sis, he replied, as his twin walked through the partially open door. Her silhouette surrounded by blinding sunlight and a round middle made him not ask the questions he wanted to. Are you here to help me? I've always been here to help you, brother. I just haven't had the chance until now, and my gosh, you are so skinny. Did he even feed you? Before you ask, no. This is not from eating your food, she said, with a grimace and the saddest eyes he had ever seen as she laid a hand on her bulging stomach. If you ask, I'm going to cry, so please don't. Scraps. He fed me scraps mostly, and why now? I mean, it's been a long time, said Tex, skipping over the obvious. You're crying, she voiced. No, just something in my eye is all, he said, looking down at Mimi as she scurried out of the room. Mom left a week or more ago, she stated. We've been talking about you a lot, me and your sisters, that is. Tonight we had a plan of sorts, I guess. We have been saving money from odd jobs, babysitting, knitting, sewing, and doing dishes at local restaurants, to buy our father a few bottles of his favorite whiskey. He was encouraged to have a few drinks more than usual tonight, and he's passed out in the front yard. For how long, I don't know. So I'm ready to let you go, but I have a few questions I need to have answered first, she added, holding up a set of keys he had never before seen out of his father's possession. Are you mad at us? I mean your sisters for not getting you out of here sooner. No, it's not your fault. I know what he done did to you, and so did Mom. But if she's gone now, it don't matter anyhow. Two, she gone, and so is any money we have. We're going to lose the house, and Mom took the car, so there's not much left. How are we going to make it? Let me figure that out, said Tex. I'm the man of the house now, or soon if you let me out. I'll make sure you're taken care of here or wherever. Okay, hold tight, she said, as she removed the chain of keys from the door lock. Let me just find the right one, she said, fumbling with them and dropping them to the floor at his feet. Mamie, you stay away from there, he called out, getting a questioning look from his sister but no response. Hey, sis, I got this, he said, gently grabbing the keychain, and I'm the one who is sorry. For what? I knew he was hurting you long before I stood up to him. I knew and let it continue. I was scared of him, but not anymore. It's okay. You were just a kid. So were you, he replied. Using the key, Tex let himself out, making sure he remembered the correct one. Dropping the heavy chain to the floor felt like dropping a 100-pound backpack after hiking all day before collapsing in exhaustion. Tex had fantasized a thousand times about what he would do first if he ever escaped. Most plans included grabbing any cash he could find, stealing the car, and driving off the map. His first stop, Cheeseburger Shack, the one out on Route 9. Double meat, double cheese, and ketchup. None of that rabbit food, his dad would say whenever he picked one up. Today was different. There was no money, no car to be taken, and his enemy would never be more vulnerable. 
He wanted to sleep in a real bed after a real dinner, and there were only two ways it could happen. Hold on a second, he said before they left. I need to do something. They left the room and Mimi was sniffing Stanley. Two other snap traps laid along the wall, one in front, the other in the back. Oh, a rat, she screamed, jumping back. No, it's okay. It's Mimi. She's a friend, he said, as if speaking of a classmate. Grabbing a broom from the corner, he snapped the remaining traps, getting a jump out of his sister each time. I'm sorry, Stanley, he said, looking down at him. We'll do a proper burial later. That's a fact. Nah. He followed his sister into the house and right past his father, still passed out on the ground, asking, Where's a gun? I know there are a few in here. No. Dad pawned them off a few months back. There aren't any, she whispered. Okay, then it will have to be a knife, he said, looking around. None of those either, she said. Just butter knives left. No knives. How do you eat steak? We don't, she replied. <laughs> In a flash, he remembered the knife his father always carried with him. It has to be on him, he said aloud. As quickly as he could, Tex snuck over to the man lying on the ground. He still hadn't decided what to do, but he picked up a softball-sized rock with one jagged edge from the garden that long ago was tended to and bore food. He approached slowly, jumping back with every snort of the man and holding the rock overhead like a novice juggler switching from balls to something less forgiving. Check his pockets, he said aloud. It's in there. Tex could see the outline in his father's right front pocket, the same one he had always kept it in ever since he could remember. That's the one, he said quietly, reaching down. Slow and steady, he mumbled. Slow and steady. Get ready, Freddy. Then I'll let you in on a little secret, he hummed. Reaching carefully as he could, he touched the top of the folded knife, pulling it out and dropping it after jumping back at the last second when the man rolled over. There it is, he whispered, when he realized his father wasn't waking up any time soon. He held up the knife his father never let him touch, before admiring the engraving, simply reading Fred. Your dead Mr. Fred got smashed in the head just like I done said, he sang quietly. He raised the rock over his head, on three, he told himself. One, two. No, wait, Terence, don't do it, came the voice of his sister from behind him. Why should I? he asked. Because then you'll be just like him. He's not coming back into the house, said Tex. Hold on, go get your sisters. Our sisters, right? Yeah, oh yeah, that's right, hurry. The four of them lifted Fred into a wheelbarrow from the barn, and two on each rail pushed him slowly across the lawn. The front tire half sagged and rubbed on the front brace whining as an injured animal may, flashing Stanley through his mind again so soon. The man stirred several times and almost fell out once, but didn't awaken. Tex didn't stop until they were in the barn, and in the room he had called home for close to two years. What now? asked his twin. Now I put the same chains on him that I had. He put it around his father's ankle, locking with the key. The click of the shackle sounded to Tex like a man dying and a child born at the exact same second, the circle of life with a single click. Here, he said, handing the ring of keys to her. When we're ready to go, lock the door fast as you can. Go stand over right by it, he commanded. On three, he said to his younger sisters. We're going to dump him to the side this way, he pointed. Okay. All three got on the right side, hands under the wheelbarrow, prepared to lift. Hmm. Fred mumbled, opening his eyes as if he'd been catnapping on a warm summer day on the front porch. What in the hell is going on here? He grumbled, reaching for Tex. Three, announced Tex, lifting hard. Fred fell to the floor with a thud as Tex jumped on him, striking him in the back and neck. Stop it, she yelled. Stop it, Terence. Hold this, he said to her, grabbing the roll of silver tape his father hung from a rusted nail on the door the same tape he used when Tex would ask a question or voice a concern. Several times he left it on for more than a day, but never more than two. The dehydration and cramps that followed were severe, quieting the boy for weeks at a time. He bound his father's hands, something he could never have done to him sober. Wrap at the wrists, he told her, as the man looked on wild-eyed like a rabid dog and caught between the familiar seduction of a liquid lover 
and the sobering effect that comes with being bound indefinitely when the tables have turned. She did as told, saying, I'm sorry, Daddy. I'm sorry. Go back in the house, said Tex, all of you. The girls heard arguing, loud yelling followed by silence, and a minute later a scream that could be heard across the property, and then silence once more. Tex came walking into the house, covered in blood. Oh my God, Terence, did you kill him? His twin asked. No. Not yet, but I did knock him out only long enough to take his tongue. Why would you do that? I mean, what kind of sick person does that, Terence? The last thing he told me was about you, sis. About you and your condition. I made sure he never spoke of it again. Nah. It wasn't me, Terence. I didn't want to. I just couldn't stop him. I know, sis. It's my problem now, and I'm taking care of it. Where is it? he said, rifling through the kitchen drawers. Where is it? he repeated, demanding an answer, pulling each drawer all the way open and rifling through it as a criminal may do breaking into a house or office. Tex would get plenty of experience in the rifling arts over the next few years, but today he wasn't looking for money, jewelry, or anything of value to most. Here it is, he finally said, holding up the barbecue lighter. Wait, what are you going to do with that? his younger sister asked. Make sure he doesn't die, at least not yet. He cauterized the tongue of his father, jolting him awake from unconsciousness with another scream. We'll see if that works, said Tex to his father. I saw something like it in one of those Rambo movies. If it doesn't work, then I guess I'll be burying you tomorrow. Tex looked at his struggling captive without emotion. No tears, no sadness for where this ended up. No joy in the revenge, just apathy and a CEO type of drive to finish the task at hand. I'm sorry, Mimi, Tex said, freeing Stanley from the trap and carefully wrapping him in a shop rag. He heard mumbles or moans from inside the barn, but paid it no mind. He will get a proper burial, I promise. First thing tomorrow. He was my friend, you two. They were my only friends, he said to his sisters. He carried the carcass into the house, hiding it from his sisters. Mimi followed close behind, running back a few feet from the front door. Tex slept hard that first night, forbidding his sisters from going near the barn or outside for any reason. He awoke from his parents' bed and showered for the first time in nearly two years. Stay inside, he told his sisters the following morning, as he headed out the squeaking front door with Stanley still concealed, but this time in one of his father's favorite shirts. Mimi was waiting just outside the front porch, as if she had been there all night. Common girl, we'll lay him to rest right over yonder by that there oak tree. I'll show you where so you can visit, he added, leading the way. Mimi followed like a loyal dog, only stopping occasionally when hearing the sounds from the barn. Well, Mimi, I guess he done didn't croak last night. I half thought he'd bled to death, but I hear him, straight as you. Carefully laying Stanley on the ground, he unwrapped him, giving Mimi time to sniff him, or whatever they do, thought Tex. I'm digging this here hole, Mimi, but it ain't going to be six foot deep. Nah, not even for Stanley. Wait till you see how shallow I bury Fred, believe that. Mimi laid next to her partner, and as close to Tex as he thought she had ever been. Sometimes the two of them slept on his bed, he knew, but they always jumped off if he tossed or turned. The grave ended up about a foot and a half deep. Tex said a few words and it was done. Common girl, a barn ain't no place for a bona fide pet. You can come on in the house, but don't go scaring the girls now, you hear? She gingerly followed him up to the house, stopping to sniff the air every few feet, and finally in the side door that ran straight into his parents' bedroom. Tex stuffed an old boot box of his mother's with hand towels, a small bowl of water, and some chips he found in the kitchen. Stay as long as you like, he told her, shutting the door. What are you going to do to him? asked his sisters once he had returned to the kitchen. I aim to kill him slowly, like for what he did to you and me. Then what? they asked. Then we stay put until someone comes for the house. We'll sell off everything we can to eat, and I'll find work in town. It looks like my bicycle still works. They lost the house three months later, almost to the day, as if the calendar willed it. As promised, Tex buried their father in a shallow grave only days after adopting Mimi. 
Tex couldn't pay the house note, but he had earned enough to buy an old car outright. Not enough for inspection and insurance, but enough to own it and put some gas in. Enough to split town before his father was discovered, only two weeks later. The shallow grave and the restraints in the barn made a riveting news story that he saw a clip of from 400 miles away. Probably they will do a 60 minutes or 48 hours bit on me, he said to Mimi, tucked carefully into his backpack as he walked past the department store window, stopping to watch the news clip. The last picture they could find of him was when he was eight years old. No sense worrying about being spotted, he said aloud. That's just a kid they got there, just an innocent kid. No sense at all. Chapter 8 Restaurant Night Tex entered the cabin and retrieved his father's knife from the kitchen table before pacing the floor. The timing was not great, he thought. Did he stay and deal with Trey or go and finish a job he had already been paid half for? Tex was sure he wouldn't get a second chance with either one. He didn't really care about taking some money up front and wouldn't have lost a minute's sleep over it. But another payment was coming at the end, and it would give him and her some breathing room. Maybe even enough to make it through the winter up here, he thought. He paced the room, talking to himself. They wouldn't be such a problem if Trey hadn't smashed the window out, and his access to Mr. Holman would never be closer than tonight. I'm going to be a little late, Boo, he said aloud, heading out to the shed. To say Tex was handy would be an understatement as he had been in construction ever since he started work in earnest at age fifteen. He laid the ladder on the side of the house in front of Trey's window and brought up one board after another, hammering the nails in. Part of him expected Trey to try and push the ladder over with him on it. After all, that's precisely what Tex would try. Modern textbook warfare. But Trey was too scared and didn't even come close to the window. Forty minutes later, it was done. Not enough to keep all the cold out, but enough to keep a big rat inside for the night. Sorry I'm late, boss, he said, showing up at the restaurant nearly ninety minutes late for his shift and entering through the back kitchen door. The restaurant was three-quarters full. He could see through the open kitchen door, and Tex recognized the man at the end of the dining room, the one he had seen on the way up here hitchhiking. He scanned the room for the other man he had seen him with, but didn't spot him. The dishwasher was taking orders. Lance and friends only knew it because he apologized for being slow. I'm just the dishwasher, but the waiter guy didn't show, so I'm doing my best, folks, he exclaimed before disappearing into the back kitchen, with all the wrong orders, I assumed. I'm not sure about the ladies, but since we all got the steak, I'm sure it's going to be close, I said to Scott and Mr. Holman. My dad taught me when I was a young man that a person who is rude or intolerant to servers is showing a true personality trait, honest, raw, and unforgiving. Sure, there are always exceptions to a general rule, but the saying went something like, if you can't cut your server some slack when they are new or slammed, you have no business going out to eat. After all, you are being served. Only once did I ever see my dad tip less than 20%, and that was squarely on the server trying to hit on my mother. You're here, the nervous dishwasher said to Tex, calling him Trey. And more than an hour late, said the restaurant owner, getting a look from Tex that had him pausing mid-sentence and feeling a chill in his bones. Never mind, you're here now, so all is good, he said. Charlie, you're back on dishes. And Trey, we've got a few orders in the queue. I'm on it, boss man, he said, feeling excited, like he was the star pitcher in the World Series. The plan was not complicated. Just to wait until his prey stepped into the restroom, follow him in, get it done, and head out for a paycheck. Tex picked up where Charlie left off confirming a few of the other orders, including the table with Mrs. Holman, Shannon, Joe, and Jenny. Keeping his voice low, he confirmed their orders. One trout dinner, one chicken, and two steaks. Looks like old Charlie got it half wrong. Poor guy had all steak dinners for you, he added, smiling that crooked smile and winking at Joe. That guy is weird, don't you think? she said as he returned to the kitchen. Yeah, something's off with him for sure, said Shannon, with Mrs. Holman nodding her head in agreement. Jenny, are you okay? asked Shannon, looking across the table at the wide-eyed teen, for the first time ever not saying a word. What's wrong, sweetie? asked Mrs. Holman. 
Jenny shook, not saying a word, but pointing towards the kitchen. It's him, she whispered. Him who? asked Judy. Him, him, she cried, digging into her purse and pulling out a folded flyer that was once on the poles in town. The sketch of Tex. The man who killed my parents, she added, folding her arms over herself. It's him, she said louder. It's him, she screamed, getting the attention of us guys in the entire restaurant. What's going on? I asked, running towards the table. The waiter, said Shannon. Jenny is convinced he killed her parents. Where is he? asked Scott and Mr. Holman. In the kitchen, Judy pointed. Hold on, boys, said Mr. Holman, putting his arms out as Scott and I took a step toward the back kitchen. If it's him, this man has killed a few people that we know of. And if she's wrong, then there's that too. Sorry said Scott, grabbing a steak knife off the lady's table. Me too, I added, picking up another. Scott was the first to the kitchen, heading straight for the man in the back. He held his knife at his side but grabbed the man by his shirt collar, dragging him screaming out into the now nearly full restaurant. Everyone was up from their table, standing around, and opened a path as he dragged the boy towards Jenny's table. Is this him? yelled Scott halfway to the table. Is this the guy? Jenny stood up, shaking her head side to side. No, it was the waiter, the other guy. The other guy? What other guy? asked Scott, not seeing anyone besides this man and the owner since we arrived. I was confused as well. It's not him, she said again. Where's the other guy? demanded Scott, holding the scared boy of maybe seventeen years old tighter than before. I don't know. He ran out the back kitchen door when she started hollering. That's all I know. Sorry about that, said Scott, releasing his grip on the boy. Chapter 9 Altered Plans Tex was a quarter mile down the road when they realized he was gone, with two large stakes under his arm. At least I got paid for tonight, he said aloud. Tex wasn't one to run ever. And before the day, he would have taken all of them out, or died trying. Then, if successful, as he always was, just hitchhike down the road to another town to start anew. He would need a new plan and a new job if he didn't get his paying one done soon. Trey was another matter, along with the mayor's promise of a new place to call home. If it wasn't for Beth, he would just kill Trey and stay put, right in his uncle's house. But he wanted her, needed her, and the only way for it to work was a terrible fire where only two would survive. He cooked up the steaks first thing. Nobody knew where he was staying, so he wasn't worried about a search party headed his way tonight. How do you like your steak, hun? he called upstairs. Medium well, please, she replied. Medium rare it is, he replied, thinking if Trey said the same thing, he would kill him where he stood. That's an insult to the chef and the steer, but I'll see what I can do, he called back. Leaving one steak whole and cooked rare, he split the second for his guests. Trey's was rare and it took everything in him to cook Beth's medium. It's a compromise, babe, he said aloud, with a quick glance of his upper arm. Tex realized a while back that most people didn't talk to themselves out loud, unless, of course, it was a swear word following a toe baseboard connection or something said aloud that they would regret forever. He understood the difference because that's all he had with his friends in the barn. Even now, he talked to his tattoo, as if Mimi and Stanley were right there perched on his arm, waiting for the next snack. Trey's dinner was shoved under the door with a bag of water and without a word from either man. Did you hear that earlier? Tex asked Beth, keeping his voice low. Do you mean Trey? She asked, trying not to sound clueless or be caught in a lie. Yes, that. I heard some banging and maybe a window breaking, she said. Exactly. He threw a chair right through the glass. But I saw him, and you should have seen the guy, scared as a baby bunny when he realized it was me. It was a knee slapper, bona fide. B-O-N-I-F-I-D-E, he said slower. I think you mean bona fide. Two words, said Beth, before she could take it back. Yep, that's what I done said. Are you going to let him go soon? Came slip sliding out of her mouth like a watermelon seed spit across a room. Let him go? Let him go? He asked, growing agitated. He's free to leave whenever he wants, isn't that right, Trey? He said loudly, not getting a response. See, he doesn't want to. 
I just gave him a perfectly good, rare steak and didn't even get a thank you. I boarded up the window he smashed out earlier today to keep the wind out, and did I get a thank you? No again. I think he's just depressed, is all. Sensitive guys like that get all emotional when they lose something as pretty as you. She blushed but had to force it. A technique she learned way back in her middle school days, when she realized a flirt and a blush could get most boys to do things for her. It started little, like a cookie out of a boy's lunchbox offered at no charge, then some homework done for her. And by high school, she had the math club doing all of her work, and even changing grades and attendance records on the school system from by a few hackers she knew. She could have any boy she wanted, but always had trouble keeping them. What would it take for him to walk out the door? She asked with a cutesy smile, as if she were asking to be bought a drink in a nightclub. As I said, he's free to go as long as he doesn't say nothing about me or you to anyone else, and don't take any food or supplies we got, and that's the problem. I could take out his tongue and maybe solve one. But then where will he go? Ain't got no food, no water, credit cards ain't no good, and he don't look like a good worker either. Boy's got soft hands like a little girl. You say, take his tongue out like you've done it before, have you? Eat your steak every bite he said as he got up and walked out of the room, closing the door behind him. Chapter 10 Where is Jenny? The sheriff met Mr. Holman at the restaurant, getting the news quickly. She says it was him, the guy from the picture, and the restaurant owner says he hired him about a week ago. Goes by the name Trey and is handy with a blade. So it's gotta be him. He could be anywhere right now, but he's in town. It seems close enough to walk to work said Mr. Holman. How about I give you all a ride back home, asked the sheriff. I'm sure it took more than one trip getting up here in that cart of yours. Yeah, it took two, actually. Mrs. Holman took him up on the ride, as did Joe, Shannon, and Jenny, opting to take home their food and insisting we men stay. I didn't mind but felt bad for Jenny. Before, she wasn't sure where he was, probably thinking he was long gone but now she knew he was right here and close enough to touch. I expected him gone by now, out of town at least, said the sheriff to Mr. Holman. But now that he's not, I guess we need to do a proper search. He interviewed the owner, manager, and dishwasher, looking for any clue as to where Tex may be holding up. He talked a lot about his past growing up, said the dishwasher, but nothing about being here or where he's staying. I even asked him once if he lived close, and his stare gave me chills. That's the truth of it. So I never asked again. Did he really do those things I've been hearing about outside town? We don't know for sure, replied the sheriff. Not yet, but it looks possible. So, stay clear of him, and if any of you see him again, come get me right away. We boys headed home a few hours later, and maybe we shouldn't have been driving. Although it was only a golf cart, Mr. Holman dropped us off before heading home. He wanted to check on Jenny, but we all got a no from Judy, Shannon, and Joe. Tomorrow is another day, said Mrs. Holman, as she walked out of our borrowed house, and she's going to sleep this nightmare off, at least for a night. Then we take it a day at a time and hope the sheriff catches up to him before she does. She who? I asked. I'll tell you later, said Shannon, hugging Judy goodnight. What? I asked as soon as she left. Yeah, what? repeated Scott. She's just tired and scared is all. She spoke about looking for some vigilante justice and wants our help to get revenge, said Shannon. I never met the guy, I replied. But if half of what they say he did is true, it's going to take a small army to take him down. It is true, all of it, replied Shannon. There's no other explanation. And don't forget, he may still be hanging around Trey and Beth. I clenched my teeth as it was the first time I had heard or said those two names in a while. It was easier to try and forget, praying they made it down the mountain and back towards California by now. It's getting complicated, said Scott. Joe replied, it always was. There is nothing more to do tonight. She wants to be alone. So you, Alex, get your snuggle bunny back, at least for a night, said Shannon with a wink. I'll take it, I said excitedly before remembering I promised to take things slow. Easy, Tiger, she replied. I know. I forgot for a second, but it's all good. Come on, Scout. You can warm both of our feet tonight, she said. Like a 150-pound chaperone, I whispered to Scott. 
That's what you get for flip-flopping girls, bro, he whispered back, patting me on the shoulder and giving me a half of a side guy hug. Morning came way too soon with my head pounding. Every sound was like a bomb going off inside my head. There is nothing free in this world, not even a crazy night, my father used to say. I missed him and felt in my gut that he was doing good and taking good care of our family. I vowed to track down some ham radio guys and maybe get a connection back home when this election business was done. The bigger concern I had pushed to the back of my mind was going home, getting us all home, and what it would take. Owing Mr. Holman a debt, I promised acting as a true opponent, and the only choice was to see it through. Unfortunately, it was the after that bothered me, and I wasn't the only one. Jenny, called out Shannon. What time is it? I said aloud, not getting a response, but the glare of the morning sun told me it was past time to wake up. Jenny, have you seen her? she asked, coming into the room. No, I've been in here all night. Did you check the bathroom? Of course, she's not here. Probably went outside to walk Mama, I said. No, Mama's here and Jenny is not. Okay, please get Scott for me. I'll get dressed and wander around outside, I said. Scott and I did two loops around the house, calling out her name on the second. I don't see her, he said, looking through his binoculars in every direction. Hold on, I told him. I needed to check something. The bicycle she showed up to the Holman's residence on was stored in the shed. I had never seen her ride it since, but I had to know. Opening the creaking front door, I already knew. Of course it was kept locked, but we all remembered where the key was above the door jamb and to the right. Not that there was much to protect inside. A riding lawnmower zapped on the day. Some old tools and a few half-balled tires only used in a pinch a while ago. And of course, her bicycle. It's gone, I hollered back at Scott, still scanning with his eyepiece. You don't think? I'm sure she's at the Holman's house. She probably couldn't sleep last night and took a ride over early this morning, he said. We walked the quarter of a mile to their place. Rifles pointed to the ground. Scout's sister greeted us out front with a lick instead of a bark, and the front door opened before we got there. Howdy, boys, said Mr. Holman putting his hand over this eyes to shield the morning sun. I expected you two to be sleeping in, he added. Is she here? I asked, opting to skip the small talk typical in a high-altitude mountain town. Is who here? You mean Judy? No. Jenny, I said, getting a pit in my stomach. No, we haven't seen her since yesterday. Is everything all right? No, sir, she's missing and her bike is gone. We thought maybe she came over here. Mr. Holman shook his head back and forth, pointing his hand to his forehead. I heard about what she said. You know, in my day, people told me an awful lot of things like that, and it rarely amounted to anything. But it's still not good. Maybe she visited an old friend in town, a boyfriend, girlfriends from school. She never told us much about herself, but she had to have friends and neighbors. I mean, I knew everyone on my block at that age and still do. Yeah, it could be, I replied but I feel like she's my responsibility to keep safe now. Can we borrow your cart? Sure, but I'm driving. I think I know where to start the search. We made a quick stop at Grady's place. I hadn't seen him since the funeral and realized the last full conversation we had was at the bar over two scotches. I felt bad for him and his family, not having a clue what it must be like to lose a child. I wasn't sure if I should say something now, and Scott either, so we kept our mouths shut. Be right back, said Rick, ducking into Grady's house and returning five minutes later. Alex, Scott, it's good to see you boys, said Grady. I needed to get out of the house anyway, and God have mercy on those who would seek to hurt that girl. Good to see you too, sir, is all I could come up with, hoping it was enough. The first stop, said Rick to Grady, is the restaurant we ate at last night. It seems she believes she saw our guy and the story from the owner seems legit. So that animal is still here, asked Grady. I figured he'd be long gone by now. It looks like it. How's that arm healing up anyway? Rick asked. Not bad, I guess. Besides the cast, I can't even tell something happened to it. The family. They are grieving. It's a whole other deal when there are no distractions. What do you mean? asked Rick. Well, before there would have been work, school, kids' sports, bills to pay, and traffic to sit in. All distractions. 
Now it's just an entire family with one missing and nothing but hours of quiet all day long to remind us of the loss. I'm not saying I would ever forget, even for a single minute, but it's different is all. I'll take the blame to my grave, and when I see my little man again, I hope he can forgive me. Count on it, old friend, said Rick, pulling into the restaurant parking lot. He knew it wasn't anything more than a tragic accident, and no fault of Grady's or anyone else, but there was no point in arguing a man's guilt. That's between him and God. They are not open until late afternoon, but let's find the owner. I know he lives on the property. Before we exited the cart, he was walking up. Hello, said Rick. We thought it would be harder to find you this morning since you're not open for a while. It's the girl you're looking for, right? The owner asked. Yes, that's right. We thought she may have stopped by here. She did, and you just missed her by maybe forty-five minutes. She was agitated, is a nice way to put it. But then who can blame her? Not me. She is looking for him, Trey, Tex, the guy who worked here, whatever his real name is. I'm pretty sure that's the guy, said Rick. He looks different than we remember, but the story seems right. I forgot to tell the police until this morning when she asked me, said the restaurant owner. Did your guy have a scar, maybe two, two and a half inches long above his right eye? Yes, he did. I remember it, said Grady, and the kid artist put it in his sketch. It's him, then. He covered it with makeup, probably, but I was close to him in the kitchen, and it's there, true as sin. Tell you the truth, the guy creeped me out. I only hired him because I needed a butcher badly, and he carved up a side of beef faster than I've ever seen before, and accurate to the ounce without even using a scale. Damnedest thing I've ever seen. In my kitchen, at least. I only wish I knew where he lived before. I would have his driver's license, social, and address on file. Things have changed, unfortunately. He can't be too far, said Rick. I mean, he walked here from home for his shifts, far as I know. Sounds right. I never saw a cart, motorcycle, or bicycle even, the owner stated. Lots of houses, though, in a couple of square miles of here, and most vacant this time of year. All those Texas folks come on up here, buying up all the property, only to visit for a week a year. These guys, said Rick, straight-faced, but pointing his thumb towards the back seat at Scott and me. Just visiting, I replied. At least that was the plan. All I know, said the owner, is that she is out for blood, has a pistol and a bike, and is headed for downtown. I tried to stop her, but there's a fine line even now between helping someone and holding them hostage. Told her to go straight home, but who knows? It's okay, said Rick. That girl has a mind of her own, and the good Lord himself would have a time keeping her in one place. Thank you for your help. Wait, said the owner, putting his hand on the steering wheel. There's something else. I'm sorry I didn't put two and two together, but it hit me about 2 a.m. last night, and there's something you need to know. When this character was in my kitchen, I overheard him talking to someone outside the back door a few days back. I've seen the boy before, one of that sorry mayor's goons. So I listened in and heard bits and pieces of a conversation about a job and somebody getting fired or taken from their post and a large payment, half paid up front. It sounded like something against the mayor himself. And to be honest, I wouldn't lose any sleep if he was out of a job and out of town, for that matter. But this morning my dishwasher came to me, not the smartest kid around but loyal to a fault. Anyway, he said they were talking about the mayor, all right, but not the current bastard holding the office. My friend, I think they were talking about you. Now, why would this guy, Tex, I guess his real name is, and the mayor's guy be talking about money, jobs, and you? I don't know, but if I were you, I'd have eyes in the back of my head at least for a bit. Just so we're clear, you've got my vote, Rick. Sorry, Alex. I heard you're running a tight campaign, but Rick here is local, at least now. And what we need moving forward, in my opinion, of course. No worries. I get it, was the best reply I could come up with on the spot. Thank you for your support and the information, said Mr. Holman. I won't be intimidated by the mayor. He already tried that once, but I'll keep a lookout in front of me and behind until we can get his mess sorted out. We headed towards downtown, all looking in different directions. No point in calling out her name in the chilly morning, as the streets were deserted minus a few old-timers who hadn't seen Jenny when asked. How can a girl on a bicycle disappear so fast? asked Mr. Holman. Chapter 11 The Courthouse 
Jenny ditched her bike behind the courthouse and ducked inside through a back entrance rarely used before the day. She wasn't sure what she would be looking for, but thought she could get out of the cold and clear her head out of public sight. Martha, the longtime secretary front desk lady, was long gone and not returning after being injured on the job. She was replaced by a new breed of worker, the same as most posts now, including shops, restaurants, banks, office buildings, and any other business that used to thrive. She was replaced by air, dead space, nothing left to open, work in, or close, this day or any other. Think, she said in her head. Think before you do anything or get caught, she whispered. She was only thirteen, but new county records, including residences, were kept here in the records department. I don't have all day, and they are already looking for you, she told herself. But of course they are, and when they find you, this mission, charade or fantasy as some may call it, will surely be over. Jenny had one chance to find that bastard of a man that killed her parents and even the score. Where to start? Where to start, she thought. Even if she could find the records here of vacant houses in the winter owned by out-of-state folks, how many were there within walking distance of the restaurant? Twenty, fifty, more than a hundred was her guess. And then what? Bicycle up to each one, knocking politely on the front door. Excuse me, is the man who murdered my parents inside? I would like to have a little chat with him. Please send him outside so I can shoot him dead. No, that was fantasy, and she was smart enough to know it. The front door opened, and voices could be heard, all mail and cuss words every few seconds. She knew the mayor worked out of the courthouse, as it was her job to know, but she didn't expect him this early. She was right. It wasn't him, but the men cursing and carrying on were connected, using his name every minute or so, and in a disparaging way. Spill your rotten guts, boys, she whispered from the utility closet, with the door open just enough to hear. Tell me something good, she added, only in her head. She wasn't confident they would tell her something she could use, but at this point it beat riding around half-empty frozen streets, looking for a man who could be anywhere right now. Looky here, she whispered. The mayor himself is finally joining us, and it's not even noon. Eh? The conversation changed immediately and turned to Mr. Holman and her candidate, Alex, who all apparently thought didn't have a chance of winning. What are you going to do to make sure that fancy city slicker of a lawyer don't run away with it, boss? Asked the man Jenny would give the stupidest of the bunch award to, from what she had seen thus far. I mean, he's got some momentum. Nice shoes, I hear, and people like him. If he wins, we're all out of a job. Nice shoes, asked the mayor, shaking his head. Can't fix stupid, boys. No, can't be done. Anyway, I've got it covered. How so? Because it looks like he's outgunning you. And even that kid from Texas. If you can't beat some drifter in from Texas, well, that's just sad, plain sad, if you ask me. Nobody is, I've got it covered, the mayor said again, not caring if he sounded convincing given present company. I have a guy who has been paid to do a thing, and I'm expecting him here any time. Jenny's eyes opened wide. Is he talking about Tex? She thought. He has to be. Who else in this small mountain town would interfere with an election besides, of course, the sitting mayor himself? Is he coming here now? She unzipped the backpack she had brought carrying water, a few snacks, and the pistol she borrowed from whoever it was at the house. All the confidence in the world couldn't teach her to shoot a type of gun she never had even held before. She pulled it out of her backpack, holding it in both hands. Was it ready to fire, or was there a button to push? Did it even have bullets inside? What am I doing? she asked, as the pistol slipped from her sweaty hands, clanking loudly on the concrete floor. The thud echoed through the building, as did her shriek, thinking it would surely fire around in any direction. Who's there? the mayor shouted from the top of the stairs. Jenny crouched under the desk, Martha's desk, trying not to make a sound. Who's there? he demanded, looking over the rail. Probably just some rats or raccoons come in from the cold, said one of his men. Go check it out, he commanded. Two of the mayor's men walked slowly down the stairs, rifles pointed to the ground. Come on out, rodent, said one. The desk she was under, Martha's desk, sat in the middle of the large lobby downstairs. 
Only the back of the desk concealed her from their view, but it was a long way from the back door. The tough young girl trembled as the heavy boot footsteps came down the last flight of stairs. Jenny scooped up the pistol, putting it deep into her back. Game face on, she said, as she popped out from behind the desk. Hey, fellas, have you seen a green and navy blue sweater by chance? Martha, the receptionist, you know, the one who got hurt right here not too long ago. Well, anyway, she sent me over to see if she left it here. It's her favorite sweater, she tells me. They paused at the bottom of the stairs, not pointing their rifles at the floor or at Jenny, but somewhere in between. So have you seen it? She said as confidently as she could. No, one man replied. And you shouldn't be in here. It's no place for kids, interjected the other. Okay, thanks anyway. I guess I'll be going, she replied, turning to leave. Hey, called the mayor from the top of the stairs. You stop right there. She stopped, frozen like a dream where something chases you, but your legs won't move or feel like they are encased in 100 pounds of rock-solid cement. I was just looking for Martha's sweater, she said, not turning to face him. Young lady, that's far enough. Turn around. Turn around, he yelled, getting a jolt out of her and doing as he commanded. Keep her there, he instructed to his men. I'll be right down. I know you, he said once downstairs. I've seen you around town campaigning against me. Isn't that right? It's a free town and elections are won, not assumed, she replied, still nervous but putting up a good front. So, Mr. Mayor, currently, of course, are you going to tell your guys to let me go? Or should I speak to the sheriff about a kidnapping in a city-owned building? We're just talking here, Missy, he said. Nobody is keeping you here against your will. You're free to go whenever you like. Okay, thanks. I like now she said, turning to leave. The door opened, not the one she had come in, but the front door, quickly and with the force of a determined man. Hey, boss, told you I'd be back, said Tex, walking in and straight past Jenny, so close she could smell the stench on his clothes. It's him, she thought, but didn't scream like last night. Who's the dame and why is she staring at me, boss? The mayor knew her for more than the campaign trail and even hit up her dad for some good Faith Town donations a while back. He knew they were killed, and who did it, but now wasn't the time for everyone to get up to speed. Uh, hey Trey, he said out loud. This is, I didn't catch your name, he asked. Jenny with AI, she replied, not taking her eyes off the man who made her an orphan. Well, Jenny with an IRA, or whatever it is, said Tex. I hear you're doing a bang-up job around town but it's a tough place out on the streets, especially now. Gotta watch out for bad guys like this one, he said, pointing to the mayor. One minute you are walking down the street, minding your own business, and the next, well, it's not pretty. You best be running along back to school. We've got business here, he added, waving her to scoot with his hand. She paused, frozen with at least ten of the million thoughts running through her head, all fighting for first place lined up like soldiers of the Civil War. Step right up and fire. Next, step right up and fire, with the lucky ones starting in the back row. Dig in the backpack. Hope the gun is ready to shoot and take them all out before they could fire back. Run for the door. Walk calmly across the room and back outside, something in between, she wasn't sure, and stood still. Well, you heard the man, Missy, said the mayor. Time to go, and I'll be sure to let you know if we find that sweater. Give my best to Martha he said, as a snake oil salesman may do, before calling on their next sales trip. Jenny robotically headed out the door, and she covered her mouth to stifle the scream. Rage, fear, confusion, and revenge clouded her mind as she mounted her bicycle and headed home. Weaving through back alleys, the last thing she wanted was to be spotted by anyone who had seen her campaigning just a day earlier. There, I said out loud. There she is, back up! I called out to Rick. Head down the alley, I told him, catching a glimpse of her pink jacket as she turned the corner. Faster. Can you go faster? Nope. This is a golf cart, Andretti. Remember, she can probably do 25, but our girl has a head start. It looks like she's headed home anyway. Let's not have her think we're chasing her, agreed? Yes, I said. Me too, replied Scott as we slowed, letting her disappear down the main road to our home. We'll follow her. Not too close, but not far either said Rick. 
We pulled into Rick's place, and the three of us walked over to ours, getting bombarded by all three. Shannon came out first, yelling, He's at the mayor's office. Tex is at the mayor's office. Right. Now. Slowing her words in between breaths. How do you know that? asked Rick. Jenny was there and saw him. He and the mayor have ties. And Hold on, I'll be right. Not like me to forget my radio, Rick announced, jogging for home. Rick got the sheriff on the radio and relayed the message. Chapter 12 Come and Gone All right, Mayor, said Tex, after Jenny ran out the back door. Let's get down to business. How about we talk, just you and me, and have your powder puff squad here wait outside? The nervous Mayor Haskins tapped his chin, trying to decide if he wanted to be alone with this man. We're just talking today, that's all, Tex started. If there comes the point when we're not, you'll need a lot more guys than these chumps to keep you safe from me. Believe it. The mayor almost said, Oh, I do, but instead ordered his men to wait in the hall. I said outside, Tex corrected him. Not outside the door, outside, outside. Comprendo, amigo. What's it going to be, Mr. Mayor, boss man? All right, boys, wait outside, all the way out. Got nothing but love and respect for you, boss, said Tex, grinning. It's just, well, you ain't got me that house yet. And like I said before, I got a big rat problem and it ain't getting solved. Comprendo, senor. Mayor Haskins put his hands to his face and sighed. Okay, I'll start, but I want to know what's going on with the job. Is that all right? Tex paused for dramatic effect, as he sometimes did when a man who was supposed to be his superior practically begged. Sure, boss. I almost had it done last night, real close-like. But I'm a gentleman, if nothing else. At least that's what the ladies say. So I'll let you go first. Where's my new house? He asked, quickly pulling a six-inch long blade from his sleeve and stabbing it a quarter inch into the mayor's desk. Okay, okay, replied the mayor, sweat forming on his brow, despite the chilled room, and wishing he had kept at least one of his men here in the meeting. Just hold on, Trey. You can drop the Trey stuff when it's just us. I'm Tex. Nice to meet you, Mayor, he said, holding his hand out. Well, go on. Take it. We're still friendly, aren't we? Of course, Tex. He barely squeaked out the name and was prepared for one of those death hand grips he had seen in a movie somewhere. When one man squeezes the hand of another so hard, the sound of bones snapping could be heard clear across the room. Of course, he replied, slowly reaching his hand out and bracing for whatever came next. Well, all right then said Tex, giving a normal handshake. Not soft like a limp noodle and not bone-breaking, just firm and confident. You were expecting something else, am I right? Told you we're just talking. I'm a man of my word, both ways. Ask anyone. Mayor Haskins sighed relief, not meaning to out loud, before putting his politician hat on. Okay, Tex, if you're the kind of man I think you are, then you like to get down to business. This here map, he added, spreading it out across his desk, is a list of every seasonal home in the town limits. There are more, of course, outside the official area, but there are nearly 300 right here, and most of them are vacant as we speak. Would you mind putting that paperweight on the far side, he asked, as he held his side down with a coffee cup reading World's Best Dad. You're a dad, huh? asked Tex. Huh? Oh no, that cup isn't mine. It belongs to one of my guys. But I broke mine, so I took his. I never had much use for something that needs so much taking care of. I'll stick to my plants and myself. You? Do you have any kids? Hard to say. I check the mailbox every Father's Day, and so far nothing. That's a joke right there, kind of. Anyway, not yet to my knowledge. But then there's my new girl and me. Well, she's got those birthing hips, if you know what I mean. She can't keep her hands off me either, so who knows? Maybe sooner than later. Okay, down to business, said the mayor. As I said, this is a map of all the seasonal homes in the entire town, including and surrounding a few miles in every direction. That's a lot, replied Tex, now rubbing his chin. Why, you got a map of them all. No. Out of town has come up here for a week or two, maybe even a month in the summer, but never longer than that. So they all pay a little something for us to keep an eye on them, so they don't get looted. Busted pipes, storm damage, critters, and what not. A few come up in the winter, but that's rare. So which ones are vacant? 
all of them except for the five in blue. Here, 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 and here, he added, pointing to each on the map. You know, I never like to stay in one place too long. That's a fact, so I'd be interested to learn of a few that might fit our needs. Unless, of course, you and your boys have already ransacked them, replied Tex, as more of a fishing expedition than an actual question. Nope, not a one. I need to give enough time in case the owners find their way up here, but I guess eventually it's a given. Okay, here's the lake and golf course. This here is the Safeway grocery store, or was I guess. And here's the main bridge over the river. For a point of reference, where are you staying now? He asked, reaching out to hand Tex a pen. <laughs> if I take that pen, it will be sticking out of your neck in three seconds. And to your earlier statement, you don't know me like you think you do, and likely don't want to. Oh, sorry. You're kind of private, is that it? <laughs> Got me pegged, so let me tell you how it's going to work, said Tex. I'm going to pick one and move, that's it. Then in a week or two, we're going to move again, and then again a week after that. Get what I'm laying down, Mayor. And neither I nor anyone else will know exactly where you're staying, right? Wham, bam, thank you, uh, man. That is it. You win first prize, nailed it right on the head. And if anyone comes a-looking, it's you they will find in my basement. Now hold on, I can't tell the sheriff what to do. I'm not asking you to, replied Tex. Just let me know if he's looking for me. He is. I don't know the whole of it, but they put some pictures up around town, and I'm sure they'll be out looking at some point. Now I ain't the smartest man in town, but I know you two work together on town matters, maybe even have mutual respect for each other. You like him, the sheriff, that is. He's all right, I guess. We butt heads now and then. I got me an idea. Yes, I do. And oh my, it's a dandy. I just thought of it right now. Picture this. The Holman guy gone out of the picture. The kid, he ain't got a snowball's chance in. Hey, boss, can we come back? One of his guys called from downstairs. It's cold out here. When I tell you, commanded Tex. Where was I anyway? Well, once you get to be mayor again, I could run for sheriff. The pause was awkward, and Tex was content to let it drag out as long as needed before Mayor Haskins replied. Hmm, I guess that's a possibility. I'm just not sure how you're going to campaign when people are looking for you. I'm good with people and have a natural ability to get people to do what I want, so I'm thinking I wouldn't need to campaign all that hard anyway. Just persuade a few influential people like yourself to back me. I think you mean influential people, said the mayor. Yeah, that's what I done said. Think about it. Me and you running this town sounds good, don't it? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, why not? It's just keeping knuckleheads from bar fights and other minor stuff around here anyway. I'm guessing you could handle that. He spoke back to the issue at hand like a true politician. You pick the house, move around if you want, but get my effing job done. Tex laughed, having never been talked to like that by anyone still standing. That's what I was trying to say. I almost had him last night. Got me this job at a restaurant. A nice place that serves steak and everything. Well, he was there last night with his family and a bunch of other people. I would have had him, but I got recognized. All I heard was some girl screaming. That's him, that's him. That's the girl, said the mayor, pointing to the door. The girl downstairs, that's her. Her mom and dad got killed out on the road up here, but you wouldn't know anything about that, would you? It's a bad scene, that's a fact. But nah, I'm more the passive type. I'm wondering if I need someone with a lesser profile to finish my job. You can keep the first half of the money if that's what you are worried about. No, no worries. I mean, I ain't worried because I'm getting paid either way. We got a deal and I'm getting a little itchy if you get my drift. Somebody's going into the ground and soon. It just depends on who you want it to be. No job, no money, said the mayor in a less than confident voice. That's smart. Good business for sure. I had a coupon that, well, a lawyer told me the same thing a few years back. See, we had a deal, him and me, the handshake type. And let's just say he pussied out before I could get it done. And then he had the audacity to... Audacity, I think you mean, said the mayor. And don't worry, I'm good for it. Oh, there's no doubt. I know it like my own face. I lost my butcher job last night and nobody carves with a knife like I do. That's a fact. T yeah, sorry to hear that. I'm sure something else will come around. Yeah, me too, but until then I'm going to get paid the second half, plus a tip. 
I believe twenty percent is custom, so as not to defend the one feeding you. Offend, the mayor couldn't help but point out, and that wasn't the deal. It was, as I remember, and I think you do too, half down and half on completion. It looks like the job had a medium-rare steak, prime cut with a side of creamed spinach, and a house salad with blue cheese last night. But either way, I want my money now. I know it's here, and it's just you and me. I'll be honest, though, I ain't packing. Just got this here. The blade is all, that is the honest truth. I know you got a pistol in the drawer, and you'd be well within your right to go for it. If I'm honest, and I've been known to on occasion, he laughed at his own joke. Seriously, I'm itching over here, like I done said already, so I'm doing a job, him or one of your specified guys who are outside on my order. They don't know me, a bunch of sissies. Or it's you, that's the truth of it. And the craziest part, wait for it, wait for it, he whispered. I don't much care which it is. Now give me the rest of my money, he demanded. All right, just turn around halfway at least. The mayor fumbled with the safe combination and got it on the third try. He grabbed two stacks pre-wrapped and counted out eight more bills. Here it is, paid in full, tip included. Don't go disappearing on me now, he added, not concerned if he did. All right, good business done today. Got a new house and a paid up front job. Don't worry, mayor. I'm on it and thinking about my next gig. I could make this a regular thing. That's a bona fide fact. Yes, it is. Come on in, boys, Tex yelled down the stairs, laughing as they all filed into the building. I already half run your crew. How hard can Sheriff be? He said, tucking the cash into his jeans pockets and heading down the stairs. The walk home for Tex was the best he had since he could remember. He picked a few houses out on the map maybe half a mile from the current place. He figured the fire would be quick and probably burn out before a fire unit could make it on the scene. The plan was simple, as he always preferred. Move the first two of them and then get rid of the evidence. I'll scout it out in the morning and figure it out by noon, he said aloud. Miss you guys, he added, looking at his arm with a real-life likeness of Stanley and Mimi staring back at him. We're getting low on food, he added having rummaged through the cupboards of Trey's uncle's house. The night was quiet, with a near full moon, and Tex left out at morning light. He wanted to bring the shopping cart he had stored in the shed from the Safeway store, but thought it might bring too much attention. So two large pillowcases in Trey's backpack would have to do. He didn't ask the mayor for any house keys. He'd been breaking into places his whole life. Mission one, get in, get the stuff, get out and find a new place. He laughed aloud at his ignorance, once inside the first home, too close to stay but loaded with food, mostly boxed and canned, and liquor that never went bad. I bet there's a stash like this in every house, and here I've been working my butt off for this, he thought, holding up the money he had not quite earned yet. And for what? It ain't no good, except maybe at the bar, he said aloud to no one. I got the cash cow with these houses, and I'm going to get mine before someone else done figures it out. Psst. If you're enjoying this audiobook, can you do us a jolly good favor and subscribe? It's a marvelous way to help us bring you oodles more free audiobooks. Now, back to the story. Chapter 13. House Hunting. Tex was excited, like he hadn't been in quite a while. He figured they would have enough food, maybe even for the winter after checking a second and then a third home side by side. He wasn't sure why regular townsfolks hadn't thought of it, but Beth suggested that maybe they were afraid of the sheriff if they took anything. I guess that's the only thing that makes much sense, babe, he replied. Good thing I'm not afraid of him. In fact, that brings me to my next surprise. I'm thinking of running for sheriff of this here town. What do you think of that? Beth paused, shocked at the revelation but careful to mind her tongue. Well, I think it sounds like a lot of work. And then when would I see you, babe? It's a fair question, but we don't see each other that much right now, unless... Unless what? She asked, forcing a sweet smile. Unless we do, that's the fact of it. How do we do that? She asked, hoping she could weave some reality into the fantasy he was proposing without upsetting the apple cart. It was a delicate balance, and she knew it. I mean, I'm tied up all the time, and you're out... Well, doing whatever you do. Providing, you mean, 
like putting food on the table and making sure the wood stove stays burning. You would freeze to death if I didn't. We would, she stated. Oh, you mean him, right? No, I mean us, you and me. I like the sound of us, he replied. I figured you would come around eventually. They all do. They? <laughs> Just other girlfriends is all, but you're not like them, Beth. No, sir, ma'am, I mean. You are one of a kind. I got a thing about people. It's true. I can tell you are different as apples and pears. Oranges? That's what I'm talking about. Apples and them oranges. So, how do we see more of each other, you asked? Trust and truth are two things I know a thing or three about. I'll give you a little more freedom as you earn it. And who knows? Down the road we may be passing each other downtown, meeting for a quick lunch before going to our separate jobs, then meeting back home for dinner, and who knows what. Sound good, darling? Yeah. Yes, it does, she said, forcing a smile. It is said and likely true that a woman's mind is thinking about one hundred things at once, while a man in the same room or conversation may be wondering if he's going to get the fries or tater tots with lunch. Beth was no different, and Tex was somewhere in between, simple but always two steps ahead when it came to sinister plans. It wouldn't be easy, Beth thought, to eventually break free, and she may lose her life trying, but she vowed today to finally make it happen. She used to watch those mystery programs on TV, the ones where the captor gives his victim a little more room each encounter, eventually taking a shower without tying her up, and she escapes running and screaming, dressed only in a nightgown in the middle of the afternoon into oncoming traffic, hoping for a good Samaritan to not run her over and instead bring her to the police station, all while praying the car she got into doesn't start the pattern all over again. She thought they always seemed to make it, but now things were a bit different. No showers, traffic, and a police station she had no idea where to find. All I know, said Tex, is that when you keep your head up, look for opportunities, and do right by people, Good things just fall right into your lap. I wasn't sure about it before, but I'm thinking this may be a good spot to call home, at least for a bit. What do you say? Still homesick for California? A little, she lied, but staying here with you sounds like a better plan. That's what I wanted to hear. Who knows? Maybe sometime soon we'll have a few little Texas just a running around. Her skin crawled hearing this. Not that it was a surprise, but more of a horror movie scenario than a concept to consider and when she blurted out, or Beth's if they are girls, she couldn't believe her dirty mouth. Is he getting into my head, or am I getting the upper hand in the trust department, talking future with a man I can't stand and am terrified of, she thought. She wanted to ask again about Trey, but didn't. Tex made lunch, tossing together a few cans he borrowed from a neighbor's home. Chili canned and green beans packaged the same. He figured everyone up here had firewood and propane, so cooking was grill or open fire only and should last quite a while. Eat up, sweetie. I've got a surprise for you right after, he said, serving her and sliding a plate under Trey's door. Can't fit a bowl under the door, sport, Tex said aloud. But it's chilly on a plate, still good, I tried it. There was no response, and Tex didn't mind. Beth ate as quickly as she could, with one free hand and nearly choking on her beans, wanting to get the new surprise over with as soon as possible. A quick speech on staying close, not calling or screaming outside, was brief and serious, followed by getting bundled up because they were going out. Tex led her down the stairs the first time she'd done it since her fall with Trey. Outside, the bright light hit her eyes, not blinding but more than she was expecting. She raised her free hand, the one not handcuffed to his, to shield the light. What are you looking for? he asked suspiciously. Nothing, babe. It's just that it's nice to be outside. It's been a while and looking out my window doesn't quite do it. So where are we going? She asked hesitantly, her mind running a hundred miles an hour. Well, today I'm buying you a home, Tex said, flashing cash the mayor had paid him. But we have a house already. You don't miss a beat, that's a fact. I know it's true and you're right. We do have a house, but I'm buying you a home and you get to pick it out. The idea of being alone with him scared her tenfold, considering what she had experienced thus far. True, Trey wouldn't be of much help if she had to fight off Tex, but just having him one room over somehow felt like a busy home and not a prison cell. So is Trey coming with us? she asked, not wanting to, but having to know, 
like hearing about the death of an old friend and needing to know what happened in all its gritty detail. Somehow, as bad as it sounds, there is comfort in the knowing and finality to unanswered questions. I think he'll probably choose to stay where he is. After all, it's his home. I talked with him about it the other day. You were probably sleeping anyway. He wanted to stay and wished us the best of luck with our new life. It seemed like he was happy to be getting his home back for himself. He didn't say anything about you either, Beth, before you ask. But you know how those frat boys are, around one day and gone the next. How about those other kids you were traveling with before? The ones you told me about when we first met? What happened with them? I don't know. Alex dumped me up at the cabin before we left. Alex? Yeah, that's his name. Do you know him? Cade, right? That's right. I don't know him, but he's running for mayor alongside the Holman guy. Alex Cade, the Estes Park Crusade, the signs say. Huh, that's funny. The only thing he's good at is being a jerk. Did he hurt you? Beth stayed silent, looking down towards the ground. Did he hurt you? he asked again, squeezing her hand hard and raising his voice. Yes, she replied, with tears running down her face. Well then, I've got some work to get done. Plus I kind of owe it to the mayor to help him get re-elected, or at least be the linebacker for him. I'll fix it, don't you worry, he said, kissing her on the head so quick she couldn't pull away. Then heading down the snow-covered back road, he felt good, like this was two new lovers out for a midday stroll, shopping for their forever home. Hold up, said Tex, stopping abruptly when they were a quarter mile down the road. What? asked Beth, looking everywhere but in front of them. That, he replied, not pointing but nodding down the road a hundred yards or so at a figure coming toward them. He was heading away from us but now turned towards us. Tex watched as the man increased his foot speed, heading for them, raising one arm. What do we do? asked Beth frantically, but not too much. It was a balancing act and the biggest one of her life so far. Her mind was a roller coaster, trying to come up with a plan. A wink, nod, or something else to say she was in distress. Maybe a full-out scream for help if she wasn't handcuffed to the scariest man in town. We wait. I ain't running from no stranger, he said, squeezing her hand and covering the cuffs. He whispered, There's only one set of keys. I've had these cuffs for years and lost the extra key some time ago. So no funny business he added, both realizing they were soon in for a meet and greet. Howdy, folks, the man of easily sixty-five or seventy years called out, still holding his arm in the air. Howdy, folks, he said again, after neither responded. Howdy back, old-timer, said Tex, squeezing Beth's hand to stay quiet. Don't see a lot of folks walking around nowadays, he said, reaching his hand out. Name's Roger, he stated, withdrawing his hand after no-takers. I'm Trey. And this here and Becky, said Tex. Nice hat, old-timer. Veteran, huh? World War, I'm guessing. Nah, I'm smartass, he responded. What did you say your name was, sweetie? he asked. Becky, responded Tex. You okay, Becky? he asked, seeing the sun shine off the top of the mostly hidden handcuff. She's just dandy now. Step aside, war hero, said Tex, motioning for the man to keep walking. Roger put his right hand to his chin. You look familiar, Trey. Do we know each other? I nah, we're newish around here. I just got one of those faces, I guess. Get confused with celebrities from time to time. Is that so? asked Roger, not taking his eyes off of Tex. That's a fact, Jack, he said, making the pistol clearly visible on his right hip, walking around the veteran and continuing down the road. Be seeing you folks soon, real soon, Roger called after them. Not if I see you first, Gramps. Tex called back without turning around. Roger picked up the pace, heading for home. Many in town were now armed openly, and even more concealed some type of weapon when walking about. But he walked nearly every day this same beat, and hadn't before seen a need for it. Grabbing his Glock 19, he loaded seven rounds into the clip, the only one he would carry. His friends teased him for not having it already done, but he didn't mind. A loaded clip can mess with the springs over time. He remembered hearing at a handgun presentation in a sporting goods store years ago. These things don't go in as easy as they used to, he said out loud, getting a, What's that, dear? from his wife Martha. Nothing, dear. I have to go out for a bit. Can I get you anything first? Just some water, please, she asked, 
her hips still in a cast from the incident at the mayor's office. Where are you headed? No, going to meet up with old friends from back in the day, but only if you're going to be okay. You can say it, the regular crew. You've been going over there several times a week for years. I'm good, you know that now. Just because I'm laid up doesn't mean you are. Roger was a mountain resident, almost a native, having lived here since the mid-70s, and over the years formed a small but lively group of veterans, including Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, and a guy recently in Afghanistan. They were from diverse backgrounds and ages, ranging from 24 to the mid-70s, but with a healthy respect for the country, faith, and protecting the town. These days, many could be found at the local coffee shop morning and afternoon, at least as long as the beans are still ground. Today was no exception as he rode his bicycle the mile and a half through packed snow, hoping to find some of the crew still hanging out. He was a three-day-a-week guy now that his wife of more than fifty years was recovering from her mishap at the mayor's office. Roger was happy to see ten bikes outside the dim-lit shop, as it was how most got around town nowadays, next to walking and occasional cross-country skis or snowshoes. Six were his core group, with another few supposedly arriving soon. He waited a few minutes, getting a coffee, camp coffee, as it was known now, hand ground and cooked over an open flame. Still, he didn't complain as they accepted his one dollar twenty-five cents, as long as he brought his own cup. Two of the three showed within minutes, and he started with what he knew, followed by what he guessed, and ended up pale as snow when one of his old buddies pulled out a half-crumpled picture that he said he found outside on the ground. It sounds like this could be the fella, his buddy said, flattening the drawing with his palm. That's it. Him, the poor bastard, exclaimed Roger. I thought I'd met him before, but it was that damn picture. I passed a few of them riding home from here. It's him, all right. The hair is different, and that scar is covered, but it's there. That's the guy, and now I know why he had her cuffed. We're going to need the sheriff on this. Hold on now, Roger, replied Hank. Hank was the youngest at only twenty-four, a real badass from the war in Afghanistan. He came back missing an eye and a few fingers on his left hand but he was the last guy anyone in town wanted to mess with. Still, he was part of the group and got teased on a regular basis for being a kid compared to everyone else. Hold on, he repeated. Let's just talk about this. The sheriff is not a bad guy from what I hear. He's had posters like this one here up for weeks now, and still this guy is running around up to God knows what. Now he's got this pretty girl taken hostage. Who said she was pretty? asked Roger. Oh, so she's not? asked Hank. Okay, yes, she's pretty, real pretty. Don't tell Martha I said that, but she's a looker, the kind on a magazine cover. That don't mean she's up for auction if she gets rescued. I know that, Roger, replied Hank. I'm just getting all the facts. So he had a pistol and handcuffs on her, right? Yes, she was handcuffed to him, one hand each, so she couldn't run, I guess. And no, before you ask, I did not have my pistol or a rifle on me. If I had, we wouldn't be talking about how to handle this situation. It would have been done. Sure, sure, said Hank seriously. I'm just saying all of us here served our country with honor and bravery, and now we just sit and drink coffee like a bunch of old ladies in a bridge club. This is our chance to get some action and help our town. Plus, we got an attractive woman, as you said, who needs help. Who's in? I am, said one. Me too, said another. I'm on the fence said Roger. I'm not as young as most of you, and I've got a laid-up wife at home. Maybe this is one for the sheriff. I get it, replied Hank. We all do. You've done a lot already. You've done your part. We can finish it, and the sheriff hasn't done anything yet anyway. No, I'm the only one that's seen them up close, replied Roger, adding. I'm not chasing anyone, but I'll be a part of it. Fair enough, said Hank, with an excitement Roger hadn't seen recently, if ever. All in all, Hank recruited five men, plus himself and Roger, all weighing in on the planning over the next two hours. I'm headed home, announced Roger, never wanting to be gone from Martha too long in her current condition. All right, let's circle back here tomorrow before noon if you can get away, suggested Hank. I'll figure it out, replied Roger. See you kids tomorrow, he added, as was his usual departure line. After a cold bike ride home, Roger discussed the plan with Martha that evening. He didn't want to, but thought it wise to include her, 
hoping she wouldn't forbid him from participating. She listened intently and never interrupted, waiting until the very end to give her two cents. The sheriff helped me out when I broke my hip, even taking out the man holding me hostage. He's a good man, but likely spread too thin nowadays to get everything handled. Plus, I know the mayor cut his department budget severely. He's had a time just trying to keep the grocery store open and stop people from looting it. They're getting low on food, I bet. Anyway, he probably could use some help, and this needs priority handling if anything does. You tell Hank if anything happens to you, I'm holding him personally responsible, and it's high time he comes over for dinner. I'll tell him just that, dear, Roger replied. Hank was a loner, mostly one of those guys who hadn't quite found the right girl but had dated nearly every eligible one in town at one time or another. An only child, his parents died young in a mountain cliff verse an oncoming semi-accident, leaving him with no family willing to take on another mouth. So finally Martha convinced a reluctant Roger to take the necessary steps to adopt him. Both men would admit it was a trying time in his teenage years. Everyone knows about it when a kid gets into trouble in a small mountain town. The girls loved the bad guy with the Harley Davidson motorcycle at age 16, and his enlisting in the army at age 18 was the only thing keeping him alive, Roger often commented. When Hank returned from Afghanistan, less his eye and some fingers, neither kept him apart from the ladies or off his motorcycle. Roger and Hank grew much closer when he returned from combat a disciplined and humble young man, but it was Martha who adored him from the start and got him out of trouble more than a few times. When Roger laid eyes on his bride-to-be the very first time, he never coveted another. Even eighteen hard months in Vietnam couldn't pull them apart, and when he returned, they picked up like a day hadn't gone by. Years of trying to conceive didn't split them, and when the opportunity came to give a young man a forever family, they rose to the challenge. Chapter 14 Tex and Beth Tex spent the afternoon with his girl, showing her several options and asking her opinion, as if they were ring-shopping at a fancy jewelry store. He didn't care where they ended up, vowing to move every couple of weeks anyway. Beth only half heard what he was saying as she replayed the encounter with the man called Roger over and over in her head. She almost blurted out the truth when he asked her if she was okay. I'm not. You're holding me prisoner, and I'm not the only one, she wanted to say. Roger's eyes caught her attention the kind with layers, the same as her grandfather, who wore a similar ball cap. Her grandfather used to call them life layers, one layer for hardship, and another when something grand happened, quickly followed by another hardship and flip-flopping, however long one may live. How many layers do I have? she asked her grandfather at the tender age of seven. Well, let me see, he replied softly, bending down from his lounge chair and staring deep into her eyes. Now let me see, you are six years old now, right? No, Grandpa, I'm seven. Seven, you say, well, that explains it. Explains what, Grandpa? Your layers. You only have one so far, and it looks like a happy one to me. <coughs> Beth snapped back into focus and didn't know what would happen if she spoke out, but she thought likely it would end up with Tex harming this innocent man who was just out for a midday stroll. And then what? Her trust cover would be slit wide open, watermelon style, and she would have to start again from scratch. No, that wouldn't do. The idea was off the table as quickly as it had arisen. Food and drink weren't the only thing Tex found in most of the homes he toured. These homes belonged to mountain families, even if only a few weeks a year, and mountain folk like fresh air, breathtaking views, and guns. With only a few exceptions, Tex found a few in every home with nearly a third in original packaging, having never been fired. Out-of-towners would buy guns, like city folk would buy preppers' gadgets. Fun to look at, but not a clue how to use the tool properly. Of course, most weapons were paired with boxes of ammunition, with most boxes not missing a single shell. Who needs a sheriff's department when one man has an arsenal that could take on a whole town, he thought. But he would be sheriff one way or another. He usually got what he wanted. It was just the how that changed. Tex got Beth settled into their new home, the one with a log stove in the middle of the living room, and a pile of wood in the shed that could last two winters. Cuffing her to a large brass bed, her fantasies of breaking free, overturning the mattress, and taking apart the massive frame were dashed, 
realizing she couldn't even move the top mattress from its position. Was she weak, the top too heavy, or just tired? Any of which she thought seemed plausible. It was enough for Tex to move in and out of the house confidently, and he hadn't screwed up yet. He made several trips back and forth, taking care to bring every bit of food he could from Trey's uncle's place. After all, it won't do any good to let it burn, he said aloud to himself, walking down the road. An old can of gasoline, two, in fact, roughly five gallons in each, would probably last several seasons, but who cares, he said to no one from the shed. The first splash under Trey's door woke him from a midday slumber, or depression maybe, but the smell was undeniable. Hey, he yelled. Hey, what the hell are you doing? That's gasoline. I know, replied Tex, and it ain't no coincidence that you can take to the bank. My girl and I are moving on down the road, and we don't need you eating up any more of our food, that's a fact. Tex's tone changed from callous to that of a caring mother about to pull a painful splinter from her child's hand as they cried out in fear of the inevitable. Now the best way to get to the other side of this is to breathe in as much smoke as you can right at the start. You don't want to be conscious when the flames get you. Trust me on that. Sorry, I didn't get you anything to eat this morning. It's just been one of those days. Busy, busy. Oh, but I done found a couple more of those gin bottles, and Lord knows I don't drink anything that tastes like pine needles. So here you go, he said, tossing two under the door, now covered in a slick film of gasoline. You don't have to do this, Trey begged. If you let me go, I'll head straight out of town and won't say a word about any of it. You keep the girl, and I'll keep walking until I hit California. I already got the girl, replied Tex. She's warming right up to me. I guess she hasn't had a real man in her life yet, but that's all changing. Yes, it is. It's the truth. It ain't that I got something against you, even though you locked me outside and left me for dead. I've had people do a lot worse to me but I got to stay under the radar if you get my drift, and having you wander around, even headed out of town, is not a good business plan on my end. Can you feel me? I hear you loud and clear, replied Trey, still sobbing but happy to at least have dialogue. What do you want? I've got credit cards when all this is over. They're good as new. I can get my dad to pay you whatever you ask. I can even tell the sheriff this was all just a misunderstanding. Give me a chance, it's all I ask. Well, you do have something for me to ponder. Yes, you do. Give me another ten or so to think on it. Can you do that? I guess, of course. I mean, that's fine with me, he stuttered, a small ray of hope pinpricking his crowded mind. Tex spent the better part of nearly fifteen minutes soaking every floor, corner, nook and cranny, as they say, of the cabin, upstairs and down. Gave it some thought. Yes, I surely did just like I said I would. Man of my word. Ask anyone, said Tex, coming back up to just outside Trey's door. And well, it's like this. The problem is, I don't like loose ends. I never have. If I were just moving along down the road like I used to, maybe we could work out a deal. But I like it here. That's bona fide. And because of that there part on the side, I can't let you walk on out of here. But on the other hand... I do believe in giving every man a chance to decide his own fate, to a point. So here's the deal. I'm going to take the barricade off your door, and when I do, you'll have two minutes to decide if you want to fight me man to man for your life or stay huddled in there and sizzle like bacon. What do you say? Trey mumbled something in between sobs which Tex couldn't understand. Don't matter, no way, he said, taking the boards off the door one by one. Gotta be really careful. Don't want to make any sparks up here, otherwise we will both be breakfast. You're lighter, you're lighter, the voice in Trey's head screamed. The one he always had on him belonged to his dad, and even though he didn't smoke cigarettes, it always felt comfortable in his front pocket. Tex hadn't checked for it, or maybe he did. Trey couldn't be sure, but it was a bargaining tool at the very least. Trey had seen countless movies where the bad guy had to make the decision to die alongside their foe or strike a deal, and both lived to see another day. Trey got hold of himself, finding the lighter. He knew he dare not strike it. It worked last night when he needed to find his shoes in the dark, which would be the last test. The gasoline covered the floor in a thin but menacing layer, like a bomb waiting to be detonated, lying in wait, 
hoping for the go button that would set free its predestined path of destruction. Trey always considered himself a decent negotiator and a less competent fighter. His decision was made before the last board came off. Okay, Trey called out. Open the door and we can do this man to man. May the best one win. The weight was agonizing and sweat poured from Trey's greasy head, void of anything resembling a shower for days on end. His clammy palms and shaking fingers struggled to stop moving. The rest of the room was bone cold, and the contrast between hot to cold was one he had never experienced. Oh no, he said aloud as the old school Zippo lighter slipped from his fingers, clanging onto the floor. You ain't got no knife in there, do you, boy? asked Tex. Mano me mano means just that. No weapons of any kind. Besides, I've already registered my fists as lethal weapons in several states, he added, laughing at his own joke. It don't even matter, really. What's it going to be, city boy? Trey stood shaking, the cold seeping through the boarded-up window, and not dowsing the sweat pouring off his face. This was it, for all the marbles. Three choices, fight, strike a deal, or curl up in the corner and pray for a quick death. Take the boards off, called out Trey, as confident as he could sound. I've got a deal for you. A deal, you say? Well, that's always something I like to hear. Probably won't do you any good, but let's hear it. Hold on a minute, he added, reversing the last screws in the wall. Trey stood in the middle of the room, right hand out to the side, holding his father's lighter when the door swung open. He had seen Tex dozens of times, even looking up from on his back, fighting for a gun. But today it was different. Today Trey was different. Braver, more scared, desperate and fully aware of the consequences if he made the wrong decision. No midterm college test, girlfriend breakup, or the occasional declined credit card transaction when his father thought he was getting reckless could compare to this standoff in front of him. So, you didn't have any knife, I see, said Tex, looking at a scared college boy he hadn't seen in person in a while. Scared the bejesus out of you when I saw you in the window. Remember that? asked Tex, laughing. I mean, talk about a scared bunny. That's you, by the way. I remember, replied Trey, stone-faced and trying to slow his racing mind and concentrate on the moment. All right, so we got a Mexican standoff, is that right? Asked Tex, smiling and winking his left eye. Something like that. I didn't want to fight you, and I'm not going to curl up and die, so this is my get-out-of-jail-free card. Have you ever been in jail? Asked Tex. Of course not, he added, answering his own question. Well... Believe it or not, I have more than a few times, and I'm telling you right as rain, there ain't no get-out-of-jail-free card. It's just break out and run like hell or hunker down and do the time. I've been on both ends of it, and can't say one is better than the other. It's just a matter of physics now. Physics? asked Trey, conceding to keep this crazy man talking and postpone the take-action part. That's right, physics, he said slowly, breaking the word into two drawn-out phrases. For every action you see, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And you thought I was some dumb hick from the South. I ain't. You can take that to the bank and cash it right now. So if I can make it to where you're standing before you get that thing lit, one sock to the chin and you out like the sun, or maybe light is better. Yes, you out like a light. The action I hit you, and the reaction you drop. Or let's say you light that thing right now and drop it to the floor. I hightail it downstairs and out the front door before I get smoked like a brisket. And you? Well, you're in the same boat, but farther back. It's a risk, but I'm your huckleberry. Hucklebearer? It's huckleberry, like a coffin carrier, but don't sweat. It's a common mistake. Blame Hollywood, replied Trey, as if they were negotiating a game of billiards. Like they used to say, continued Tex. If a group of people came upon a hungry bear in the woods, you ain't got to be the fastest, but you for sure don't want to be the slowest. So, city slicker, what's it going to be? Trey looked at his right hand, shaking, and flipped the cap with his thumb as he had done a thousand times before lighting sorority girls' cigarettes and other things college kids often smoke. Then, he flicked the flint wheel with his thumb without a pause, producing a bright orange flame. All right, now time's a wasting said Tex. You going to drop that thing or not? No, I want to negotiate a deal, replied Trey. You walk out of here and I disappear. That's it. Can't stay in this house with gasoline everywhere anyway. Light it up, said Tex. No. What? 
You want me to drop this lighter and get us both killed? Asked Trey, surprised. Yep, you heard me. Do it, college boy. Trey fumbled, dropping the lit bomb, reaching out for it only enough to knock it into the air. With a lightning-fast reach he had been known for back in the day, Tex grabbed it midair, closing the lid with one motion. Woo, he said, dragging it out. That was a close one. Yes, it was. Good luck, he added, walking down the stairs and tossing the newly lit lighter over his right shoulder. Trey watched in horror as his father's prized possession was now the nail in his coffin. Flames shot in all directions, following the gasoline like a child learning to walk may follow his mother, tight and turning directions on a dime. Tex disappeared out the front door, closing it behind him, already feeling the heat on his back from the rising flames. Trey instinctively retreated further into the bedroom with the front half ablaze in seconds. He heard Tex say in his mind, Just breathe deep, and you won't feel the pain. The now open door to the room was a fireball and impassable by any stretch of the imagination. Trey took a deep breath, coughing violently soon after. I have to get out, he called to Tex. Tex, get me out of here, you bastard, Tex, he screamed. The window, said Trey aloud. He thought it was boarded up, courtesy of his captor, but not impenetrable. One kick in the center did nothing. Come on, come on. A second kick from his still healing ankle sent sharp pain and a gasp from his mouth but he thought he heard a crack, not visible as the smoke filled the room. The third kick he hardly felt at all, as the main piece of plywood broke free, hanging by the top corner. One more, he said, pushing with his arms as the cool outside air reached into the room, fanning the flames. Chapter 15 Roger What the— he said, looking down at a man standing next to a bicycle. He is there, Trey called out. Hey, are you real? Yes, I am, and I give you about a minute to jump. I can still get downstairs and out the front, Trey gasped. No, you cannot. I came from that direction, and it's not possible. I've got no rope, no bedsheets to lower down with, said Trey, his voice growing shaky with eyes darting behind and beside him, feeling the intense heat on every naked body part. He had thought to put on his winter jacket at the very start and it seemed the only smart thing he had done all day, keeping the heat from his core. I'm sorry, son, I haven't either, and by the time I got even a start towards home it would be too late. I want you to turn around, hang your legs down, and hold on to the window sill with your hands only, which will take about seven or so feet off the landing. Then it's up to you. Up to me what? To let go. Too many don't get into position quickly enough, and by the time they have to decide, it's too late. If you're already in the right position, the heat or smoke will make your choice easier. And then what are you going to do when I break my neck, old man? Do it my way, and you'll likely break a leg or ankle maybe, but not your neck. You'll live to see another day if that's what you want. I'm here to help you get away from here once you're down. But that don't mean I've got all day, so let's get to it, son. Ah, yelled Trey, as if he had already landed. He hung from the window, and as the old man predicted, Trey's choice was made for him when the window frame caught fire. He instinctively loosened his grip on the last ray of hope, one hand at a time, falling awkwardly towards the hard ground. The crunch was the first sound heard by both men, and screaming followed closely behind. Trey's ankle, not the bad one from before, but this time the other, the perfectly functioning one, buckled at impact, with the sole of his shoe turned ninety degrees outward. Roger waited patiently as the screams echoed off the mountains and eventually quieted. Now's the hard part, said Roger without emotion. Now is the hard part, whined Trey, not able to look at his own ankle. What could be harder than you making me jump out of a two-story window? Getting you home. Nah, I'll just wait, replied Trey, gritting his teeth. The fire department will get me, no doubt, and then maybe I can go home. There ain't no fire department coming out here, son, he said, dragging a screaming tray by his arms twenty feet away from the crumbling structure. Can't have you jump out of a building just to have a wall fall on you, boy. I got a sled at home that might work. Roger, came the call from a hundred yards down the road. Roger, it came again as the figure closed in at a full run. Roger, you okay, he said. Yeah, Hank, we're okay. What are you doing out here? You said Martha wanted me over for supper, 
I just figured tonight would be as good as any. So, what's going on here? Looks like this house is gone. I just wandered by and figured I'd save this young man from burning up. Save me. Save me. If you hadn't come along, my ankle would still be straight, he started to say, catching a glimpse of it twisted grossly to the side and nearly losing his stomach. You're right about that, but a twisted ankle beats cremation any day, in my opinion, voiced Roger. Mine, too, said Hank. So, what's the plan? I guess get him home, replied Roger. Just not quite sure how. He's not walking the mile or so. I'm sure of that. Can you hop on one leg? asked Hank. No, I can't, he replied, not making any move to attempt it. All right. I'm Hank, and this here is Roger, if you haven't already exchanged the necessaries. I'm hungry as a grizzly, so we're getting this done the quick way. Help me get him up, Roger. I'll sling him over my shoulder, and that will be the end of it. No way, argued Trey. There's no way I'm letting you... He continued as the men stood him on his good, still bad leg, and Hank threw the 170-pound tray over his right shoulder. Put me down right now, screamed Trey. Tell me one more time, replied Hank, and when you do, I'm headed off to supper. Your choice. Trey knew better than to speak again, and his protests were replaced with ow, and it hurt so much. Roger had to pedal his bike to keep up with Hank on foot, We'll figure out how to get you over to the hospital in the morning, said Hank, laying him on the downstairs couch. Maybe I can get the sheriff to pick you up in the truck. Wait, we're not going right now, asked a nervous Trey. Not tonight. It'll be dark soon and you know what they say. Nothing good happens after dark, especially now. I'll set it best I can. I had a little training in the field with this sort of thing. I've got some pain meds left over from my hip said Martha. Suppose I can spare a few until morning. Now you guys get him fixed up best you can, and I'll finish dinner. Smells incredible, Mom, said Hank. Hank only called her Mom on occasion and always at random. She would prefer it all the time, but didn't ever push the idea. Best I could do over a wood fire, gentlemen, she said. It may be all canned, but this meal will stick to your ribs, I guarantee it. Beef stroganoff, canned beef, and mushrooms, but... Wait, you did it yourself? interrupted Trey, looking sideways from across the room and finding anything to distract him from whatever Hank was about to do. Oh yes, sweetie. We've been canning all kinds of things for years, well before all of this electricity nonsense. So you expected something to happen, he continued as Hank handed him the first pain pill and a small glass of lukewarm water. Oh no, nothing like that, she said. I suppose other people may have seen the writing on the wall about where we were headed as a country, but Roger and I are just savers by nature. So every time beef would go on sale or something else, usually expensive, we just bought a little extra and canned it. It's not hard once you do it a few times, and the food keeps like new, right in the cellar. Huh? I didn't know about all the canning stuff, said Trey. How much do you have? What? he asked after the long pause, with all eyes on him. Oh, come on now, boys, replied Martha, coming to Trey's rescue. He's just talking, probably trying to take his mind off of what Hank is going to do soon enough. Just in case you've been living under a rock these past few weeks, Trey, we usually don't scratch that itch. What I mean is we never ask someone outside of our immediate family how much of any provision they have. Oh, sorry, said Trey. I haven't been under a rock, but more like house arrest since soon after it all started. In fact, there's a lot I need to tell someone about, the sheriff maybe. After dinner, said Martha, we never discuss anything outside of hopes and dreams at the table. This is going to hurt, but only for a second, said Hank, tractioning Trey's ankle and setting it straighter. The scream startled Martha, something not easy to do. Is he going to be all right? she asked, seeing Trey pass out for nearly thirty seconds. Oh yeah, just his response to the maneuver. It's a lot straighter, though, don't you think? Look straighter to me, chimed in Roger, coming over for a closer look. Nice tennis shoes, too, he added. Like those basketball players wear. Good job, Hank. I think he's going to appreciate it soon. I'll bet those basketball players, football and everyone else, is trading those kinds of shoes right about now for food. I guess this one is not hungry enough yet, Hank replied. What the hell? asked Trey a minute later. That hurt like crazy. I'll bet, 
Hank agreed. It's far better than leaving it alone till tomorrow. Trust me on that. So a thank you is in order, said Roger. Yeah, okay, replied Trey with a snarky tone. Son, I'm not joking. I think you missed the first one, plus he carried you all the way here without one, so I'd say two would be appropriate. All right, thank you, and thank you, said Trey in his I'm so bored voice. Let's try that one more time for all the marbles, said Roger. Sorry, I'm just not used to strangers helping me. Hank, Roger, and Martha, thank you for taking me in and helping me in a time of crisis. You can't imagine the guy who was holding her hostage and had me locked up. He's brutal. What guy? asked Roger, having a good idea. Skinny fella. Has that drifter look and the pretty girl with him? Roger, scolded Martha in a tease. I had to say the pretty one so he would know if it was them. And for the record, there's not a woman in town that holds a candle to you, my dear. Yes, that's them. Her name is Beth, and his Tex, if that's even his real name, probably not, said Trey. He's crazy. Locked both of us up in that house, and he's going to hurt her, I'm sure of it. He's the one that set my uncle's house on fire and made it so I couldn't make it down the stairs. He tried to kill me for no good reason. Where are they now? asked Hank. I don't know. He took her out before, I guess, and stashed her somewhere while he did his dirty work. Okay, let's start at the beginning, said Hank. <laughs> We have about twenty minutes until supper is on, announced Martha. Okay, you have twenty minutes, Trey. Go, said Roger. We got stranded up on the mountain, six of us college students from L.A. Beth and I split off when we got down the mountain and met this guy at the hospital, where I got meds for a sprained ankle. Anyway, we were short on cash. I mean, my credit cards have huge limits, and one I can use to buy anything I want. But with the power out, they of course don't work. So in exchange for staying over at my uncle's place, Tex bought a cart full of groceries with cash. I expected to have him on his way in a few days, being the drifter type anyway, but he got the best of me, some might say. Really, he sucker-punched me. Before I knew it, I was locked, boarded up is more like it, in an upstairs bedroom, and Beth was tied to a bed in another room. She and I could talk some through the walls, but neither of us could get out. You never tried to escape, asked Hank. Even though he had your girlfriend held hostage, didn't fight him or anything. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You were the guy on TV at the Stanley getting his butt kicked. That's him. He's the guy, added Hank excitedly, pointing to Trey as if they had just met. Well, a lot of people say it was a tie, the fight, that is, and she was never really my girlfriend. It's a long story, really, but I did try. I even broke out the window with a chair, but he caught me. And when I couldn't jump out without doing this he added, pointing to his straighter but still twisted ankle. Well, he boarded up the outside, too, locking me in. Did he feed you? asked Hank. Yes, kind of. He would slip some food and water under the door once or twice a day. You never fought back, huh? asked Hank, rubbing his chin. Just let him do that to the both of you. I tried it first, and like I said, got sucker punched for it. All right, boys, give the college student from L.A. a break and let's have some dinner said Martha. My favorite, Ma, said Hank. Thank you, Trey. Oh, yes, thank you, ma'am. It smells great. I'm a little nauseous, though. I'll cover yours and give you a bit for the pain meds to kick in proper, Martha replied. Believe me, I know a thing or two about meds. Recently broke my hip. Darndest thing, but these boys have taken great care of me like we are doing for you. <laughs> yes, ma'am, thank you for everything, all of you, really. I'll be out of here tomorrow, if that's okay. Not so fast, said Roger. You're clearly not safe, hobbling around out there. And you'll need crutches at the very least. Plus, we need to get that guy behind bars. From what I've seen on the flyers and word around town, he's a very bad man. You heard about Beth and me? No, but about the murders out on the highway, replied Roger. Murders? questioned Trey. Yes, one man and a young girl's mom and dad. The sheriff put up flyers all over town about him, and I ran into him and that Beth girl out on the road near your uncle's place. I knew it was him, but couldn't do anything at the time. He's close, though. They both are. I can feel it. I want him dead, said Trey, gaining some armchair confidence. Well, that's not our call, said Roger. Until it is. What does that mean? It means he's the sheriff's responsibility, unless we find him first and he gives us any trouble. Man like that has no business loitering around this town, added Hank. My guess is, once we find him, 
He'll give us trouble, and that will be the end of it. You've got to be really careful with him, said Trey. Real careful. I've done a few tours and cleared square blocks with guys a lot tougher and deadlier than this one. They tried to kill me more than once, Hank added, holding up his hand minus a few fingers. And that was a whole platoon. This is one guy, and I already have him pegged. Daddy didn't love him. Mom ran off with the milkman. Classic story. And that turned him into a psycho, asked Trey. No, probably not. I bet there's a lot more to the story, replied Hank with a mouthful of stroganoff. Manners, said Martha, adding. You about ready for dinner, Trey? Yes, ma'am. I think I'm feeling a little better now. Sorry, Ma, said Hank after finishing his bite. Hell of a meal, though. That's the God's honest truth. Well, then, you should come by more often, son, she replied, getting a sheepish grin, like a four-year-old boy caught with one hand in the cookie jar. Mind if I stay over tonight, Ma? Hank asked. I'd like to get started looking for this guy first thing tomorrow. No. You're always welcome, you know that. Remember what I said about Roger, though. I don't want him anywhere near anything resembling fighting. Neither of us can afford to lose him. And you, son, you're on number three of nine lives, but that don't mean to stop being careful. This guy sounds like a hand grenade about to pop. Roger and I took a vow to make sure you were looked after. And just because you're bigger than both of us, don't mean you're not still our little boy, got that? Yes, ma'am, I do, replied Hank, leaning over to give her a hug and kiss on the top of her head. Trey, you can stay down here on the couch, and I've got a stand-up walker you can borrow for a while. Hank, take your old room and let's all get an early bedtime. Trey woke up several times, crying out initially from the nightmares, followed by the pain meds wearing off. Morning came with him scrambling to find another pain pill. Tex had taken his from the hospital on day two and he hoped Martha would loan him another until he could get to the hospital. He had a $20 bill, the last stuffed into his wallet, and couldn't decide whether to save it for the hospital bill, assuming they were still taking cash, give it to Martha and Roger as a sign of good faith, or stuff it back in and not tell anyone about it. The thought of credit cards that didn't work was ludicrous to him, as he had spent his teenage years running up his father's cards without checking the balance before purchasing until he got his own at age 18, still paid by daddy. Now twenty dollars was all he had to his name until this whole electric thing got sorted out, or he could get home to his family. But that trip, while once seemed possible even probable now, was a ship miles away from a man stranded on the open ocean, with sharks nibbling his toes. You're up early, Trey, commented Martha, as she came slowly downstairs on crutches and wouldn't dare ask anyone for help. Yes, ma'am. And you're getting around well, I see. Ah. Don't have a choice in it. It's just life, don't you know? I guess you're right, said Trey. Well? <laughs> well, what, ma'am? asked Trey. Aren't you going to ask me for another pain pill? I was hoping not to. Even had a dream about it. I had my own bottle overflowing and spilling onto the floor with pills, like an eight-year-old boy with a never-ending cookie jar. That sounds more like a nightmare. Well. Here are a few, but spread them out. It's one every four hours, according to the directions. Yes, ma'am, I will, he replied, as she dropped three into his open hand. The front door opened with Hank slipping in from the cold. I thought only one was up early, Martha said, pointing to Trey. I was just scouting out the area, and I've got an idea of where they may be, with Roger's information of where he saw them, and a few tracks they didn't cover up. He's good, though, that Tex guy, if that's even his real name. Where's Roger? she asked. Haven't seen Pop, replied Hank. Did he go out? I just figured he was with you. He's been sleeping in the guest room for a week or so, so he doesn't wake me up shuffling at night, but he's always up before me. Want me to check around outside? asked Hank. No, it's not necessary. I'm sure he's just out for a walk, and I know he isn't trying to get near that animal of a man by himself. All right. I'll give him twenty but then I have to look. Sure. Now sit down and I'll have breakfast up soon. Hank made breakfast quick and ate twice as fast before slipping out the door to look for Roger. I'll be back soon, he said with a mouthful of egg, one of the few things they could count on food-wise day to day. It was Roger who insisted they always have their own laying hens, not trusting the grocery stores to properly source them. I can't find him, 
said Hank 30 minutes later. Can't see him or track him. It's like he disappeared. Well, that's not like him at all to be gone so long without telling me, said Martha. I hope that man they called Tex didn't somehow meet up with him. Now you've got me worried. I'll find him, Ma. Just give me a minute to get my rifle. I thought you always carried, son. I do. But outside, a pistol isn't going to do long distance. I've got a scope on my rifle that will give me a heads up before walking up unannounced to a random house or another person out wandering about. Be right down, he added, bounding up the stairs. Dad, he called out, now noticing his father's bedroom door was closed. Dad, he repeated. Just making sure you're not still sleeping, he added, knocking on the door. A quiet turn of the knob opened the creaking door. Dad, he said again, looking at the bed and what could be a man or a multitude of decorative pillows his mother always kept around. The shade was pulled, and he fumbled in the dark before bumping into him. Hank pulled out a small flashlight from his cargo pants side pocket. Dad, he said, grabbing for his hand that lay on the side of the bed, ice cold. Oh no, he said quietly, looking into the man's face. Rogers' eyes were half open and helpless. The man who raised him to be tough as nails was no more. Hank wept quietly for the first time that he could ever remember. He had seen his share of tragedy and death on another soil but it somehow didn't compare. Oh, Dad, how am I going to tell her? How am I going to tell her? Trey, he said, coming down the stairs nearly five minutes later. Use this, he added, handing him the walker. And can you step outside for a few minutes? Are you serious? Is it cold out there? I know. I've been out there twice already this morning. Now step outside. Okay replied Trey, using the walker to hop on one leg towards the front door and then just out on the front porch. I'm not going down the stairs, he called out, as Hank closed the front door behind him. One look at his mom said it all when Hank stepped back inside alone. His tear-stained cheeks were something she had seen the first day he came home with them, and not once since. He's here, she said as more of a statement. Yes, Mom, and he's gone. I'm so sorry. What? I mean, how? She asked, burying her face in his chest. Natural, as far as I can tell. The way we all hope to go when it's our time to sleep. Help me up the stairs, she said matter-of-factly. I want to see him. He did as requested and led her into the room, leaving her alone for nearly fifteen minutes. Can I come back in now? Asked Trey, cracking open the front door. It's freezing out here. Yes, called Hank from upstairs, but please stay down there. That's easy. I can't even walk, Trey called back, shuffling in and falling back onto the couch. I'll get a few guys together and give him a proper burial, close to the house so you can visit him, Hank told his mom an hour later. Don't worry. I've got you now. You took care of me when I needed it the most, and now it's my turn. I will not be a burden on you or anyone else, she replied. Just help me get through the next couple of weeks and then check on me every once in a while. I always expected to go first. Did you know I'm eight years older than your dad? Yes, Ma, I know. I robbed the cradle, I guess, she said, half smiling. The kind that says, I'm not happy, but everything will be okay. I guess you did, replied Hank, holding her tight. I guess you did, Ma. I know he was the love of your life, and you were all he talked about down at the coffee shop. Hank walked to town, as previously planned the day before. Today it wasn't just to grab a posse to search for Tex, but also a few pole bearers and enough shovels and pickaxes to dig into the hard Colorado ground. The deed was done by late afternoon, a six-foot deep grave and wide enough to fit his dad who had slimmed down in later years. Either way, a respectable grave, thought Hank, and close enough to the house for his mother to visit gazing out the window, or once she got mobile, heading out back for a talk. The final piece, the headstone, was made of wood and would take Hank another week to complete with non-power tools. The search for the intruder would be put off until the following morning, with each of the six men meeting at Martha's home for breakfast. Chapter 16 New Beginning
Rick Holman got word of Trey at the coffee shop, as everyone in town seemed to be gossiping about the story. He showed up at Martha's the following afternoon and picked up Trey in his golf cart, transporting him to the hospital for evaluation and medical management of his grossly swollen ankle. The doctors opted to keep him there for a few days, worried about the possibility of an infection and having more than a few empty rooms available. I've got killer health insurance and I love Jello, joked Trey to the nurses, oblivious to the fact that they were essentially volunteers now. And I Hank informed his men, the coffee shop bunch, of what they were about to do and asked if anyone wanted to bow out. I'm out, said one, quickly followed by another. It's just, my wife says there is no reason for me to get involved with there still being a sheriff around and all. The second man didn't give an excuse and didn't seem ready to if asked. Okay, that leaves the three of us, right, boys? said Hank. I don't know, replied one. I mean, he has a point. There is a sheriff in town and some deputies as well. I'm not sure it's our business, added the other. Maybe we wait a bit, two, maybe three weeks, and see what happens. What happened to you guys? asked Hank. A couple of days ago you were all gung-ho on getting this lunatic off our mountain, and now you just want to play it safe, drinking coffee all day. No man said a word, with most looking down towards their feet. Okay, if you aren't on board, I'll go it alone. I owe it to my dad, and someone owes it to that girl being held against her will right now as we speak. Enjoy your tea, gentlemen, he said sarcastically, walking out the door. Hank turned abruptly around less than one minute later, poking his head back into the coffee shop. Thanks, guys, for helping me with dad. I forgot to tell you, he added, walking out the door. Hank checked on his mom before heading out. Have a seat, son, she said. I want to talk to you. Not you too, Ma. Everyone has a reason not to go help that girl and keep the rest of us up here safe from a ruthless killer. You're going to try and talk me out of it, is that right? No, Hank. It's not my place to do so. Your dad was on board from the start, and I won't be the one to stop it. How many, son? How many what, Ma? How many men are going with you? Hank paused with a sheepish grin. That's what I thought, she said. Someone probably smarter than the both of us talked some sense into them. Yeah, I guess so, Hank replied. A couple just chickened out, but the others have families counting on them to make it home in one piece. Plus, they don't think it's their battle to fight. It isn't, she replied. And now you're the only thing in this world I care about, son. It was hard enough watching you return home injured, missing parts of your body God gave you. Now I'm not sure how I feel about all this mess. Listen, Mum, someone has to stand up, start something to bring this violence to a close. You saw what he did to Trey. It would have killed him easy if Pops hadn't been there to talk him off the ledge. Who's next? More innocent people, maybe you and me. Everyone says it's a sheriff issue, but it's been going on a while. I mean, the flyers in town are fading and they were even laminated. The whole thing has me up at night. So it's about him, the text guy, and not just the girl? she asked, knowing Hank better than anyone. Yes, Ma, that's what I'm saying. It's about both. Okay, I know you are a soldier, decorated and everything, but today and tomorrow and the next, you are my son, so I have a few rules. Don't be a cowboy going in with guns blazing. You don't have to figure this thing out in one day, and you better come home to me breathing. Are we agreed? Yes, Ma, agreed. In fact, I'll only do intel today. No confrontations or blazing guns, as you say, and I'll stay here for a few days, if that's all right. Of course. Supper is at dusk. Don't be late. Hank, with his rifle strapped to his back, set out thirty minutes later to scout the area. He stayed in the tree line as much as possible, sketching out a map of houses he would observe over the next few days. He knew most places by memory, having run these woods as a teenager but quite a few more summer homes were built while he was away serving his country, and the land lay was different these days. He started with the closest home, thinking Tex would probably not be dumb enough to stay too close to Trey's uncle's house. Stopping by, he could see that it was a total loss, and it burned out on its own without professional help. Only a few burned-out appliances, a clawfoot tub, and three metal gasoline cans were visible from his vantage point. There were other unidentified pieces of metal, twisted and entwined with each other, like a snake pit in an adventure movie. He stopped midday, after the third house appeared vacant, at least from his line of sight and looking from multiple angles through his scope. 
A fourth was occupied by a family he'd known for years. He checked in on them and told them to keep an eye out for a dangerous man in the area. He sat on a log in a clump of trees to keep from losing body heat on the cold, hard ground and opened his lunch. He had to smile as he bit into the peanut butter and homemade wild strawberry jelly his mom always made for him and his dad. Beef jerky, also homemade, and crackers from the grocery store rounded out the lunch, along with his old favorite off-brand cola he grew up with. His mind wandered back to childhood. The tragedy of his parents' accident, butting heads with his father as a know-it-all teenager, for which Hank repeatedly apologized after coming home from war. And now he had a pit in his stomach that seemed to grow every day. After all, he was a single male in his mid-twenties, disabled, according to army records, with no job or purpose. He would have stayed longer overseas if they had let him. But of course it wasn't his choice. What now? Where were his buddies? Still overseas? Were they back stateside? Would there be a recall of every soldier to defend the new United States if there even is such a thing anymore, he thought. Could I re-enlist? Maybe they would reconsider now and re-enlist a soldier who was bad on paper, but could still fight alongside the best of them. The longer he sat, the more depressed he became. What, Lord, he said, looking to the sky. Am I to just hang out down here until the food runs out? What then? Should my friends and neighbors act like this Tex guy, taking for themselves without a care in the world of helping others around them? Why aren't we mobilizing? Why aren't we fighting? He said aloud. I cursed you. Turned on you when my parents died. We both know that it's no secret. Even when you gave me Martha and Roger, I still didn't forgive you. You took half of my sight and fingers you gave me. For what? For nothing is what? Now look at me. I'm some half-mutilated ex-soldier with a future that looks like gold flakes so small it would take fifty years to sift them out of the mud. So I'll make you a deal, an all-or-nothing kind of thing. Here it is. You let me keep my mom and help me rescue the girl and I'll forgive you for my parents and body parts. I think it's fair. And no, I didn't add Roger into it. He was old and lived a good life, so I can't put that one on your shoulders and I won't. So what do you say, God, Jesus, whichever one is listening, give me a sign. I'll wait. Just something that says we have a deal. None, huh? He spoke aloud ten minutes later. That one guy gets the seas parted, and another gets instructions to build some kind of superboat and nothing for me. Maybe you don't do that anymore. Good talk, he concluded. The sun was high in the sky, angling to the west, as if it would fall over the mountains at some point today. A few more hours. Let's get this done, he said to himself looking down at the map he was drawing with a pencil, in case he had to make changes on the fly. He returned home just before dusk, as promised, and spent the evening talking strategy with Martha over a bottle of wine she had saved for a special occasion. "'What's special about this?' asked Hank, knowing full well about the bottle she had preserved from her and Roger's wedding day. "'You are, Hank. You're my special day, and Lord knows we never know how many will come our way. He loves you.' Don't forget that. Chapter 17 Beth Beth settled into her new home, same as the last, with the only difference being the room decor. After all, it wasn't like she had her run of the place. No, only a different duvet, partial window view, just like last time, and a little more heat since Tex burned wood without a care in the world, but only after solid dark and never in the light of day. She wanted to ask about Trey, and something told her she knew. The fire gave off a smell that wasn't logs in a fireplace or wood stove, but different somehow, like a raging forest fire taking entire neighborhoods with it, with a mix of smells that tell you it's not about heat or comfort, but outright demolition that takes years to rebuild, if ever. Tex hadn't mentioned Trey's name in two days, nor had he left the house near as she could tell. The hardest part was that she was getting comfortable. Not in a hay. Great news. We upgraded you to the presidential suite at no additional charge kind of way that one might expect at a fancy hotel. But the kind of comfort that is layered with hope long gone, despair, acceptance, stifled self-worth, and the lack of ability to look into the future and imagine what could be. Trey was her ticket out of town, and she knew it. Of course, the others she started with were probably halfway home to Texas already and she had some regret about the happenings at the cabin. 
She liked Alex well enough, as much as any other guy she dated. Maybe more, but could have switched to Trey and made a go of it. At least until they made it home. Now she was in limbo. Scared to death some moments, lonely others, and utterly void of the fight-or-flight mentality she was well known for in her previous life. What would I do if I got free of Tex, she thought. Then I would truly be on my own. The determination, the fantasy of breaking free, diminished daily, like a plant in desperate need of water. Was she slated to be the housewife of a demented man, only fulfilling household duties when he let her off her chain for an hour at a time? What kind of life is that? she thought. Beth missed her parents and siblings. Why haven't they come for me? They knew I was up here when it happened. Maybe they are, she thought, with a spark like a match jolting her out of her slumber. What if they were here, my dad and brothers, looking for me house to house? Surely they would have heard from Mr. Holman or someone that they had seen us. Her fantasies blurred with reality, and after an hour she couldn't tell the difference. Her family was looking for her. They had gone to every house and given up after an exhaustive search, figuring she had headed back to California. Just like that, her spirit for independence was renewed, crushed, and renewed again. Not 100% or even 70, but a solid 60 and growing, she thought. What kind of life is this? She thought, answering her own question with a resounding, It's no life at all. It's no life at all, she repeated over and over in a whisper at one point nearly yelling it out for all to hear. But she didn't. She was smarter than that, and it wouldn't help her cause, she knew. Tex paced back and forth, mostly downstairs, out of Beth's sight. He was antsy and torn between his next moves. Never wanted to write anything down. He always kept his next steps neatly organized in his brain. He could attribute that to his father, he supposed, but never gave him credit or the satisfaction of hearing it straight out. Still, Tex had an uncanny ability to file future plans away, like pages in the book, complete with paragraph breaks and entire chapters complete and definitive. He only paced when it didn't work, when the thoughts were not lines as in a book, but scattered like a thousand-piece puzzle, where every shape and color looked like the next. Frantically opening drawers, he had already rummaged through, searching for something to write with, finding a pen and small notepad in a drawer closest to where the refrigerator had been. The fridge was dollied out back and hidden in an outdoor shed two days ago when they first moved in. The mold smell took nearly a full day to leave the cabin, and Tex thought maybe it was why his head was clouded. Next. He wrote down his next steps for the first time he could ever remember. Page 1. Finish the job he was paid for. Page 2. Gain Beth's trust, or at least her acceptance. Page 3. Work on becoming sheriff. Page 4. Rule the town. Tex, are you home? Beth called out from upstairs. Yes, babe, he replied, snapping from his vision. You need something? He called up. Water? Something to eat? No, I want to talk. Can we do that? Uh, yeah, okay, I guess. I'll be up in a minute. I think I know what you're going to ask me. Really? What? Well, one of two things, I figure. Either you can't stand it anymore being so close to me in proximity and not physically... Or you want to know why that Trey fella up and left you here when he took off? Am I right? I usually am, he added. Kind of, she replied, being careful to string the right words into the question. I guess we can talk about Trey first, since you brought him up. He left, you say? Yep, that's what I done said. Just up and left when I gave him a choice to come live with us or not. Said he wanted to try and get back home to California and thought you would just slow him down is all. Sorry you had to hear that. I mean, he had a choice, and he made it, plain as day. Now, what about the other thing? I just need some time, Tex. I'm not the kind of girl to jump right into things. I believe in being treated like a queen by the man I'm involved with. I understand, replied Tex. He had done a lot of things in his life, and most of them bad. But taking advantage of a girl in a physical way was not one of them, with one exception recently that he regretted. Maybe he credited his good behavior to his sisters and how they treated him. He didn't know, but it was a line he rarely crossed. Honor among thieves, he would say when asked about it from a smart-ass co-worker or some random guy making small talk at a bar. I understand, Beth, he said again. We can take it slow. I'm not going anywhere. 
Besides, you're the prettiest girl in town, maybe even the whole state, and that's a fact. Thank you, Tex, for understanding. You know I'm not going anywhere either, she tested, with the words flowing from her mouth like a beautiful poem. What I mean is, you don't have to keep me tied up is all. If I ever do start for home, I can't do it alone. You should know that we could go together, you and me, or stay here and start up roots. You're right about one thing, he replied. You would never make it to California, or even partway there by yourself. I do know. I've been drifting for years, and that was before all this blackout nonsense. It's tough out there, especially for someone who looks like you. Why, I bet you'd end up some crazy guy's house slave. Like I am now, she wouldn't dare to say out loud, as obvious as it screamed in her head. All right, tell you what, baby steps, he said. There's some fresh water in the bathroom down the hall. Just swapped it out this afternoon. He had saved her makeup case from the last house and kept it out of view and for a special occasion. Be right back, he said, slipping out the door. Five minutes later, he returned with two more buckets of water from the creek that ran just behind the house. What are you doing, babe? she asked, putting on a playful tone that almost made her gag. I'm showing you my cards, babe, he replied. Give me one more hour, and I'll show you what I mean. Don't worry, it ain't nothing bad. The propane tanks Tex had gathered from several houses were good as gold for cooking on the grill for the long term, he knew. But when it came to practicality, women were his weakness, and he knew it. Spending the next two hours heating water on the grill top in multiple large pots, one after the other, he transferred the hot water to five-gallon buckets and carried them upstairs, two at a time. Close your eyes, my love, he said when he went into her room. It was the last thing she wanted to do, but so far he had been a gentleman with her, at least for a diabolical madman. Close your eyes, he said again. It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you or nothing like that. Okay, she replied, and did as asked. No peeking, he added, taking her chain off her wrist and slowly lowering it to the floor. A flood of emotions went through her physically, wanting to kick him in the groin and make a run down the stairs and out the front door, screaming the entire way down the road. But she didn't. Something told her to wait. It's not the right time. She heard her own voice in her head. Not yet, and certainly not without a well-thought-out plan. After all, you only get one shot at it. What? she said playfully, as he carefully walked her down the hall, holding her hand in his fingers, interlaced like a boyfriend and not a captor. Wait, just a little farther, he said. Okay, he giggled, like they were on a first date or third. I'm going to slowly turn you around, and then you can open your eyes on the count of three. One, he said slowly turning her towards a light source. Two. Three. She opened her eyes and gasped. What is this? she asked, looking into the steamy bubble bath with one lit candle in each corner. Oh, no! I meant it when I said I need to take things slow. So did I, when I told you I was okay with it, replied Tex. Now the water is not piping hot, but it's not cold either. I'm going to cook us a nice dinner and you take your time and come on downstairs whenever you're ready. Just give me a holler maybe ten or fifteen minutes before so I can make sure everything is hot. Are those rose petals? she asked, pointing to the red petal shapes on the floor and flooring in the bath. And wine? pointing to the glass of white, three-fourths full. Well, about those, they are, but they're not real. I got them off a fake flower I found a few houses ago and saved them for you. The wine is good, I think, has a fancy name at least and says it's from Italy. I've been to Italy, you know. I didn't know that, Tex. Yeah, Italy, Texas, he said, laughing. It's a real place, I guarantee it, and I've been there. Hopefully this wine is from the other one, he snorted. Plus, I've been looking for one of these, he added, pointing to the form-fitting black dress hung on the back of the bathroom door next to her makeup bag, which she thought was gone forever days ago. My makeup bag? You found it? Yep, and this here dress I think will fit you nicely. Found some of your other things. Undergarments. I done washed them. Hope that's okay. I didn't look at them or nothing like that. Oh, I know. And thank you. That's sweet. Oh, and there's soap and shampoo. Some kind of conditioner, I think. Well, I'll leave you to it, darling, he said, quickly kissing her on the top of the forehead and closing the door behind him. 
She instinctively locked the door before thinking, and he heard the unmistakable click as he walked down the hall. Girls, you know how they act when they get excited about a date. They get all shy, he said quietly. Beth was stunned, literally floored, and felt her knees buckle. She tried to find the clue, the key to the situation that would fit the narrative. After all, the man who had kept her tied up, probably burned Trey up in a fire, and who knows what else before that, was acting like a complete gentleman, even nicer than most boyfriends she'd had. It just doesn't make sense, she thought. Maybe he poisoned the water somehow or put acid in it. Her imagination ran wild. Putting that aside for now, she slipped into the warmish bath like a queen from the 1700s, melting into the bubbles and feeling the best she had since leaving California. She thought about Trey but didn't shed a tear. After all, she didn't know him that well in the first place. She may have shed a tear for Alex and, of course, her parents and siblings, but that's about it. I'm sorry, Trey, about what happened to you. I know you aren't headed home now or ever, she whispered. She soaked for an hour, maybe more, without a clock or an outside window to gauge the light. She couldn't be sure. Another thirty minutes to do her makeup, the fastest she had ever done it since she first started at age fourteen. She called downstairs. I'll be down in fifteen. Sounds good, babe, he called back up. <laughs> Beth almost didn't drink the wine and thought about pouring it down the sink. She didn't have a great track record with alcohol and had regretted her actions several times before while under the influence. Always appreciate something nice that came from halfway across the world, her grandfather always told her. Probably from the Victory Garden days of World War II, her mom would always say. It's all the way from Italy and not the Texas one, she said aloud, taking her first sip. I still got it. Not bad for missing a hairdryer and curling iron, she said pouting her lips in the mirror. The last time she had been made up like this was the fancy dinner at the Stanley with Alex, and of course Shannon. She couldn't soon forget. I bet I look prettier than you tonight, Shannon. In fact, I'm sure of it, she said with a smile. Suck it, Alex, she added, checking out her rear, filling out the tight-fitting dress that she may have bought off a sales rack before the day. Be down in five, she called out. Take your time he replied, imagining what she would look like made up and in the skin-tight dress. I've got all the time in the world for you, he called up. Whoa, he said as she walked down the stairs, the same as prom night only a few years and another world ago. Whoa, is good? she asked. Whoa is whoa, yes, it's better than good. You look beautiful like a flower. That's a fact, he stated, grinning as he could never remember before. You don't look too bad yourself, she replied, seeing him in khaki pants, brown loafers, and a polo shirt, all of which she was quite sure he never owned. I don't smell bad either, had to bathe in the creek, but it was worth it, I'll tell you that. So, she asked halfway down the stairs, so, what, my beautiful darling? So, she drug out. Do we have more wine, she asked, holding out her empty glass and not even forcing a flirty smile. It was, after all, her go-to look when she wanted something, and even when she didn't. That, we do, and already poured, he replied, taking her hand as she reached the bottom of the stairs and gently showing her to her seat. The tablecloth, the candles, and the setting. It's all perfect, she said, still processing the fact that a man she despised had set the perfect mood for a romantic dinner. I've been planning a dinner with you for a while, he admitted, and kept my eyes open for all the right things. You know, the fancy ones you see on the Eaton table at the palace at Buckingham. You know, the one over in England where that Lady King lives. Yes, I know the one, she said, smiling, and this time not faking or forcing it to the surface. I used to watch that party on TV with my mother when I was a girl. <laughs> You're still a girl, Beth, and right pretty to boot. Thank you. I just meant that when I was young we would watch fancy dinner parties on TV. I miss them, you know. Who? Your mom? All of them. Do you ever miss your family, Tex? My sisters some, I guess. They were always nice to me. Do you want to see them again? Maybe. I haven't really thought about it, I guess. What about your mom and dad? She asked, immediately regretting her question, as his face contorted into something animal-like. They are dead to me, the both of them, he spat out. Don't ever ask about them again, understand? He said, grabbing her wrist. Oh, I'm sorry 
he said quickly, letting go and seeing the fear in her eyes. I'm sorry, Beth, he said again, lightly touching her wrist with a red ring now visible. I just don't like to talk about them because it brings up bad memories of my childhood. Oh, he added, as if it never happened. I want to show you something. What? she replied, with her wrist aching but not showing it. These were my two best friends in the world. Don't laugh now. They saved my life, and that's a fact, bona fide. He raised his sleeve to reveal the caricatures of Mimi and Stanley. Are those mice? she asked, only covering her disgust at anything rodent in the last second, before it showed. Rats, he said, but not the kind that run through a restaurant kitchen, scaring everyone. No. These are, well, were pets, I guess, like a dog or a cat. They kept me alive when I lost all hope, and so I had them tattooed on my arm forever. Hey, maybe there's a tattoo artist in town that could put you on my back. Me? Yes, you. Perfect in that dress and looking just like you do right now. Maybe we could go into town tomorrow, she floated the idea like a storm cloud on a sunny day. We could find one, I'm sure. And maybe I'll get one, too, she added. One of me? Maybe. Would you like that? Hmm he said, pausing for a moment, holding his wine glass up to his face. Yeah, I guess without the scar, though. I hate that thing. By the way, Tex is just a nickname, but I'll save that conversation for another time. Chapter 18 Homemaker Tex had Beth sit and not lift a finger as he served her a spiced-up canned and jarred meal he hoped she would love. We have spaghetti with tomato sauce, canned but still beef, and pan-seared black olives, putting one piping hot plate before each of them. No paper plates tonight for my girl, and I'll even do the dishes. I don't mind helping, she said. I know, that's why I want you to relax. Listen to the crackling fire and not have a care in the world tonight. And tomorrow, she asked. What about it? Do we get to do this? I mean me having freedom around the house. Ease into it, he said, smiling that crooked smile. We'll ease into it, he repeated, putting up his wine glass for a toast, nodding his head when she raised hers and clinked the glasses. They shared nearly three bottles of wine over the next few hours. Beth was a lightweight, and so was Tex. Maybe it was his 145-pound frame, or maybe it was just dumb luck. He had only been called out on it by two men ever, and neither did it a second time. Beth and Tex talked about things any normal people on a first or second date would before the day. Favorite movies and songs were a topic, and Tex impressed her with his knowledge of both, easily able to recall almost any song or movie with just a few words of a script, line, or lyrics. How do you do that? asked Beth, after realizing there was no sleight of hand or blind guessing. It's easy, replied. I see things once or hear something, and I just remember it is all, like it's catalogued in my brain or something. I don't know why. Just always been like that. Okay, I'll bet I can stump you, she said. Ready for the topic, genius? Shoot. Here it is, she started, appearing completely relaxed and comfortable, as if she were talking with close friends she had known for years. The topic, drum roll, please, tapping her fingers on the table. Wait for it, wait for it, she teased. Okay, the topic is celebrity families that have made a reality show and at least one kid has gone on to do better than their parents financially. With a twist, I like it. Now you're talking my language, he said, answering every question she gave him, with accuracy and speed. It's getting late, he said a few hours later. So, you have to be somewhere early, she asked, smiling. I was just going to say you can sleep upstairs, no restraints or anything like that tonight, and I'll sleep down here on the couch. That's it? she asked. That's all you're going to say? I think so, he said, unsure. So you're going to let this go to waste? Just have me walk up the stairs alone, she said, standing and pointing to herself. I haven't looked this good in quite a while. Oh, well, I wasn't trying to make you do anything you didn't want to, he replied, fumbling for words, maybe for the first time in his life. I do, so shut up and kiss me before I walk up the stairs without you. Beth woke up with a pounding headache, looking down at her wrist where the shackle had been for days on end. The imprint was still visible, but the cuff was off. 
Her bloodshot eyes squinted at the light coming through the window, and she slowly took stock of her surroundings. Tex's boots were on the floor, next to her shoes from last night. Her dress lay neatly hung on the dresser's top, along with her undergarments. No, she whispered, slowly pulling up the covers and discovering she hadn't a stitch of clothing on. No, 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 she said louder, looking over at the second pillow next to hers. What's that, babe? Tex called from downstairs. Uh, oh, nothing. I just can't find my socks, is all, she replied, before realizing it sounded ridiculous since she had not worn any last night. Now, I don't know about them, but the rest of your clothes are on the dresser. You can't just leave those nice things scattered on the floor. They'll get ruined. Breakfast will be ready in about ten. I'll bring you up some coffee, he added, starting up the creaking stairs. Uh, that's all right. I can get some when I come down, she replied, as he walked through the door with a steaming cup. It's no problem at all, babe, he said, as she pulled the covers tightly around her. You don't have to be shy with me, he said, setting her cup on the bedside table where she could reach it. You weren't shy last night, that's a fact. I'll see you downstairs in a few, he added, leaning over and kissing her on the forehead. Don't want that dress getting wrinkled. I'd like to see it on you again tonight. He walked out of the room, softly closing the door. I found something, announced Tex after breakfast, in the basement of all places. What's that? asked Beth. Something good? No, something medieval. Whoever owned this house before had some serious issues. I think they were torturing people or something. Why would you say that? Well, I'd been down there a few times when we first got here, but this morning I found a secret door. I guess you would call it that. Goes into a whole other room about the size of the kitchen. And, she asked, more intrigued than she should be, given her present circumstance. I don't think you want to hear it. It's messed up for sure. Plus, I don't want to scare you. Too late for that, she thought, but wouldn't dare voice aloud. Now I'm curious. Okay, have you ever heard of an oubliette? he asked. A oubli what? she asked. An oubliette, he said slowly. Starts with a no, I think. No, what is it? A mid-century torture chamber where they put someone into a hole about six feet deep and just wide enough to fit into, arms crossed. Then what? she asked. Then that's it. They put a metal grate with slats so they can see down in there and leave them. That's horrible. How long are they down there? Forever, he replied. Or until they take the body out. The torture part is that they can't even sit down. No room for it. They have to stand up and eventually their legs give out. But there's nowhere to fall. Is that what your daddy did to you? She asked, looking straight into his eyes. No, no, no. Worse, and I don't want to talk about it. You got that straight? He said, abruptly standing and raising his voice. Yes, yeah, sorry. I just thought we were getting along better, sharing things. Not that, he said. So what should we do today? He said, shifting on a dime a twisted mouth turned smile. It's a little early for wine, but I found some board games in the study. Got some real classics, unless you're more of a poker girl. Tex is hold'em, Tex, unless that's not your game. You have no idea, darling. I've got some things to take care of in the next few days, but after last night I cleared my schedule for today. I didn't know you had a schedule, she replied. I do. In fact, I'm busier now than I ever was before the lights went out. I've got big plans for the both of us. Chapter 19 13 Going on 30 Jenny rode all the way home without stopping. She screamed to the trees some of the way and fell silent the rest. Her blood boiled under her winter coat, and the cool mountain air felt like a roll in the snow after jumping out of a hot tub. Curling up with Mama and locking the door to her room, she made a plan. Jenny had plans, and ever since she could remember, they fit neatly into brain categories. Now plans this week, this month, this year, and then the next, all the way out to her retirement days and subsequent death, should she live that long, of course. She used to tell her friends at school about it, and was surprised when she realized nobody else was doing it. There came a point when her mother sat her down and said she was getting a few calls from other parents about her macabre prophecies. Just because I think differently from the rest of them doesn't make me wrong. Odd girl out, maybe, but not wrong, she told her mother. Still, 
Jenny had many acquaintances, not that she had seen any lately. Jenny was a book reader. Anything, including the dictionary, would do, and the adult words would not have to be looked up or asked into a smartphone for a computer to define. She knew the word macabre and understood why friends her age might think it was strange, maybe even creepy. Okay, Mom, I promise not to tell my plans to anyone at school, even though they are falling behind on their own life goals. She missed her mom and dad, but her mom mostly. She was Jenny's rock, the one person who she could tell anything and not get the weirded out face that many of her friends gave her. It was probably the reason she didn't have many friends. She confided in her mom one day. It's just that none of them are as odd as me. You're not odd, honey, or strange. You are Jenny McAllister. That's it. Just because you have your life planned out doesn't mean things won't change. Life has a way of throwing us curveballs when we least expect it, she remembered her mom saying, as she held Mama and cried into her pillow so no one else would hear. Jenny, Jenny, are you in there? came the voice, following a soft knock at the bedroom door. It's Shannon and Joe. We wanted to check on you. We see your bike is back. Are you in there? I'm here, she said softly. I just need a little time to myself. Oh, sure, replied Shannon, leaving it at that. Jenny sunk back into her deepest thoughts, with a movie running through her mind of her parents, the holidays, Christmas mostly, and vacations to beach places. It was a good life we had, Mama, she said aloud. We had a good life, and then this, all of this at once. It's too much, Mama. What are we going to do? Everything I planned is different now, and it won't be long before I don't have you either. Mama laid her head in Jenny's lap, as if to say, I miss our old life too. Okay, girl, you've got this, said Jenny aloud, jumping off the bed and looking in the mirror. We can do this, Mama. Let's go get him. Seconds later, she swung open the door, announcing, I'm back. Let's get a plan for the day. Time is a-wasting. Where are Alexander in Scotland? On the upper deck, replied Joe. All right, boys, Jenny called out the partially open door. We've still got a few hours of daylight. Let's get some things done. After all, the election is only a couple of weeks out. They headed to town, borrowing the Holman cart after a battery change to a fully charged spare. Let's just hit the major hangouts, boys, and... Wait a minute, Alex. Turn up there to the left, she shouted from the back. Where? I asked. Up ahead, not this one, but the one next to Safeway. What is this? Scott asked aloud. Beats me, I shrugged, as the large crowd of maybe 80 to 120 people stood outside the store. It doesn't matter, said Jenny excitedly. I don't care if they're here to string up the mayor, trade old war stories, or swap recipes. All I know is that there are a lot of voters in one place, so get your game faces on, boys. We're gonna clean up, do a good job, and we'll quit early today. You heard the lady, whispered Scott. Make nice nice with the voters, Alex, and you'll get a little time off. Uh-huh, uh -huh, I replied. She's your boss, too. I don't know how, but I guess you're right, he replied, shaking his head back and forth. Hello, everyone, said Jenny. Please. Can I get everyone's attention for a few minutes? Those in the back come close. You're going to want to hear this. Come on in, folks. We're not going to bite. Not hard, at least, she added, not getting a laugh. Tough crowd, Jenny added, as if she were working the room at the comedy house. Come on in and let the kiddos up front. How's everyone doing today? Not good, replied one woman. Yeah, that's why we're here, said a man towards the middle. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but maybe we can brighten your day just a little. She continued, uh, she doesn't even know why they're out here, and they look mad, I whispered to Scott. They're in front of an empty grocery store, and yet, Scott replied, she's still campaigning. I vote her for mayor. This is Alexander Cade and Scotland the Third. They are running for mayor and deputy mayor, respectively. She went through her speech about the vision for the town, and how it takes someone tough enough to get their hands dirty. Same old speech, but the biggest audience I'd seen so far. Each time, she did it like it was the first time, the way a great band might play their biggest hit song for the 400th time over the past 40 years and give it the all-in effort. Do you have any questions? She asked this most disinterested audience. Twenty or more people started talking at once. Please, she shouted over them. Please, one at a time and raise your hand. Scott and I were both amazed watching her handle this large group of strangers like a kindergarten teacher on the first day of school. 
You, ma'am, in the black jacket, said Jenny. Please come on up so everyone can hear your question. Sir, when is the Safeway going to open back up? We're almost out of food. That's a tough one, said Jenny. I don't have the answer at this very moment, but I will find out. You, the man in the denim jacket, what's your question? The same, except we're already out of food. Oh my gosh, I said to Scott, as nearly fifty more people raised their hands. Is there anyone here that has a question not about the store or food? If so, keep your hand up. All hands went down, save one. Oh, said Jenny, realizing they were all there to see when the grocery store would be serving life-sustaining supplies again, and for no other reason. Psst! If you're enjoying this audiobook, can you do us a favor and subscribe? It's the best way for us to bring you many more free audiobooks. Now, back to the story. Chapter 20 Ella Yes, little girl, you can come up front and bring your parents, she added. Don't have any, she said once she got up front. Me neither, Jenny whispered. So what's your question, she asked, kneeling down to be face to face with the girl of no more than five, with pigtails tied with dirty pink bows and knotted hair that appeared to not have been brushed in quite some time. Can somebody help my grandma? Of course, sweetie, Jenny responded, and the crowd began talking out of turn. What's wrong with her? She didn't wake up. Are you sure she didn't just sleep in today? Sometimes older people need more rest. She didn't wake up on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or today, she said, tears now filling her eyes. I saw all these people walking by my house this morning, and I thought maybe someone could help her get better. I asked, where are your other family? Overhearing the conversation once I kneeled down amidst the growing crowd of discontent and empty bellies. It's just my grandma and me ever since I can remember. What are you going to do about the store, Mr. Future Mayor and Deputy Mayor? That's what I want to know, yelled a man pushing his way to the front of the line. Yeah, he's right, shouted another. A slew of affirmative behavior followed, with a few men shoving each other to get up front to yell at Scott and me. This is getting out of control, I said, loud enough for Scott and Jenny to hear me. Put that behind your back subtly, I told Scott. What, this? he asked, as he held up the can of cola, half drunk. Too late, I said, as the questions fired up again. Hey, Scotland, nice soda you got there, said one. I don't have one, do you? he asked sarcastically, turning towards another man. Does anyone here have a soda? Please, I called out, holding my hands in the air. Please, everyone stay calm. I have something to say, I yelled several times, finally getting most of them to stop and listen. I understand you're frustrated about the food situation. If you do me one favor and all go home tonight, but meet back here tomorrow at this time, I will do my very best to have an answer for you. And what if you don't show up? asked a snub-nosed man with wire-rimmed glasses. Then I won't expect any of your votes. Come election time. Is that fair? A few shouted, no, but most nodded their heads. Until then, if you have any extra food, please share it with someone if you can. Especially sodas, the same man yelled back. Let's go, I told Scott. You drive. What did you say your name was? Jenny asked the little girl. I didn't, but my name is Ella. Well, Elizabeth, really, but my Grammy calls me Ella, and I like it better anyway. Okay, Ella, I'm Jenny. This guy's Alex, and this is Scott. Do you know your way back home? Of course. I may only be five, but I know things. Okay, I said, nodding to Jenny, who got the reference and smiled slightly. Ella, tell Scott where to drive. Her house wasn't more than a quarter mile, and our fifteen miles per hour couldn't shake many in the crowd. Why are they following us? asked Scott. One of two reasons, I said. Either they all live this way, or they heard about Grandma. I whispered to Scott, and they think there's a food payday, first come, first serve style. When we get there, we'll have the jump on all, well, most of them, I added, looking back and seeing maybe ten on bicycles. I don't want a hundred people trashing this girl's home like some crazed zombie movie. What do we do? asked Scott. I'll go in with Jenny and Ella and lock the doors front and back. You stand up front with your rifle pointed in the air, and I'll take my rifle inside. Can't we both stay outside and have Jenny check on it? 
No, we can't, I whispered. She seems all grown up around us, but she's not. She's a young girl and doesn't need to determine the status of a likely deceased woman. These are good people following us. They're just in a bad spot. I don't think you will have any trouble, and if you do, fire two shots into the air and I'll come right out. Two shots, he asked. Yes, one shot you may have to fire just to show the crowd you won't be run over. But two shots, that's when we need to figure out another plan together. Park the card in front of the front door, as close as you can get it the long way. I'll be out as soon as I can. The smell hit me as soon as I cracked the door. Sweet, putrid, thick, and the kind of smell that sticks in your nostrils and takes root in your clothing. So much so, that it can never be washed out. I stepped back out as soon as I walked in. I need something over my mouth, I said, pulling a glove from my jacket and putting it to my face. Leave the door wide open, I told Scott. They likely won't come anywhere near it, no matter how desperate they may be. Stay here, too, I told Jenny and Ella, changing the original plan on a dime. I shone my flashlight into the dim home, curtains shut tight, and ran through the small house in minutes. Grandma wasn't hard to find in her bed, with no vitals check needed. I scoured the room for anything of value, feeling like a thief as I emptied a drawer full of jewelry into an extra pillowcase, adding in an antique snow globe that would probably have sold for a tidy sum in one of those traveling auction shows and a few other small odds and ends that would fit before heading to the kids' room. I quickly grabbed two stuffed animals and anything I thought a little girl might want to keep, including some clothes and shoes. The kitchen was last as I flung open each cupboard and the pantry door to find more than one share of canned goods, all neatly stacked with good until dates marked above each row in heavy black marker on a 5x7 note card taped to the wall. Green beans, Italian green beans, whole, cut, stem on, corn, sweet corn, creamed corn, yellow and white were all separated and labeled clearly. I took five additional agonizing minutes as the smell, even after I closed Grandma's bedroom door, stung my eyes and took any appetite away for God knows how long. But I stayed and did the math, writing it down in marker on the back of a card. My only question, was it enough? It would be dark in another one to two hours, and I could hear the crowd yelling outside. Crack! I heard near the front door. Half of my brain stirred to move faster while the other half waited for a second shot that didn't come. I emerged a minute later to both Jenny and Ella squatting down behind Scott, hands over their ears. See, that's why only one shot, I said to Scott. Yeah, it worked. They were getting too close for comfort. Hopefully none of them fire at us. This is a mountain town. I'm sure most are armed. Okay, I think I have a solution. At least for today, I said to Scott and Jenny, before waving my arms for the crowd to be quiet. Ella, you are coming home with us. I announced without elaborating. Please, everyone, quiet down for a minute. I have some important news I think you will want to hear. The crowd quieted down after another minute, when several of them urged the others to do so. Okay, can everyone hear me in the back? I called out, getting some hollers and mostly nods in the affirmative. According to my rough calculations, there's enough food in this house to distribute something to everyone here, which means everyone will have something to eat tonight. Immediately the crowd closed in like a mosh pit at a heavy metal concert. Back up, back up, I yelled as they moved in closer. Kids are going to get trampled, I said to Scott. Cover your ears, girls, I shouted as I fired a round into the air, stopping most in their tracks. This is how people kids get trampled, I yelled. This will not be a free-for-all food grab, but an orderly food distribution so everyone gets some. I surprised myself. Just a party in college kid a month ago and now laying down the law about the most precious commodity left in the world, besides the children. Or what? asked a man who had shoved his way to the front, through women and children. Or what? he said again, pushing his chest out. Or you can come through us both right now, I said, getting a look out of Scott and telling Jenny to move Ella off the front porch and to the side of the crowd. You can't stop us all, said another man the slogan clearly taken from a B-list Western DVD on sale in a big-box store bargain bin before the day. Another man, who could have easily been his brother, also made his way to the front in the same careless manner. You're right, I replied. We couldn't stop everyone, but we can stop you too. 
I feel that once we do, everyone else will behave better than you both. In fact, I can almost guarantee it. You see, these fine people here aren't bad or even unpleasant. Why, they're just hungry as all and scared about now and tomorrow. My speech was getting more nods and agreement than I had even hoped for at best. I continued, So if we all act like the good, civilized people I know we are, then everyone wins and nobody goes to sleep tonight with an empty stomach. Well then, I'm first, said the original man, stirring trouble. And he's second since we're first in line. It's only fair. Sure, I replied. After the women and children, of course. Then the elderly men, and of course any veterans, would be ahead of you, too. And most other decent men would have an argument as well. We are veterans. Both of us, said the other. No, you're not, I replied. You see, you've been given respect and chose not to return it. That's how I know. But I'll tell you what, I'll put my money where my mouth is. Let's see what they think. Okay, everyone, these two men who push their way through women and children alike to reach the front of the line would like to have the first choice of food. I believe everything should be divided equally among every person here. Raise your hand if you agree with... Wait, what are your names, gentlemen? I asked, intentionally pausing. No answer, huh? I said, pushing the envelope as they glared at me red-faced. Okay, let's just refer to them as dumb and dumber, shall we? Are you trying to get into another fight? asked Scott, squaring his stance. Hold on one second, I said, holding a finger high in the air. I'll back you up if you are. I would just like some warning, replied Scott. No, man, they just piss me off. I'll be nicer. So okay, if you fine folks agree with these gentlemen, raise your hand, I shouted. All right, I added, with the only two raised hands being those two men. Now, if you agree to let me be in charge of making sure everyone gets to eat tonight, raise your hand. It's unanimous, nearly, I said, as people looked around, all with hands in the air. There's a bonus, I added, finding the man in the crowd that punked Scott about his cola. There are enough canned sodas for each woman and child, and probably some leftover for men. Here they come. The questions, I mean, said Scott as nearly half the crowd raised their hands one by one. Okay, a few questions first, I conceded. You, sir, in the second row, in front of all those kids for some reason. Go. Don't give me no beans, they give me gas. This started up a few others and got giggles from the kids, including Ella, who apparently didn't realize we were auctioning off her and her grandmother's food and why. I like them little oatmeal cookies, the ones in the individual packets, shouted another man, followed by another. I'll take all the beer you got. The crowd started arguing amongst themselves and pushing forward again. Should I shoot another round in the air? asked Scott. No, came a familiar voice. I'll handle it, said Jenny, stepping up onto the front porch. Everybody quiet down now, she said, as only a few could hear. I said quiet, she screamed, before blowing the high-pitched whistle neither Scott nor I had seen around her neck, tucked under her jacket. The whistle was legit, the kind that has dogs and humans crinkling their faces hundreds of yards away. It worked, and everyone stopped talking and turned their attention toward her. I need ten volunteers, she said with no one raising their hands. I need ten volunteers, women only, or we're done here, and you can all go home right now. That's better, she added, not answering the few that asked for what. Okay, I count fourteen, I'll take you all. Please stand over here on this side and bring your kids if they're with you. All right, the rest of you hang out outside or go home. I don't care, but dinner will be served in ninety minutes. Everyone gets a fair plate, and if beans make you fart, feed them to the dogs she said, giving a smirking Scott and me a wink, as a few dogs darted among the people, looking as skinny as any person. I don't have a watch or a clock, said one man. Scott here will fire one shot into the air when it's dinner time, I announced. Single file lines, only one on each side of the table that will set up outside, and women and children come through first. Any shenanigans and I'll cut you off guaranteed, I concluded. I can handle a rifle good as you two, maybe better, said Jenny. Now hand me one. And you boys bring everything you can find, food and drink, out to the porch. Nobody's going to want to eat inside with that god-awful S.M. She paused, not finishing her sentence, as little Ella pulled on her jacket. Is my grandma going to get better? She's really sick, I know. I'm sorry, Ella. She's gone to heaven, said Jenny. Same as mine. Will you help me feed everyone? Yes, ma'am, she said, wiping a tear from her eye. It's Jenny to you. Okay, Ella. Okay, Jenny, 
I'm really hungry, too. What's your favorite, Ella? I asked, as Scott and I prepared to go back in. Sweets, I love sweets, she replied. I'll see what I can find. Does your grandma have a barbecue? In the backyard, yes, but I'm not supposed to get too close on account of the gasoline. Propane, I whispered to Scott. Hopefully there's enough left. That's good advice, Ella. You're a smart girl. I'll start getting the food out. Can you check out back and see if we can cook on the BBQ? I asked Scott. Sure thing, he replied, disappearing around the back of the house. Chapter 21 Takers Hey, get away from there. I heard Scott's unmistakable voice from the other side of the house. I grabbed my rifle propped up just inside the front door, telling everyone to stay put. I wanted to tell my friend I was on my way, but the element of surprise also had its advantage, having no idea what I was coming up on. Hey, called Scott again. I told you to get away from the... No. I couldn't hear what was said after, but the scuffle was obvious. I turned the corner to see two men encircling Scott, one holding a large kitchen knife. Round and round they walked as I approached. You guys again. Why am I not surprised? I said. I had my eye on the knife, and I was sure Scott did as well. Never bring a knife to a gunfight, said Scott. Didn't they ever teach you that, fellas? You know you could have just walked away and come back for supper. Not now, though. No soup for you, he said in his best soup Nazi accent. I, the consummate joker, was stone-cold sober watching my best friend in the world heckled two large men, one with a deadly weapon, intent on nefarious acts, no doubt. I caught these boys trying to break into Grandma's house through the back door. This was after we were so generous to offer them a cooked meal. No dishes, no reservations, not even a tip expected. And this is how they repay us, said Scott, eyeing me in his peripheral. Keep walking, said one man to the other. Right in the circle. The kid with the rifle won't shoot as long as his friend is in the middle. Listen, guys, we've got at least a hundred mouths expecting filling in a little over an hour, and I don't want to shoot anyone today. So, tell you what. You put down the knife. I'll grab a couple of cans of something. I think I saw some ravioli that you can take home. And we'll call it a day, I suggested. Besides, another few minutes of this and you'll be dizzy, that's for sure. Plus, the guy you're encircling might as well be a Black Panther, because if you corner him with a knife in your hand, you'll end up on the losing end of the deal. I can promise that. Hey, Alex, said Scott with complete confidence in an almost bored tone. Check on that propane, will you? I don't want to be late serving these fine people up front, and I'd hate to serve cold food. You want me to check it right now? I asked. Yeah, let me know where we stand, and then we'll take the trash out. I think he's talking about us, Bobby, said the one without the knife in a nervous, crackling voice. Of course he is, you idiot. Bobby replied. It's just talking, though. We've got him. Two to one. Two tanks, I called out, checking under the BBQ cover. One full and the other maybe two-thirds full, I estimated, shaking it. I think we're good for the whole lot of them, I added, never turning my back to the men, but surprised when Scott made his move. He went straight for the man with the knife. Bobby barely had time to react, and before he could lift his right hand with the blade, Scott hit him hard mid-chest driving him back into a retaining wall on the side of the house. Scott spun him around, not reaching for the knife, and shoved him hard. Bobby tripped over his own boots, never letting go of the blade as it plunged deep into his chest with a crunch of a rib bone. He took in a deep breath, wheezing before rolling over onto his back. There was a gurgling sound as he tried to speak and drew his last breath. His companion took off running without a word. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that, I uttered in all seriousness. I felt sick to my stomach. I mean, who wants to see someone die up close, even a jerk like Bobby? Me neither, admitted Scott, shaking his head slowly. That's not what I meant to happen, you know. I just wanted them to take off down the road. I know, brother, me too. What do we do now, he asked. We serve starving people tonight, and tomorrow we go into town and talk to the sheriff. And if he doesn't believe it was self-defense? He will. He has to. We will talk with Mr. Holman tonight and figure it out tomorrow, I assured him. Here, help me cover him with the BBQ cover. We hid the grisly scene as best we could, putting bricks on the outside of the cover, hoping it wouldn't blow off, and proceeded to wheel the BBQ to the front of the house. 
I can light it, said Jenny. You guys get that food out fast as you can and some pots to cook. Everything all right back there? Well, it may affect the campaign some, I replied. There's no such thing as bad press, only bad explanations. We'll talk later, she said, like a seasoned campaign manager. My guesstimates were off by a bit, but in a good way. Everyone ate firsts, and anyone wanting seconds got that too. The cooking part wasn't hard since most foods were canned, minus the pots of pasta and rice. We left Ella's childhood home for the last time a few hours later, taking our time getting home in the dark. No. Shannon and Joe were worried we hadn't come home earlier, and I would have gotten an earful, I'm sure, if we didn't have little Ella in tow. Jenny caught them up to speed, and I went with Scott to the Holman residence, calling him on the radio before showing up after dark. Scout came with us. Maybe he was bored or just wanted to get out of the house. We told the story as any good lawyer would want, all of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly, answering questions during several crucial parts. An hour later he had it all and advised us the same as any other lawyer worth their salt before the day. Don't say a word to anyone outside Shannon and Joe. Sure, some attorneys would probably say don't talk to another soul about it, but everyone tells their life partner unless it's so bad they can't like leaving an open cookie jar out for an eight-year-old boy and saying, only take one, as you exit the room. I'll go down and talk to the sheriff first thing in the morning, said Mr. Holman, and no campaigning or anything outside the house until I return. Got it? Yes, sir, we said, thanking and bidding him and Judy a good night. Chapter 22 Growing Families Ella fell asleep in front of the fireplace holding Mama as the rest of us discussed her future, all agreeing we would talk with the sheriff once this other mess was figured out. In the meantime, she would stay with us, and that would be that. Jenny took it upon herself to make Ella a floor bed in her room, and arranged her grandmother's jewelry and special things neatly on the dresser. It's strange, I told Shannon later, after most had gone to bed. What is? she asked. <laughs> it's just that I feel like the Holmans are taking care of us. We're taking care of Jenny like we're parents, or at least some kind of guardians, and now it looks like she's taking care of another, half her age as well. I once saw this guy in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Have you ever been there? No, the place with the spas and baths, right? Yeah, that's the place. Anyway, this guy was sitting on the sidewalk with a dog. On top of the dog sat a cat, and on top of the cat sat a mouse all alive and just hanging out like another layer in the circle of life, if that makes any sense. Sort of. No, not really, she replied, kissing me softly. And I'm tired. Don't stay up too late. I missed you today. I missed you too, I replied, walking out the door and onto the back deck. You too, huh? said Scott, startling me. I can't just shut it off. I need a wind down or something, I replied. Made you a drink, said Scott. Me too, a double. Are you nervous about tomorrow? No. We were on the right side of the law and working with the best lawyer in town, who happens to be good friends with the sheriff. I think we will be all right if the mayor doesn't hear about it. No. Tossing and turning most of the night, my mind filled with dreams I couldn't put a finger on. The kind where you try to solve something but can't actually tell what the problem is. Every time I woke up, I would make a mental note to remember everything, only to lose it again after the next episode. The last one was nothing like the others, and it wakened me from a slumber enough to have me jump out of bed for the first time I could ever remember. They're going to starve, I said aloud. What? Who's going to starve? asked Shannon, still groggy. They, them, all of them, the ones from last night, the rest of them, the entire town. They are going to starve. Wait a minute, just hold on a second, said Shannon. I haven't heard you talk like this before. I know and it just dawned on me that these people at the grocery store yesterday are out of food, or nearly so. If they had any form of payment left, they would be eating in town, and even then, the few restaurants still open can't stay that way without trucks coming up the canyon, full of food from the Midwest, East, and overseas. Don't you see? They, we, all of us are going to starve to death, I finished, breathing as heavy as after any workout before the day. Yesterday was just a taste, I said after calming down. I told them I would have a solution for them today, but I don't. Why did you tell them that? asked Shannon. I don't know. I panicked, I guess. 
They were all rapid-firing questions, and Jenny treated it like a campaign rally. I didn't know what to say. A thirteen-year-old girl, even if she is your campaign manager, is not responsible for what comes out of your mouth, she said, sitting up and wrapping the blankets tightly around her. You're cold, I can see it. Let me get a fire going downstairs and I'll see about some breakfast, I replied. Not so fast, mister, we're not done here. I smiled, not one of joy or excitement, but the kind when you know someone else is right. They called your bluff and won. Let's just start slow. What did you promise those good people yesterday? I promised them I would try to get an answer of when the grocery store would reopen, and I would deliver it to them at the same time today, so maybe 3 p.m. But you already know the answer, she replied, with that caring look I had missed over the past year, the one that says, we'll figure this out together. I do, or at least I think I do, I replied. They are not opening any time soon, if ever again, so waiting out front for the manager to unlock the doors is futile. Everything in there is long gone. Right, she replied. So the answer is not in a store or some magical semi-truck lumbering up the road with fresh fruits from South America and bread made from Midwest grain. At least not until the power is restored, however long that takes. But everyone was there together at the same time. How is that possible? I asked. My father used to tell me something, replied Shannon. He told me that wherever he traveled across the world, one thing was the same. The most privileged of countries in Europe, South America, and yes, even here in the land of freedom, where we are untouched by war on our soil and famine for most, always took our running water and overstuffed grocery stores for granted. Even here, the majority of Americans have three weeks of food in their homes. In a time of crisis, most can stretch it to four weeks, but that's it. It's been that long now. And here we are. That's why everyone is out of their homes and looking for food. The fat cow has been slaughtered and eaten. My dad told me of an experiment they did once. I'm not sure if it was government or some other backer, but they took two groups of people. The first group was used to living off the land and had done so for generations. The second group was people like us, who are used to buying what they need, and the only future plans are the next trip to the store. They gave each of these groups twenty laying hens and said, they are yours. Do what you want with them. The first group made pens for them, kept them safe from predators, and fed on the eggs laid daily. The second, well, they killed and ate three chickens per day to feed the group, and were out of food in a week. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of, I replied. What you're saying is that we need a plan here for a sustainable food source that doesn't run out quickly. Exactly, and it's possible if done correctly. But without a plan... The chickens are all consumed without a second thought. The blame game starts right after, and the whole thing ends with violence, neighbor against neighbor, family against family, like savages. How do you know all this, Shannon? And how did I not know before? It didn't matter before, when everything was sunshine and roses in our country. And like I said, my dad taught me. Plus, Joe knows too. Joe? Yes, before her family struck oil on their property, I guess they were poor and lived largely off the land. Like the Beverly Hillbillies, I said in a whisper. Not that destitute, but enough to know where food comes from and how to appreciate it. Behind the money, she's still a small-town country girl. Yeah, that's what Scott said. It's part of why he likes her so much. She's not like the others he was raised around. So my knight in shining armor... You and Scott figure this mess out about last night with the sheriff, and I'll get with Joe. I'll have a plan you can bring to those people by lunchtime today. At this moment, I had never felt more certain she was the forever woman for me. I lit a fire in the great fireplace and started on breakfast in earnest. We had another mouth to feed today. I almost forgot. Until she startled me, that is. Chapter 23 Moving forward. Mr. Alex, came her little voice from behind me, making me jump and quickly turn around. Oh, it's you, Ella. What are you doing up so early? I can't sleep. I miss my grandma. Oh, sweetie. I'm sorry, I replied, not having any experience with little kids or the loss of a caregiver. I'm real hungry, Mr. Alex, she said, changing the subject and letting me off the hook for now. I took the hand out and ran with it. 
How about you help me make breakfast? That way you can tell me exactly what you are hungry for. And please just call me Alex. You're not a mister. Barely, I admitted. Okay, Alex, barely a mister. I'll be right back. She disappeared into Jenny's room and emerged a minute later with a white apron tied around her neck with the words Grandma's Little Treasure written in pink across the front. What are those? I asked, looking at her hands. These are my oven mitts. I have my own oven, you know. No, I didn't, and kicked myself for not seeing it when I grabbed her things. Well, I do, and I can get pretty messy in the kitchen, so watch out, she said, pushing her way past me and opening the door to the pantry. Well, I guess you already know your way around, I said, smiling. We had a grand tour last night when she first got here, said Jenny, yawning as she approached with Mama at her side. How can I help? Well, who's up for pancakes? I asked, raising my hand first. Me, me, Ella squealed. I haven't had one in so long. Uh, sounds good to me, replied Jenny, getting the mix out, powdered milk, and a couple of eggs donated from the Holman compound. Here, called Jenny tossing me an apron and putting one on herself. Grateful, Dad, I said, reading mine aloud and upside down. Yes, you are, said Shannon, watching secretly from the other side of the house. And the love of my life, she added. Jenny whispered something to Ella, and they both got that mischievous smile known across nations when up to something impish. Alex, I have something for you, said Ella in the sweetest voice I had ever heard, like an angel in a dream. Okay, what is it? I replied. A surprise. Close your eyes and no peeking. Okay, I'll play. Open your eyes, she said slowly, unable to control the giggles shaking her little body. I opened my eyes to a handful of flour and a quick whoosh of her little breath, covering me in white powder. What was that? I asked, looking at Jenny doubled over, laughing. You should see your face, Alex. Classic pancake face. Oh, it's on like Donkey Kong, I called out with two handfuls of flour, one for each of them. They were quicker than me, and most of mine ended up on the counter and floor, but enough covered their aprons and hair to satisfy my revenge. Get him, called Shannon and Joe, running into the kitchen and ganging up on me. Scott saw me from across the house and stayed seated. Wait, the powdered milk too, I asked. No, not the eggs, I called out as Jenny apparently agreed, setting them back onto the counter. By the time we stopped laughing, the kitchen was a mess. I did my best to conserve, but the mix got away from us just a bit, and ended up also on our aprons and in our hair. I felt bad after wasting limited food, but the smile on both young orphaned girls' faces let me off the hook a bit. Scott sat silently in front of the fire, and I realized that for a second I had forgotten what today was. It wouldn't be an ordinary one. That I knew. Whether good or bad, it was the start of change, and I hoped it was positive. Made you a plate, buddy, I said, handing it out to him. Thanks, but I'm not hungry. Today is going to be long and stressful for both of us, I whispered, and we may not get another meal. Okay, I'll eat. I'm just sick over what happened. I mean, he made me do it, right? He didn't make you do anything. He gave you no choice, and that's the difference, I replied. Who else wants pancakes, I called out. I do. They all said gleefully, with Shannon adding, and Scout here said he and Mama are on cleanup duty. Hey, check this out, called Scott, standing at the front window. What's up? I asked, walking over. Ooh, I said when I saw it, and everyone gathered around. The thick black cloud hovered over the mountain peaks, dark as night, hiding the sun. Joe and I will be on cleanup if the dogs don't do a great job, joked Shannon. Get your meeting with the sheriff done before that storm rolls in. Scott and I headed to Mr. Holman's place, surprised to see the sheriff's truck parked out front. The front door opened as we approached the porch, with the sheriff exiting. Thank you, Judy, for the coffee. It's great as always. Howdy, boys, he said casually. Uh, hi, sheriff, I said, confused. Had he not heard yet? What was he doing here, anyway? He just stopped by for coffee. Probably not. Rick and Grady walked out onto the front porch. Alex Scott, good timing, Grady said. The sheriff was just leaving. Oh, okay. Hi, Grady, I said, realizing I hadn't seen him in days, maybe weeks. Do we need to... stuttered Scott. I mean, do we need to talk? 
he finally spat out. Nope, said the sheriff. We're all good. I'm going to need one thing, though. What's that? asked Scott, and I could tell he was getting nervous again. I need the house address so my deputies can properly clean up the property, so to speak. Well, sir, I don't... Actually, Scott started to say, <laughs> It's the third house on the right on Maple Lane when coming in from the lakeside. The one with the yellow front door, I said. I see, he said soberly. I know that house. Sweet old lady used to give my wife piano lessons maybe five or six years back. We'll pick up the trash from out back, too. Most folks around here have had a run-in with Bobby or know someone who has. He's graced our little office a few times over the years and was always a less than polite guest. Guess he fell on his sword, like those kung fu movies from way back. Or maybe it was the Roman soldiers. I can never remember. Thanks for that information, Alex. Gentlemen, he added, walking past us, getting into his truck and driving out towards the main road. What happened there, Mr. Holman? asked Scott. I did some lawyering while you guys were gone. It's done, and if anyone asks you about it, you refer them to me. Scott looked as relieved as I had ever seen another man, and we stayed for coffee, catching up with Grady on family life and group prayer for his son in heaven. Nah. We thought you would be in town, talking to the sheriff right now, said Shannon, as she and Joe walked into the Holman's living room an hour and a half later. Me too, I said, but Mr. Holman took care of it before we got here. Well, it's a good thing, she replied, pointing to the sky. It's about to get nasty outside, looks like. It's good you're all here, she added, saying hi to Grady, Judy, and Rick. Are they up to speed about the promise you made yesterday, Alex? No, we didn't get that far. Okay, good. Joe and I have some ideas to run by everyone. We informed Rick, Judy, and Grady on the food part of what happened yesterday, and the promise I made to have an answer by this afternoon. <laughs> That wasn't the smartest thing you've done up here, Alex, said Grady. But it sounds like you didn't have much choice and needed to calm the crowd down before things got out of hand. Exactly, I agreed, feeling justified for the first time since my speech. I just wouldn't have phrased it like that, he added, chuckling. The first I'd heard from him since our drink back at the Stanley when we were both loose and carefree citizens of this great country, wondering where we would eat our next fancy dinner out. So, let's hear the plan, said Judy to the girls. You start, Joe told Shannon, and I'll jump in as needed. Chapter 24 A Plan Okay, Shannon started. We have a problem in this town bigger than the mayor issue, and it's happening right now. There's a food shortage, and it's about to be turned on its head. We didn't see it before because everyone had a three or four week supply of food, canned or packaged and most figured out how to cook on a barbecue grill or ate the canned stuff cold. Some with means ate at local restaurants while they still had some menu items, and everything refrigerated or frozen is gone, with the rare exception of EMP-proof freezers like you have, Rick and Judy. From what Alex and Jenny told me, yesterday's gathering was on the verge of getting out of control. They all have been fed for a night, but what's next? What about today, tomorrow, and the next? How about next month or even next year? I'm sure the few restaurants left are nearly out of food as well, and I don't see any trucks bringing in supplies. We have an advantage up here, high in the mountains, and it's also our biggest disadvantage. We're isolated, with no one in and no one out for the most part. Alex and I have been to this town before this trip, as you all know, and toured the National Park. There are a lot of animals here. Deer, elk, bear, some moose even. And I've heard some shots in the past week that tell me there are probably some hunters already harvesting. We have lakes and rivers, not just the main one in town, but mountain lakes full of trout. I don't think the electricity is coming back on any time soon. As for the four of us, Shannon added, pointing around to Scott, Joe, and me, we've been talking about heading home to Texas in late spring or early summer. It's a suicide trip in the middle of winter, we all know that but it gives us time to help get this town ready for the long haul. She's right, said Judy, speaking up before anyone else. We have provisions put away, but we can't sustain the whole town, not for very long. There has to be an organized effort to systematize our food supply. Seems as though the water hasn't been too much of an issue. I haven't heard of too many people getting sick. About the water, Grady chimed in. Probably most survived so far on bottled water, soda, juice, and beer. 
The ones in the know would drain their water heaters and get an extra 50 to 100 gallons of drinkable water. But now most will be drinking the water from lakes and rivers, and I bet some have already started. Dysentery kills more villagers in third world countries than anything else. Besides disease-infected mosquitoes, of course. Don't quote me on that. But I heard it somewhere. And even if it's not true, bad water is a big problem. So, Rick chimed in, we need a way to treat water on a large scale, some type of organized hunting that will feed citizens and not completely wipe out the animal population. Plus, organized sustainable fishing, a massive garden protected from the elements, and the people power to get it done together. Is that about right? We all nodded our heads in agreement. Alex, asked Rick, can you bring Jenny over here before we go any further? Plus, I want to meet little Ella. I spoke with the sheriff about her this morning. Sure, be back in a few, I said, jogging over to our place and rounding up the girls. It's snowing like crazy, I announced the obvious as we arrived back and stepped inside. We see that, said Shannon, pointing to the large window, the same one the mayor's boys had shot out not that long ago and was still partially boarded up. I'd like to ask a favor of you, Jenny, said Rick. Okay, she replied. What is it? Well, I wanted you all to hear this, and I haven't said anything to Alex or Scott yet. He got her up to speed on the food and water plan before continuing. You have something, Jenny, Rick continued. Something none of us have. What's that? she asked. A pulse on this town. You know people, and they know you. You can talk to anyone and help them see the future working together. And while I applaud your efforts running the Cade campaign for mayor, I'm officially asking you, and you too, he added, pointing to Scott and me. I'm asking that you withdraw from the mayor race, effective immediately. What? replied Jenny, standing up. Why would we do that? We've worked our tails off the past couple of weeks. Now hear me out, replied Rick. I and everyone here know how hard you've worked on the campaign. Nobody is discounting that. The reason I'm asking is because this town needs you in a new role, Jenny. All of our lives depend on it. He spoke like he stood in front of a jury. I'm listening, but not agreed so far, just so you know, Jenny replied. Fair enough, he continued. We know that Alex, Shannon, Scott, and Joe are preparing to leave town for their homes in Texas in late spring, or early summer at the latest, and I need... Wait! Hold on, wait a minute. What? asked Jenny, jumping up again. Is this true, Shannon? Alex, is it true? She was raising her voice at this point. Come on, sweetie, said Judy to Ella, whisking her out of the room. So, you weren't going to tell me, just disappear one day like my parents? She burst into tears and ran from the room out the front door and up the driveway. Jenny, wait, I said, starting after her. Hold on, Alex, said Shannon. Let her go. We need to figure this part out first. You didn't tell her, said Rick as a statement. No, sir. This would be the part where the attorney threatens to drop his client for lack of transparency, right? Before, yes but you're not my client on those matters specifically. Still, I should have asked I didn't, and I would never have made that mistake in the old world. It's on me, and I'll make it right. I expected a tough day, but this wasn't factored in, I told Scott, as we all took a ten-minute break to clear our heads. Yeah, I didn't see this coming either, he admitted. She's pissed. No, guys, she's hurt, said Joe. There's a difference. Ah, crap, she's right, I said with Scott agreeing. Hey, let's take in a teenager, an abruptly orphaned girl, gain her trust, and then abandon her, I said, as if I were hearing it from someone else. That's messed up, said Scott. Yes, it is, I replied. We decided to reconvene in a couple of hours around 11 a.m. with Judy keeping Ella occupied for now. We should have discussed it more, I told Shannon on our way back home. I mean, I just kind of assumed Jenny would want to stay here. This her home, after all. This is where she's from, replied Shannon. It doesn't necessarily mean it's who she is. Huh? I asked, with Scott listening in and giving the same expression. This is where she's from, said Shannon, and Rick and Judy are great, but they're not her family. Neither are we. I replied, feeling the venomous words escape my lips before I could take them back. Wait, that's not what I mean. Let me try one more time before anyone says anything, I added, trying to collect my thoughts. Well, asked Shannon, as seriously as I'd ever seen her. What I mean, I exhaled, 
What I mean is, we are her family now, all of it. The only family she has, and we need to rethink everything. That's a better answer, said Shannon. Let me go and talk to her. Joe, can you come with me? Sure, Shannon, she said, giving Scott the same look that I got from Shannon. We're in the doghouse, aren't we? said Scott, well clear of the lady's audible range. No, we're out behind the doghouse because they boarded up the front and took the blankets out. And the day is far from over, I replied, watching the large, sticky flakes of snow fall from the sky like summer cottonwood offerings. I doubt those people will be outside today, if that's what you are concerned about, said Scott. I don't know, I would be, I replied, if I didn't know any better. It might be cold and snowy, but they're already out of food. I still owe them an explanation or idea, something they can hold on to. Hope. Maybe I shouldn't have opened my mouth, but I did. I was there, too. I'm with you. But we're going to have a bear of a time trying to get the golf cart downtown. The snow is already two inches deep. At this rate, it will be six in a few more hours. Think. Think, I told myself. The shed, I blurted out. The one at the Holman's house, the one Jenny had her bike in. There are some skis in it. You can ski, right, Scott? Oh, yeah, we went like every winter. I can cut a mountain. Wait a minute, you mean like cross-country, don't you? Yeah, no chairlifts, and if you're lucky enough to get a downhill run, it's telemarking turns only. I've seen those guys do it on the mountain. It's harder than it looks, I hear, said Scott. It is. I've done it, and it's a workout, but it's that or snowshoes. So just to clarify, you want us to ski three miles to town and three back this afternoon? asked Scott. I think so. If any are standing out there waiting for word and we don't show up, what does that say? It says it's cold, and a crazy snowstorm, blizzard is a better word, is making travel nearly impossible, but I'm still in. Let's see if we can find some boots that fit. Finding boots and skis was the easy part. Rick and Grady had amassed a shrine of sorts to the sport in the rear of the shed. More of a hoarder's den than a shrine, but there were plenty of skis, boots, and poles to choose from, and an entire section of winter skiing gear as if they were running a ski school out of here last winter. You're going to what? asked Rick, with Grady agreeing we might be a bit off our rockers. We're going to ski into town and tell the people. I trailed off and knew the next question was coming. Tell them what? asked Grady. That the stores are not reopening any time soon and maybe never again and that the long-term food and water plan is weeks out at best to start functioning properly. I don't know, I said, frustrated. I do know I made a promise to tell them something, and that's what I plan to do. All right, gentlemen, said Rick, as if we were in a legal deposition, arguing the facts of a case where neither side could prove them. Let's forget the big plan for now. I want Jenny to hear the rest of it anyway. And let's focus on today, tomorrow, and the next week, but no further. The way I see it is we have a humanitarian crisis on our hands, and it's come to a head, whether we like it or not. Judy and I have been preparing for something like this for a while now, as you both know. We could arguably sustain those in town, including the ones you haven't met with yet, for maybe a month, two tops, but that's everything we have. And when it's gone, it's gone. I propose, with your agreement of course, Judy, that we provide food for, say, two hundred and filters for water for the next three days while we get a game plan together. I don't want anyone to know where it came from. This is not the time to play hero or give an indication of where to come hunting for more. So I propose we get the sheriff involved, use his truck, and he can pull my trailer if needed. We load up and set up shop inside the now-abandoned Safeway. Let's see if we can get the women from last night who helped Cook to volunteer, and a few men to help out as well. I'll ask the sheriff to put a few deputies on security, and we'll run it like a soup kitchen. Everyone waits their turn and gets an equal meal. Speaking of that, if we start with soup, we can stretch our provisions even further, adding in some meat or fish if we can get a few hunters and fishermen started right away. A bull elk could yield maybe 200 pounds of lean meat, minus the bones. The key is keeping everyone from shooting their own, and then wasting the meat or letting it rot. I know it's already happened a few times, and the sheriff is trying to stop it. But we need the town all on the same page if it's going to work. Let me get hold of the sheriff on the radio. If he can stop by today, we can load up enough food, 
and you and Scott can catch a ride into town, like heroes. That sounds better than skiing and his villains, I said, feeling the weight lifting from my shoulders. I mean, who doesn't want to ride into town with a truck full of food? It's a great idea. Perfect. Just perfect. Now get it done, boys, announced Judy. I've got good news, said Rick, maybe ten minutes later, walking back into the room. Sheriff Bradley has agreed to stop by later, and he'll have chains on his truck so the snow shouldn't be a problem. You can have the food to those people tonight around 6 p.m. It will take maybe an hour to get it set up so it can be served at 7. Not bad for a last-minute hustle, right, guys? Absolutely, said Scott, grabbing me by the shoulder. We'll save the skiing for the chairlifts, he added. No, I replied, pacing back and forth. I mean, it's a great plan, and I'm sure they are going to be real happy about it. But I told them at 3 p.m. I would have an answer, not 6. So, the sheriff needs to get here earlier. He can't, replied Rick. I tried, but he has other pressing matters that can't wait. He'll be here around five, and if we load up quick, you can be there by six. It's the best we can do. Thank you, Rick and Judy, for your generosity, and I really do appreciate it. But I can't show up three hours late to an event I scheduled. Even with a truckload of food, I'll head out at about one, which gives me two hours to ski three miles, more than enough time, and meet the sheriff there at six. Are you sure about this? asked Scott. Unwaveringly, but I can do it myself. It's just a quick speech anyway. Jenny, Shannon, and Joe returned before we left, and did not address the elephant in the room about us planning to head home in the spring or summer. So, Mr. Holman, you were proposing some sort of idea? asked Jenny. Please continue, she said, more like a thirty-something-year-old professor than a thirteen-year-old teenager. Well, to continue... I'm asking that you drop your bid for the mayoral race and focus your time on feeding the people of this town. Not like a soup kitchen, even though that's what we will be doing tonight and over the next few weeks, likely, but developing a plan for the long-term stability of everyone here, providing everybody is willing to do their part. We need to start thinking of our town as a whole, and not the sum of its parts, Jenny. And I can't think of anyone better to help get the plan into the minds of the people and enlist their special skills. Everyone has some for the benefit of others. We will survive as one or die off as individuals from sickness, starvation, and violence, he finished, getting a cringe out of me. We've had enough of that, almost, replied Jenny. Almost? asked Rick. Almost. I still haven't forgotten about that SOB text, and he'll get what's coming. But as for the rest of it, I'm in. We were never going to beat you in a runoff for mayor, anyway. I just wanted to see these two squirm a bit, and squirm they did. I looked at Scott, not understanding if she was joking or still upset from earlier today and taking pot shots at us. Let me get it down on paper and I'll have something for you tomorrow if that works, she told Rick. Sure, that's great. Do you mind, Jenny, if Ella stays here tonight? asked Judy, bouncing her on her knee and getting giggles out of the small girl. Not at all. I've got a lot of work to do anyway, she replied. I spoke to the sheriff about Ella, said Rick, closing the door. And? asked Shannon. And she's all alone, like you were, Jenny. I thought Jenny would cringe or maybe run out again, but she didn't. It's why she needs a family, she replied, putting her hand on my shoulder. Does this mean we're good? I wanted to say, before an inner voice yelled. Don't say it, it's too soon. Just nod and smile, and that's just what I did. You're a goofy one, said Jenny, giving me a hug and whispering. We're all good, Pops. Pops? Pops, I said to Scott, as we walked out the door last. She called me Pops. Is that a dig? No, Gramps is a dig. Pops is not bad at all. Let's get some skis on. You're coming with me. Of course. I wouldn't miss it for a root canal, he replied. Plus, I want to see how you stall a hundred hungry people for three hours without a shred of evidence you can come through. I'm coming too, said Jenny, overhearing the last part from wherever she popped out of. I don't know. Skiing into town isn't easy, I replied. Sure it is. I've been skiing cross-country for years with my dad. Nothing to it. Besides, if you don't give them more than a one- or two-night plan, they will crucify you, and I can't have that on my conscience. We need a talker, and that's me. Jenny with a Y, she said with a curtsy. You guys be careful out there, said Rick as we were about to head out. I know you're talking to the boys, said Jenny. I was just in town yesterday and by myself. You boys keep an eye on her, Rick whispered to me. 
I don't want her anywhere near that Tex monster. I'll ride down with the sheriff tonight. After all, it's not a bad campaign boost. Chapter 25 Skiing to Town the three of us headed out with promises to Shannon and Joe that we would not get too far ahead of Jenny and we would hitch a ride back with the sheriff after it was done. The first part was cleared up right away as we left the house, skiing down the main road toward town. Jenny took the lead and didn't slow for the first mile, finally stopping to wait for Scott and me. You guys would be faster walking, she stated as we caught up. I took a nap and got in half of a movie while waiting for you slowpokes to catch up. But to be fair, you're both quite a bit older than me and carrying half a spare tire around your middle, she teased, prompting both of us to touch our stomachs and suck in just a little. <laughs> you both better get in shape for that long walk back to Texas, or I'm going to be waiting on you the whole way, she added, taking off again at full speed. My lungs were burning with the cold mountain air and more exercise than I could remember, except for the mountain lion run-in. The shoulder still ached here and there, but it was on the mend, and the skiing seemed to loosen it up a bit. Did she say she's coming with us to Texas? asked Scott. That's what I heard. Plus you're old and fat, I replied. <laughs> she was looking right at you, but seriously, did you know that about her coming with us? asked Scott. No. Shannon just said they talked, and all was good. Let's shelve it, though, for now. If I don't stop talking, my lungs are going to catch fire. Jenny was kind enough to take an extra ten minutes around the two-mile mark so we could catch our breath. Safeway came into view at 2.10, according to Scott's watch, and a small group was trickling in, a few at a time. See, I knew they would be here. I'm glad we didn't blow it off, I said. The questions came rapid fire from the growing crowd, throwing me off guard trying to answer. Hold on, everyone, said Jenny. You can direct any questions to me after I've given a short speech that won't start until 3 p.m. That's... Wait a minute, she added, grabbing Scott's arm to see his watch. That's in 38 minutes. Until then, stay warm and talk amongst yourselves. Let's talk, she told Scott and me, leading us away from the crowd to a football-style huddle. All right, she started. Three and a half hours until the sheriff and his boys get here. Might as well be a week for someone who's hungry and cold, so we will give them the information and let them come back in a few hours. What about us? asked Scott. Do we just hang out or ski home? We can hole up in the courthouse, replied Jenny. I was there yesterday. It's better than staying outside. I looked at the gray sky, with the snow showing no sign of letting up. I believe the mayor office is out of there, I remarked. He does, and he's kind of a jerk. Skiing as winded as I was beat the heck out of standing still in the middle of a snow apocalypse with my feet ice cold and wishing I had an extra pair of gloves. It reminded me of a comedy film where one main character says to the other, You've had this pair of extra gloves this whole time? And the other replied, Yeah, we're in the Rockies. I smiled at the memory before stomping my feet to gain some circulation. I think we can find a better alternative, I suggested, pulling a few crumpled dollars from my jeans pocket. That's where you went wrong, said Jenny, pointing to my pants. Wet jeans in the winter are not smart, not up here. <laughs> I'll chalk that up to things you could have told me before we left the house, I said, as the hems of my pant legs froze stiff. Touche, college boy, she replied. You know what that means? asked Scott. Do you? Coffee shop, brainiacs, I said, shivering. If, if it's still open, the one on Main... It is. I rode by it yesterday, and the sign says it's open till 8 p.m. plus they've got a fireplace, replied Jenny. Thirty minutes left, called out Scott, who was at least smart enough to wear ski pants that he found in the ski shed. I danced around for the better part of the time remaining, and at exactly 3 p.m., Jenny started her speech to the crowd, even larger than yesterday. I guess the word is getting out about free food, I whispered to Scott. Rain or shine? he replied. She started with a heartwarming speech about the history of the town and how we were stepping aside in the mayoral race to clear the way for Rick Holman, attorney at law, and backed him with our full support. She promised three days of food would be here by 6 p.m. and asked for volunteers from yesterday's meal to help once again, citing it would be held inside the now-abandoned Safeway as soon as someone cut the lock. As for the longer-term plan, 
she laid out some basics of water, food, and medical options moving forward, but was clear it would need the approval and full support of the sitting mayor. Who here thinks Mayor Haskins has what it takes to lead us in the right direction? She asked, point blank. I need a show of hands, she called out loudly after hoots and hollers echoed through the valley, maybe a dozen hands raised. Now, who among you thinks Rick Holman, attorney at law, is the man to lead this town into the future? Most in the crowd raised their hands with a few cheers. One man started a chant. Holman, Holman, he's our man. If he can't do it, no, but... He trailed off, not getting any takers from the hungry and half-frozen crowd. That's what I want to hear, Jenny said, and he will be here tonight to give out food to everyone, just like last night. This got even more cheers. She finished with, and I'm pretty sure the soon-to-be former mayor, Mr. Haskins, won't be joining us. Dinner tonight will be ready at about 7 p.m. Tell your friends, and same as last night, single file, women and children first. That wasn't bad, I said as the crowd dispersed. Nothing to it, she replied. I just told them what they wanted to hear and gave them some skin in the game. What skin? asked Scott. When Rick Holman... Attorney at law shows up with all the food and they know the sitting mayor has to be on board for the rest. It's an easy vote. Now which one of you lady killers is going to buy me a coffee? I got three, I said. I've got seven, replied Scott. Should be enough. The coffee shop, the same one I had wandered into the morning after my scuffle in the hotel room with Trey, was packed and stated lower prices. The previous six dollars coffee was now two dollars, and below the price was a list of alternative ways to pay. The top of the list included junk silver, half a dozen eggs, three cigarettes, two cans or bottles of beer of any brand. Food options spanned two kinds of canned soup, meats, pasta, or vegetables, and an intact cigar bought three cups. How much do you have left? I asked the barista. Just made a fresh batch, she replied. I mean, how many coffee beans do you have left? Uh, hold on a second and I'll get the owner. Oh, that's not necessary. I was just wondering is all. She disappeared before I could finish, and I could see her talking with him in the back and pointing up toward me. Is there a problem, sir? he asked, when he reached the front. No, sir, I just had a random question, more of a curiosity thing, since I love coffee. Come on back for a minute, he said, leading the way. I followed him into the back storage room, lit by a candle that was on its last days. I was just asking how much coffee you had and wondered what your plan was when it ran out. Now I realize that asking anyone about provisions right now is probably taboo. I know you, the owner said before answering any questions. You're that Alex kid running for mayor, right? Hey. Up until maybe an hour ago when we announced we were dropping out. Why would you do that? I heard you maybe could have won the whole shooting match. Well, I kind of got on a new team, figuring out how the people of this town can make it through this cycle and not starve. It will be a lot of work, and I can't do both. I know I was downtown today and heard your manager's speech. Jogged back faster than you guys could ski. Anyway, I've been meeting with other coffee shop and restaurant owners recently, all trying to figure out a plan long term. I need more coffee beans, plain and simple. The only things saving us so far are the old hand grinder I dug out of the basement and the fact that I had overordered the last time I bought. But another few weeks and I'm out of beans and out of business, then what? I understand, sir. And the quick answer is, I don't know. Until the power comes back on, there's no more being delivered to this town or any other. I heard the president's radio speech the other day, the cafe owner continued. And it didn't sound as though we're getting back to normal any time soon. I know it's not a solution, but if we could get some herbs growing, could you switch over to tea for a while? It's not my first choice, he replied. There's always dandelion coffee, I said, having read about it in one of my Holman prepping books. It's not the same, but it's better than nothing, I added. I'll think on it, the owner replied, standing and reaching out his hand. Good luck on the food project. I've got to get back to work while I still have it. What was that about? asked Jenny. Supply, just like everything else around here, is coming to a halt. 5 p.m. came too soon, as far as I was concerned. We needed to be at the Safeway by 5.30 and hoped the sheriff could get the front doors cut open. 
None of us were interested in standing outside in the dark after sitting near a fireplace in the coffee shop for the last two hours. Even the short trip to one of the porta potties that the city had spread around town gave me a chill that was hard to recover from. I wasn't sure if the mayor had a hand in it, but the porta potties were a step forward, at least for now, around the downtown area. By 6 p.m., the parking lot was crowded with most dancing around like I was, trying to keep warm. We're just waiting for Sheriff Bradley, his deputies, and the truck of food, announced Jenny at six on the dot. We expect them any minute, and then we'll see about getting inside out of the weather, she added, looking up at the continuous flakes adding nearly two more inches to the ground in the last while. The grumbling started at 6.05 and grew louder each minute. By 6.40, people were demanding answers. Where are you guys? I said, so only Scott and Jenny could hear. We're freezing, said one man, followed by another that asked if this was all a big hoax. Can't we at least wait inside the building? asked another, apparently not listening earlier. It's locked, I said out loud, as I pointed to a chain on the front door. I got it, the man yelled out, walking towards the door and lifting a large planter, long void of plant life. No, I yelled as he raised it and sent the planter crashing through the front window. The point was to be at least a little insulated inside, not create a six-by-six-foot draft. I kind of thought it would just crack it. But nope, it's a hole, all right, I said to Scott. Nearly the entire crowd gasped or groaned, all realizing the store would be an icebox in a matter of hours. Chapter 26 Promise Hey, Mr. Holman, the sheriff called on the radio. We've got a snag here. Got the truck stuck in a ditch. I thought you put chains on it, Rick radioed back to the sheriff from his home. I did. That's the crazy part. The problem is trying to get another vehicle to pull me out. Got one of my deputies who said he could do it first thing in the morning. I tried digging her out with a shovel, but with all the snow piling up, it's not happening. All right, but you'll be there first thing in the morning, asked Rick. That's affirmative. I'll bring my deputy's truck along to help as well. All right. See you tomorrow, sheriff. What was that about? Are they close? asked Judy. Not even a bit. They can't make it until morning. I wish those kids had taken a radio with them, she said with a worried look. Me too, honey. Now they have a couple of choices. Head back here in the dark or stay put until morning. By 7.30 the crowd had started to disperse, with most grumbling about being ripped off, or at least deceived. What a disaster, I said to Scott and Jenny, and brought up the choices of heading home on skis or spending the night inside the Safeway and hoping not to freeze to death. Scott wanted to stay, and Jenny wanted to head back. I was the tiebreaker, and neither option sounded good. Excuse me, said a woman. Excuse me, Alex, she repeated. Listen, I'm sorry about all this, but there's nothing I can do right now, I said before turning around. You skied here from how far away? she asked, pointing to my skis. A few miles, ma'am, I responded. Surprised I wasn't getting bombarded with questions about food. They're not here with the food, she said. I know, I... They're not here with the food, she said again, because it's snowing like crazy. They will be here tomorrow. I can feel it. I live just down the road with my daughter here, she added, patting a pink head-to-toe snowsuit of her little girl. I would like all of you to stay with us tonight, and we can sort this out in the morning. No. Thank you, ma'am, but that's not necessary, I said, with Scott agreeing and Jenny not responding. You two are from Texas, I hear. Yes, ma'am. Well, you're not in Texas anymore, she said. Stay in the store overnight, and you are likely to never wake up. Try to ski home in the dark. Well, it's a gamble at best. Now follow us, unless you have some kind of a death wish. We followed her back home, leaving our skis just inside the broken front store pane. My hands and feet were completely numb, and yet on fire, like a thousand needles poking into them at once. Boys, grab some wood out back under the overhang, would you? And Jenny, dear, will you help me in the kitchen? Yes, ma'am, we all replied. Scott and I got the fire going quickly. The blankets and mattresses in front told me the two residents had slept in front of it for some time. What's for dinner? asked Scott. I'm starved. Soup replied Jenny, with a look that said, No more questions. Sounds great, he replied. Jenny handed us each a steaming bowl, 
with another look as Scott dug around with his spoon for something solid. The utensil clinked on the inside of the light blue ceramic bowl, cutting through yellow-colored liquid bouncing off each edge. It's consomme, I whispered. Consomme what? Consomme, I repeated. Broth, liquid only, nothing else. That's not going to fill me up. Tastes good, though, he whispered back. Nope, and that's the point, I whispered back. It's why we need to get this program up and running, like yesterday. What are you guys whispering about over there? Jenny inquired. Oh, nothing, just commenting on the soup's flavor. It's good. I'm sorry, boys, it's all we have, said the woman. But it's better than not eating at all. We are all very thankful for your generosity, I replied. How long have you been out of food? I wasn't sure I wanted to hear the answer. A week almost, she replied. We shopped big twice a month at the grocery store. Wouldn't you know it? We were slated for a food run two days after the lights went out. By then it was all gone. We had bits of rice and pasta we could add to the bullion soup up until yesterday. But now that's gone as well. What were you going to do? I couldn't help but ask. Pray, it's what we did. And here you find people are, right in our living room. But we didn't bring any food yet, said Scott. Sit down, gentlemen, please. I'd like to share something with you that hopefully puts everything in perspective. God is not a vending machine, she continued, and paused. Huh? asked Scott. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean. God is not a vending machine, she repeated. He does miraculous things in his time. No, we don't have more food tonight. But we have guests who have a wonderful plan, I believe, and that's something we didn't have yesterday. So, I trust in the plan, and that gives me comfort in a trying world. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, I replied, with Scott nodding in agreement. We all slept in front of the fire, and I added a few pieces of wood randomly through the night. Soup's on, she said at first light. The reality of the situation here, and likely most households in town and the entire country, hit me like a ton of bricks. The lights going out wasn't the hard part. It was just the spring that sprung the trap. Whatever happened from this day forward would need to be painstakingly calculated for the good of the whole, or true famine, only seen on our TVs in some far-off eastern land, would be right here, in our small corner of the world. Scott thanked her for the broth, as if it were Eggs Benedict at a Sunday morning brunch. We all did. Psst! If you're enjoying this audiobook, can you do us a favor and share it with a friend? The more you share, the more free audiobooks we can publish for you. Now, back to the story. Chapter 27 Late Delivery Sheriff Bradley slept in his truck overnight. Not the greenhorn that would freeze to death in a supermarket, but a seasoned mountain man, prepared for the worst. His bug-out bag never left the lockbox on the back of his truck, and he hadn't even opened it since a training session. He put his deputies through two years before, in the middle of summer. His deputy found him sleeping in the early morning hours, and even complaining about how hot he was all night. The deputy's wrench did its job, minus some damage to the front grill, tree trunk style. They were then on their way to the Holman Ranch. I'm not trying to pull a trailer today, he told Rick, but with both trucks we should be able to get it all in one shot. Jenny Scott and I made it to the store parking lot around 9 a.m., and the crowd was thick again. Jenny mingled after a short speech, saying hopefully things would be different today. A few were upset, the same ones as last night, I remembered, but the rest seemed to fall into the cozy trap of acceptance. If it came late, as advertised, their prayers would be answered. If not, they continued on one day at a time until something changed or their bodies cashed the ultimate check. I never had my doubts about the food eventually arriving but was getting discouraged on the timeline when I heard the first shouting, added by another, and then more, all pointing down the road at the truck slowly lumbering through the snow. There they go, I said to Scott, and half the crowd ran to meet the trucks halfway into the large parking lot with a few nearly getting run over as they tried to jump up and see what was in the bed. It reminded me of the movies where mercenaries show up in a village in the middle of a third world country and are surrounded by men, women, and children, all hoping for a better day than the last. Two rifle shots in the air from the sheriff got the town quieted down and moving away from the trucks. Look who's coming, Rick said to the sheriff and his men as they stood on the bed of the lead truck. 
our old friend, the mayor. Mayor Haskins, carrying a bullhorn, walked up to the truck and hopped up without an invitation. What do we have here, gentlemen, he asked, keeping his voice down and off the megahorn. Food, replied Sheriff Bradley, donated by Mr. Holman. Is that so? the mayor replied. Probably a lot more where that came from, am I right? Rick Holman, attorney at law, knew that sometimes a lawyer's best friend is to not answer the question at all. How much do we have here, Sheriff? Sir. About three days for two hundred people, Mr. Mayor. And you just plan to hand it out? No. We were planning to open up the grocery store, but I can see that's already happened. Then feed them, soup kitchen style, using volunteers. Are you wanting to volunteer, sir? Absolutely. And I'll even provide security, the mayor said with a grin on his face and four of his goons standing off to the side. Testing. Testing. Can everyone hear me? He called out on the megaphone. I'm Mayor Haskins, of course, and I have a question for all of you, my fine citizens. Who is ready to eat? He asked, getting the crowd excited. I said, who is ready to eat? He called out, like a professional wrestling commentator might ask. Who's ready to see the Terminator? Okay, please quiet down, okay? Thank you. He continued, receiving applause, as if he had put hours of work in already. I've coordinated with Sheriff Bradley to bring you all a few days of food. Served not out here like animals, but inside the grocery store. And I, for one, can't wait to dish out the first spoonful. Some cheered while the others talked amongst themselves. We thought it was Mr. Holman who was supplying the food, asked one, with others chiming in in agreement. Of course, replied the mayor in full candidate mode. Mr. Holman has been nothing less than my right-hand man throughout this most important endeavor. And who knows, he may even make a good deputy mayor at some point down the road. Whoa, I said to Scott and Jenny. I didn't see that coming, added Scott. What a jerk, stated Jenny. If it takes me all day, I'll make sure everyone here knows the truth about who's responsible for putting this together. Rick stood stoic, remembering something a mentor colleague told him in his first year as a practicing attorney and an hour before his first trial. Rick. There's a time to argue, a time to present your case, and a time to shut up and let the jury decide. And timing is everything. He never forgot that advice, and it proved invaluable more than a few times as he rose through the ranks. Timing is everything, he said to himself. Let's maybe not tell the mayor about our long-term food plans, he said to the sheriff. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't know he was going to take credit for this. Ah! What are your plans after the food runs out in a few days, Mayor? asked one woman, winking at Jenny first. Yeah, said another. What are they, Mr. Mayor? Uh, well, we have big plans, the mayor stuttered, fumbling with the bullhorn. Isn't that right, Mr. Holman? he asked, putting the megaphone in front of his face. Yes, we do, and they will be revealed over the next day or two, Mr. Holman announced, getting a nod and smile from Jenny. Take that, you smarmy snake. I can't wait to see what you come up with on your own, she said under her breath. Rick supplied everything needed to cook a meal for a crowd. Plates, plastic ware, buffet-style tins, and those banquet-style heaters. Were you some kind of caterer in a previous life? I asked him, joking. I should have been one. Judy and I thought we might be doing something like this one day and prepared accordingly. You sound like Noah, chimed in Scott. He built an ark and you prepared to feed a small army. <laughs> well, I didn't get a voice from the heavens, I don't think, but something told me to prepare. And since we had the financial means, it was just a matter of getting it done. Judy was responsible for coordinating it all. She should be here to see this. And Ella, asked Jenny. She's great. Judy has taken a real shine to her. A new shine only partially described Judy's attitude towards life and everything in it. She had never had kids, always wanted them, but the doctors put that dream to bed quickly, and by the third opinion, she had reached the acceptance phase and spoke of it no more. Rick, having lost his only child years earlier, longed for another. He wrestled with the idea of replacing one with another, as a family may do when a cat or fish dies. Both took a shine to little Ella, and the sheriff didn't have any idea what to do with her. The whole mess was fate, maybe, or just dumb luck, some might say, but Judy knew different. 
She had prayed for this most of her adult life. And after all, Ella's grandma wasn't killed or starved. It's just that her time stamp was up. She died in her bed as peacefully as we could all hope to when the time comes. The chow line left most satisfied with the outcome, and with visible security all behaved decently. Chapter 28 Business Deals Mayor Haskins hadn't seen Tex in a few days, and his confidence was returning. He barked orders at his men, ordering them to search every vacation home in town, looking for the man who left a most important job undone. I can't have Trey running wild all over town, he told them. Trey was really Tex, of course, but they didn't need to know that or why the mayor wanted him found. Just find him and report back to me, he screamed. Here they come, said Tex one morning, closer to noon than sunrise. They who? asked Beth, casually walking down the stairs. She was earning more freedom each day and hardly restrained over the past few. The mayor's boys looking for yours truly, no doubt. I'm a popular guy. Ask anyone, he added looking through binoculars nearly two miles down the road. The bumbling boys all carried rifles over their shoulders, save for one, and carried beers openly. Sorry, babe, we're getting closer, but not there yet, he said, pulling the restraints from behind the bed after leading Beth upstairs. Just for a little bit, I promise. Where are you going? she asked. Hunting. Tex didn't mind being the prey. He always thought of himself as the Lion King of the Serengeti, and if one couldn't or wouldn't get a shot off from a distance, he would tear out a man's throat. Come on, fellas, he said, peering out of the living room window at the group who may as well be frat boys, stumbling home after a night of partying. You've got rifles, I can see that. So do I, but today only you are getting the Bowie special. One man and one big-ass knife against three gun-toting drunkards before lunch even, and on my home turf. Mr. Mayor, sir, you are about to be three goons light, he said with a grin. Back in just a few, babe, then I'll make us lunch, he added, walking out the back door and ducking into the nearby pines. Tex positioned himself as any good soldier would when preparing an ambush, directly on the path, out of sight and close enough to take a man's heart out with a second's notice. The intruders make it easy, staying on the road, guns pointed down, and probably not even locked and loaded, Tex thought just going through the motions for their boss. So he took the opportunity to shuffle around the house's side, into the trees just off the dirt road. It could go either way at the start. The ending would be the same. Tex could take them out all at once, risking one or two getting a quick shot off, but more likely to soak their pants, or he could let them take him and pick them off on the way back to town. Option two was daring and more exciting, to be sure. But his love was back home, and lunchtime was approaching. I'm going to take door number one, he said quietly, as the men were only fifty yards away and headed straight for him. Here, fellas, 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 he called in a whisper. Come and see what Daddy has for you. You're looking for me, but I found you first. Who wants roses and who likes tulips? Both make a dignified coffin adornment. He sang in a whisper another of his made-up tunes and added in two big words he shared with no one else. You're looking for me. I'm right behind this tree. If you want to go home tonight, you'll have to win this fight. Thirty yards out, the men stopped, two of them arguing with the third. Tex could hear the confrontation clearly, and it wasn't hard to tell the subject at hand. The two were cold and out of beer, wanting to turn back, while the third, a likely non-drinker from the conversation, felt he had a duty to stay the course and report something back to his boss. It was clear they didn't like him, and he didn't like them either. The split happened too close for Tex to get the job done, and at a distance, his knife was near useless. He ducked back in the trees and ran two hundred yards down the road, giving proper distance for the two to turn back, and an equal amount of space for the ambush of the third. It was quick when it happened. The man had his rifle slung over his left shoulder and clumped down the road loud enough to scare off any animals in the area. Tex, behind a large pine closest to the road, jumped out and grabbed him before he could touch his rifle. Looking for me? asked Tex, while his hands worked, one over his mouth and the other holding the blade under his throat. The rest could have been done in seconds right there on the dirt road, and Tex would have been home thawing his hands by the fire before thirty minutes escaped the cuckoo clock on the wall of the great room. 
He thought better of the blood trail on the road, pulling the whimpering man hard and into the woods and forcing him to his knees. Don't worry, I'll make it quick, he said. I don't have beef with you. It's just business is all. Wait, wait, please, the man pleaded. Waiting is a young man's game, replied Tex. It serves no purpose to a man of my age or yours, he added. I'm guessing you're mid-twenties, like myself. Late, he squeaked out. No, late what? Late twenties, sir. Duly noted, replied Tex, getting the blade in position for a clean cut. Wait, said the man again. I'm sure we can work something out. I mean, don't you want to know what I know about the mayor and the other guys, at least? In exchange for what? My life, of course. Well, that is a right tempting proposal, you know. Grown folks offer up all kinds of things in exchange for their lives, and only once have I ever accepted. You might think it was my daddy, or my second girlfriend who cheated on me with a good friend. You might even think it was the good friend that got a second chance at life. Nope, not a one of them. The chap was a man named Anderson, but everyone called him Andy for short. Anyway, he crossed me. Nothing crazy, but he did ask if I'd seen his missing wallet. It was his tone that got me. Kind of like maybe I took it. Did you? Asked the trembling man before him before he could take it back. Nope. Did look through it, though, but only snagged the cash, credit cards, and his driver's license. I could have kept the whole thing, genuine leather, a real slick money holder, if you ask me. But I didn't. I gave it back to him with everything else inside. So, long story short, he apologized to me for losing his wallet and putting me in the moral position of deciding what to do about it. Can you believe that crap? Why, it was the funniest thing I'd ever heard, and I lowered my knife and even gave him back the license and credit cards. Kept the cash as a finder's fee, of course, but I let him walk right out of that bar, and far as I know, he's still alive to this very day. So do you got something going to make me laugh harder than that or not? No, the man conceded, but I do have something else. All right, I'm listening, Tex said, taking the knife from his throat and sitting on the ground next to him. Scream or try to run, though, and we're done here. I can throw this thing with deadly accuracy twenty feet and another ten at, let's say, eighty percent. I can go either way on it, so it's up to you, really. Would you look at that? A minute ago, you were slated for a date with your maker, and now I have bestowed upon you the gift of another minute. Maybe more, who knows? Our Lord does work in mysterious ways. That's a fact. The man was much for praying, but he was pretty sure he knew which way Tex's soul was headed when the time came. I won't run or call out, that's a promise. The mayor is right mad at you, Trey. Said you took payment for a big job and didn't do it. His words, not mine, he added, starting to tremble. Go on, coaxed Tex in a nurturing voice, as a father may do listening to his son's account of a schoolyard fight that he didn't start. Well, he sent us out, not just me, but two more. I saw them, replied Tex, getting a surprised look from the man. You did, so you didn't run, just waited for us. Yep, and then it was only you. Chapter 29 Playing House Honey, I'm home, Tex called, and I have a guest. Wait down here, he told the man he found out on their walk back. Hey, I didn't even get your name. It's Marcus Trey. He laughed, figuring it didn't much matter anymore. I'm Tex, not Trey like everybody thinks. And nope, I'll be answering zilch more questions about my name. Marcus and Anderson are making the big list, he joked. Beth came down, freshly untied, as if she were any other adoring wife coming downstairs to greet a new guest. Tex lagged behind a few stairs as if to say she's been free to move about the entire time. Is he a friend of yours? she asked. I don't know, that remains to be seen. We're just starting out like the first day of a bromance, he said, laughing at his own joke. Anyway, the mayor sent a few guys out looking for me, and Marcus here was the only go-getter in the bunch. Wait a minute, Trey. I mean Tex. I just didn't want to get yelled at for not staying out long enough, that's all. Tex, huh? asked Beth. Well, I guess you two are getting acquainted. First name basis and everything. Like I done said, so far so good for Marcus. Of course, I'm a gambling man. Always have been. Gambling man? asked Marcus. Yep, like I'm the house and you're the player, down to his last dollar. Vegas odds always favor the house. Do you like working for the mayor, Marcus? Sure. Well, no, not really. Don't tell him, though, please. I mean, it's just that he's always barking orders and treats us all like his little pets. 
How about I make us all some lunch and let you boys talk? said Beth in that 1950s dutiful wife voice, complete with the sexy yellow sundress Tex had found her a few houses down the road when rummaging for food and fire. I'm taking orders. Oh, that's all right, babe. We'll be thrilled with whatever you decide. Isn't that right, Marcus? Oh, yes, anything is great. Tex and Marcus sat in the front room between the kitchen and front door. There was only one back door in the house, right off the back of the kitchen that Trey had boarded up from the outside a few days ago. No use having a runner out the back door, he thought, as he nailed the last board on. Beth hadn't seen him do it, but heard the commotion, and her suspicions were correct as she turned the handle quietly and pushed into a hard stop. She jangled a few utensils to cover the sound, and once it was done, she tried no more. The only other way out was past her new man, or out a small window over the sink, and that was too risky to try given her new sense of freedom, if one could call it that. So she whipped up a goulash of sorts, canned roast beef, sweet corn, hard macaroni, and a gravy pouch. Just needs heating, babe, she called back from the kitchen with a smile. The light shone off her silky blonde hair with a touch of curl hanging just below her shoulders, and her yellow sundress silhouette caught both men off guard. Marcus turned away, hoping Tex didn't catch him looking. Well, that's fine, mighty fine, said Tex. Give me a hand, Marcus, out front for a minute, and if you ever look at my girl again, it's lights out on the pronto, comprende? Uh, yes, sir. Sorry about that, he fumbled. Tex aimed to bring the barbecue around the front from the back porch and had meant to do it days ago. Now he had an extra set of hands that he was sure wouldn't run at first chance, and before Beth knew they were gone, he was back in the kitchen being handed her pot to heat. Thank you, darling, he said, kissing her on the head. Her instinct to pull away had been blurred days ago, and it got easier not to flinch. Not that he was her type in any way, but as her dad used to say, life is like driving a mountain road. You get a nice straightaway just before the killer turns peaks and valleys, and if you're lucky enough to bounce off the guardrails when you screw up, you just might survive the trip. I'm bouncing off the fricking guardrails, Dad, like a steel pinball, she whispered, once the men were out front. If only she had paid better attention in chemistry class, she maybe could have mixed a drink that would let her escape. So here we are, gentlemen, not squeezed lukewarm lemonade, but the best we can do on short notice. Fine by me, ma'am, replied Marcus, with a touch of cowboy in his voice, before getting a look from Tex. So, am I staying here, or can I... Nope. You'll go home in a bit, once we talk, that is, and you memorize your script. Script? Yep, the one you're going to tell the mayor and everyone else who works for him, as to why you took this long to return. After an exhaustive house-to-house -house search in this area, there was nothing but regular folk threatening violence and voting choices if their door got knocked on again. If you sell it, he will have no choice but to give it up, or at least start in another area. And if I don't convince him, that's the simplest part. Easy peasy, lemonade squeezy, he said, holding up his glass as if to air toast. If you don't convince him, them, all of them, or you simply rat out our location, you will want to enjoy that last day. Like you got terminal cancer and won't wake up in the morning, he added, with his right hand stroking the knife handle. But. But, he repeated, there is something else. An opportunity of sorts. You see, I'm going to need a right-hand man when I take the whole thing over. The whole what, sir? The town, of course. Do a good job for me and you keep walking, talking, and are slated for a top position. What's he doing here? asked Beth, after the man had left an hour later. He's my fly on the wall, the one close to the mayor that's part disgruntled and part pussy. He's mine for the taking and I intend to use him to get everything we want out of this town. We, as in us? That's right, babe. You done hitched yourself to a suitable wagon. This man here is going places, and I want you by my side every step. Together we'll take it all. Tex lifted her up and carried her upstairs to the bedroom. She didn't fight it. She went numb to another place in her mind, thinking of days gone by that she would never get back. I like this he said after getting cozy. I knew you'd come around. They always do. All of them, she replied, painting a playful smile on her sad face. Everyone I cared to pursue, none as pretty as you, though. Now that's a fact, bonefide. 
You're not so bad yourself, she replied, keeping the mask of joyful deception firmly planted on her cheeks and mouth. It was a look she could turn on and off at will, as she had done so many times before. Only one person in her life never saw it. I'm doing what it takes, Daddy, like you always said, she thought. No more and no less to get home to you and Mom. I hope you'll see me the same as before when I return, she added, with a hand unconsciously resting on her belly. Marcus reported back, skipping only one day, and had news. The mayor has redirected the search and is not interested in upsetting his voter pool in the area by knocking on doors more than once. Plus he's so focused on the right now and getting food to those who are out. I'm not sure how hard he will push. At least until he wins, if he does at all, Marcus added. Hey, you should run. You know, it's not too late. Nah, I want to see who wins. Then I'll turn one job into two if I need to. After that, we let them know who's in town and what we'll do to win. Come on back in a few days and find those books. Me and my lady friend have some work to do. Can't get a family of little ones going without putting in the work and practice makes perfect, they say. The statement was enough to make Beth bolt for the door and be accepting of the consequences. But she didn't, frozen in place like a small animal caught in a leg trap, deciding to chew its own foot off or wait for the inevitable, and not willing to risk two lives to try it. After all, Marcus was in no position to help her, wouldn't believe her story, and didn't have the stomach for the follow-up if he did. She was stuck, and with every passing day it was less exciting, with less passion and determination to make a break for it. Institutionalized, she remembered from a movie about prisoners getting so comfortable with their incarceration that they can't bear to be outside the walls. The fear of the outside world, the free world, dwarfing the gut instinct to break or even be let free. Then where would she go? What would she do? Walk back to California by herself, a pretty woman out on the road with nothing but miles ahead of her, no food, water, or protection. She wouldn't make it down the first mountain, and she knew it. Her choices were two. Do nothing, pretending Tex was the man of her dreams, or at least something she could live with, or end it all, right here. After all, he had given her access to kitchen knives, the big sharp ones to cook with. Did she have the stomach for it, she wondered. Absolutely. Maybe in the right circumstance. Probably not, she settled on. I curse you, Trey, for leaving me, she thought, as if he had the choice. Chapter 30 Recruiting Hank saw it, everything, through his rifle scope, starting with the house and the girl in the yellow dress that he couldn't keep his eye off of. Tex needed no introduction, as Hank observed the man walk down the side of the road and blend seamlessly into the trees long enough to take the third mayor scout hostage. His instinct, muscle memory, he thought, was to take out the knife-wielding man as an enemy of the state, and be done with it once and for all. Maybe it was Martha or the girl his dad had described as pretty that stopped him. Maybe it was the need to see the rest of the story play out. Hank followed Tex and his new captive back to the cabin, never once being spotted by either man. He's good, but not that good, Hank said aloud. Hank caught another glimpse of Beth in the yellow summer dress through the cabin's front window. Whoa, he whispered. Dad, you were not joking or stretching the truth one bit. She's a ten. Maybe a twelve. When she disappeared back into the kitchen, he took stock of everything else. The placement of the kitchen to the front porch, the upper bedrooms, and which may be the one she had been tied up in, and watched Tex and Marcus, a man he recognized and knew as an acquaintance, if not an old friend. They both grew up here, playing sports and partying down by the lake in their high school years. Hank knew Marcus worked for the mayor, but thought of him as an outcast, not the typical buffoon he had working for him. I'm just observing, Mom. As I said, he whispered, choosing to follow Marcus back to town and hoping the Tex guy wouldn't move houses too soon. Getting ahead of Marcus on the trail wasn't hard. He was the star quarterback for the high school, but that was eight years and forty fewer pounds ago. Hey, Marcus, remember me? asked Hank, poised casually at the end of the road. Oh, hey, Hank, Marcus replied nervously. What are you doing out here? I live out here. At least my parents do. How about you? Just out for a walk? Uh, yeah. You know, fresh air never hurt anybody. 
We could have won that last game, you know, if you'd passed to me, said Hank. I know. Trust me, my dad kicked my butt for it. But Johnson was wide open. Can't help it if he's got butterfingers, plus you were double covered. I still would have brought it in, and we'd have gone to state. So what are you doing out here, Marcus? Fresh air, like I said. No, that's only the half of it, even less probably. See, you have a big problem and you don't even know how deep you are in a mess. You've been watching me, is that it? All day. And I know a lot more about the guy you were just with than you do. I'm listening. But don't ask me a bunch of questions I won't answer, said Marcus. Fair enough. Let's see if I have things straight. The mayor sent you to find a guy called Tex. Your buddies bailed, but not you. Kept going until you didn't. Tex could have killed you right there with his knife, but he didn't. You saw that? Yep, and the rest too. There's a girl named Beth. Can't miss her in that yellow dress. And he's been keeping her hostage, tied up and all. Now wait a minute, Marcus replied. I didn't see any of that. She even made lunch. Didn't you see the bruises on her right wrist? Regardless, she's a prisoner, clarified Hank. And he's tried to kill at least one person that I'm aware of. Plus those posters all over town and the word is, he's got something to do with those people getting killed out on the highway a little while back. He's bad news. And I couldn't hear you talking. But I can see you are involved. I'm not involved in anything, he stated firmly. You are whether you like it or not. So you can talk to me and we'll figure this out together, or you can get deeper into the mess and may or may not live to see another week. He's scary, said Marcus, in a near whisper and looking around. Not a 200-pound defensive tackle with an open shot on the quarterback, but deathly kind of scary. If I say anything, he'll kill me. He told me so. I think he could, no matter what you do so you can let an old friend help you out or take your chances. Either way, I'm going for him. Just so we're on the same page, said Marcus. You could let the sheriff know where he is and let them take care of it if the situation was just about a dangerous man in town. But then, who knows what would happen to the girl. Maybe she falls for one of the deputies, like those girls in movies who have an eye for the man who saves them. Love at first rescue, I think they call it. Or maybe they find a way to get her back to wherever she's from. I know it's not around here because I would never forget that face and how she fills out a dress. Tell me it's about the girl, and we can keep talking. I just want to hear it. Maybe you're right. Okay, it's about the girl. Everyone says she is the prettiest girl up here, and I've dated most, as you know. It's also about country. I've served, and just because I've come home with fewer body parts doesn't mean I enjoy hanging out at the coffee shop all day like an official member of the retired ladies' bridge club. I was trained to fight, and I have a chance to use those skills, save a girl, and help the town. Sounds like a hat trick to me. Marcus was scared, sort of, like the Doc Holliday character in that movie where he said something like, I might not be as sick as I let on, right before he kills the feared Johnny Ringo. He had a plan formulating in his head on the walk back. Option one. He could tell the mayor where Tex was hiding, and if they got him first, all would be okay. The second was the longer-term play. After all, who knew the outcome of the mayoral race, now just days away from voting? And if Mayor Haskins lost, Marcus was out of a job. Even if he won the race, Tex meant to take them both out, is what Marcus heard, or read between the lines, possibly. He was torn between the two, and now Hank proposed a third option. Spill your guts and let me take care of him. Hank loved combat in the military, but the fine art of interrogation kept his interest above all. Spotting a liar, or one who greatly embellished the truth, was day one type of training. Maybe it was why he never kept a girlfriend for more than a few weeks. Unfortunately, Marcus was flat out lying, acting more scared than calculating, and Hank chose to push the envelope. I thought that Tex guy was going to slit your throat, Marcus. Why do I think that? Because he had no emotion as he put the blade up close, no expression. Dead eyes. No pleasure, no nervous tick, no hint of sadness, nothing. That's a killer either trained or homegrown. Like you, Hank. I said either homegrown or trained. God bless these United States and what we must do to protect her. It's not even close to the same thing. So you saw me with Tex. You watched that? Yep, every second through my scope. Then why didn't you do anything? 
I had to see how it would play out. Had he done it, I would have dropped him a second later and been justified. An eye-for-an-eye type scenario. When he didn't, I knew you two had struck a deal. What was it? Nothing much. Just don't tell the mayor where he and the girl are staying. You mean Beth, the one held captive against her will. Huh? Marcus sighed, putting his hands to his head. Yeah, that one. Hank didn't buy it, except that Marcus and he may be vying for the same girl, as they did in high school. Of course, Hank was up two to zero, and the motorcycle and bad boy image back then didn't hurt. Mayor race coming up. If yours loses, you're out of a job, said Hank. Chapter 31 The Colonel no Colonel O'Sullivan got his small group transferred to Fort Carson, Colorado, on the seventh day after it started. One favor was cashed in already, and he took stock of the rest he had earned over his career. He was the kind of man that cultivated relationships and built up favors owed, never intending to cash them in. Now he would, no matter the ask. Everything had changed, and the road back for family and country alike would be hard and dangerous. As promised, his first sight was the always tough neighborhood of Washington Park in the Windy City. Private Bobby's wife, Lara, and son were stuck, like everyone else, and rationing food that wouldn't last more than a few weeks, a month tops. They hadn't left their home since the first day, afraid to walk the streets day or night. They had talked about something like this happening, as did many military families. Those who deployed had seen the collapse of the once great countries all over the globe. The talking part was easy, and the preparing part was always after the next tour. Lara knew her Bobby would find a way back. The question was how and when. Bobby, Jr., was non-verbal at age nine, but she learned to read him and did her best to comfort and keep him safe from the gunshots and escalating yelling just down the street. The colonel didn't have the helicopter he had imagined, even planned for, but he secured three Humvees and firepower to dissuade most from blocking their way. The irony was they were heading east from Fort Carson instead of north towards his daughter Shannon's last known location. But a promise was made, and he would get her last. The team was counting on it. Fort Carson to Chicago was just over 1,000 miles and a 15-hour drive before the day. The two-day trip was now 10 at 100 miles per day at best. Small arms skirmishes and navigation workarounds added another four days, and Bobby was expecting a nasty welcome. The truth of it was that the toughest part of Chicago was now just another town, another part of the new United States, no worse and no better. Bobby was the first to his front door, cautious and with a pit in his stomach. They had talked about a similar scenario, but nothing exactly like what happened. He had good neighbors, but that was before, and he wasn't sure what to expect now. His wife greeted him at the door peering through the peephole and greeting him with a hug the size of Texas. "'What's he doing here?' asked Bobby, pointing to a neighbor he was more acquainted with than friends sitting in the back of the front room. The consummate bachelor looked for opportunities to befriend lonely or married women whose husbands were out of town or deployed, working to save the lives of ordinary citizens. A parasite to most, and a man Bobby would have never let in his home before the day. Raoul was his name— from somewhere south, and he was a charmer his whole life. Never time for a wife or girlfriend, he always had his eyes on something taken, and if he was lucky, available for rent. Bobby and his real friends in the neighborhood steered clear of him, yet here he was in Bobby's living room, holding his only son. Take him out back now, he told his wife. Take our son out back, he repeated. I was just checking up on them, said Raoul. They seem fine. Nah. You've never once been to my house when I was here. The last time you tried to come over, we had the talk. Remember? Sure, that was a while ago, but now things are different. We thought you weren't coming home. Did you? Sleep with your wife? Yes, did you? No, but that doesn't mean I didn't try. Another week or so, and we would be having a different conversation, soldier boy. Yes, things are different, Bobby replied with his blood boiling, pulling his pistol and leveling it at the man's head. Too different, he said, firing a single shot to the man's forehead, knocking him to the floor. Colonel Sullivan didn't flinch or move. Neither did his soldiers, with the only screams coming from Bobby's wife outside. Things were different now, and family was family. 
Time to go, said the colonel. Fill a backpack and no more, he told Bobby. His wife covered his son's eyes and glanced at the downed man with a look of pity and relief that told Bobby his foe had told the truth. I didn't, she said. I know, honey. Let's get packed up. The essentials only, he told her, handing his son to another soldier. This is Evelyn. She'll watch you for a bit. His boy didn't respond but understood, putting his arms tightly round her neck. Twenty minutes later they had everything that was important to them crammed into a single bag, like refugees fleeing a war-torn country with nothing but a few reminders of their old life and a heap of hope and prayer for something like it once again. Evelyn was next, a badass. Yes, I'll get it done, soldier who loved her family more than life. Her husband Gordon, or Gordy as most called him, the goofy smart tech guy and tenured professor at the university, often got teased that she could take him out with a single chokehold if he ever acted up. He would laugh, not disagreeing, and would unapologetically announce she was the love of his life ever since his crush on her in junior high school, and not a thousand horses could drag him from her. He makes me laugh and as smart as anyone I've ever met, she would say, and he's not half bad in the looks department, she would add. Together they had three children, two girls and one boy between the ages of three and fifteen. Two hundred thirty miles to the south was Bloomington, Indiana, about fifty miles southwest of Indianapolis, once known for its beautiful limestone that was used to make buildings, including much of the university. It was more recently known as an art-smart college town with breweries and water. Evelyn was the high school cheerleader who eventually settled with the head of the math club, and he wasn't even wealthy. Their five-bedroom house had a root cellar converted into a long-term storage room under the garage before their first child was walking age. Neither spoke of it to the kids, and the spider webs at the entrance kept curious minds from digging into more. Gordy always knew she would make it home, and heading out to find her was a fool's mission. They had provisions set aside for years to include a few other families, neighbors, friends, and the like. But it was the kids that had him worried. Many of Indiana University's population of more than 40,000 students were from in-state, those able to make it home with a long walk. But the others, out-of-state and international students, well, they were stuck, hundreds or even thousands of miles from home, and only a few willing to risk it all and head out on the road. These were the kids he set out to help, a little at first, and by the time she returned it was a full-on Operation Forgotten Student. This is quite the operation you have here, Gordy, said the colonel. Thank you, sir. We've been planning for this for a while, but never thought it would get this bad so quickly. We came here to take your family back to Fort Carson, but it looks like you have other plans. We can't leave. These students need us, and we need them. I know you need to keep my wife for a while. She can stay. We'll finish it. No, I can't, said Evelyn. With all due respect, sir, I signed on until we were done and that means everyone is located and gets to decide what's next for them, however long that takes. That's what I expected you to say, he replied with a chuckle. Shouldn't be too long, Gordy. Can you take a couple of hours and show me your operation? Of course, Colonel, he responded eagerly. The soup kitchen of sorts was set up on university grounds for the more than 8,000 students still stuck away from home. Here it is, sir. It's not pretty, but it works so far. When did the other students leave? There were about 20,000 that left in the first two weeks heading home, wherever that is. I can't blame them. They are smart kids, and new things have changed for a long time, if not permanently. Plus, we didn't have anything set up right away. We were just trying to feed people who were hungry, but not in an organized manner. You're feeding 8,000 people. How? At this point, we have a lot of volunteers, hunters, fishermen, and even some of the local farmers who have joined with their livestock and farmland for crops. Right now, everyone gets rice or corn soup with whatever meat and vegetables we can add in. It takes a lot of meat, bovine or venison, fish, and smaller animals to make that much soup. It's a losing battle moving forward. It takes a while though, right? The crops, I mean. Yes, sir, it does. So now we are pooling everything we can find and I'm not the only one with large stores of food. It's not perfect, but every day more citizens join the group, and the local police force keeps us all honest. So far nobody has gone hungry, but it can't last long without government support. 
FEMA camps are being set up as we speak all across the country, said the colonel. I'll put in a good word and see if the military can escalate some help with your town. Wait, wait, sir. No disrespect. But the whole reason we prepped and saved supplies was not to end up in a government camp, where we have no choices and are kept like cattle for our own protection. Gordon, said Evelyn, like a concerned parent of a young boy. No, it's okay, said the colonel. Between us, I wouldn't step foot in a place like that if I had an alternative like this for my family. Are you willing to run it? We already do, said Gordy, getting a rare smile out of the colonel. Let me see what I can do. The trip back to Utah was the longest the colonel had endured in a while. Ogden was just outside Salt Lake City, and the 1,600-mile trip took them within 100 miles of Estes Park, near the three-quarter mark of the trip. Only his girlfriend, Caitlin, asked why he wouldn't stop there first. The soldiers knew better. Chapter 32 The Truth Tex was consumed with the thought of starting a family with the most beautiful woman he had ever laid eyes on. They had only been together in that way for a week or two, but he already had things planned out in his head, like a young woman may envision her wedding day. Seven, eight, maybe nine little Texes, one per year, unless they were twins, of course. Barefoot and pregnant, the old adage that was more of an insensitive meme nowadays still rang true to him. He remembered seeing part of that reality show at some greasy dive bar where the couple had 19, or was it 20 kids? And through all the drama, they seemed happy to keep trying, as long as her body held out. He would daydream of a farmhouse overstuffed with kids and a dutiful wife cooking all day, and greeting him before supper with a drink and a kiss. Other patrons told the bartender to turn it off, but not him. Turn it up, he would say not caring what any other patrons thought. It was his guilty pleasure and the most feminine thing he had willingly sat through since his mom made him and his sisters watch a movie called Beaches when he was a little kid. The one good thing his dad ever did was pull him from that movie halfway through to dig for fishing worms after a summer rain. Didn't matter. The worms died three days later, as his dad's promise of taking him to the lake went the way of everyone before. It stung less each time, and by age ten he didn't expect anything, promised or otherwise. He asked Marcus to go to the city library for him and check out a book on pregnancy and anything that could help with home birth. He returned the following day with two and mentioned nothing of his meeting with Hank out on the road. We're good, about the mayor, that is. He won't be back in this area again, and here are the books you asked for. They had a two-book limit on medical ones, so it was the best I could do. Hmm. Huh said Tex, holding up the first. The Complete Guide to Home Births, 6th edition, and so you're going to be a parent. The Ultimate Guide, 2nd edition. New editions mean updates, that's good, said Tex, never more eager to dive into a book, any book. He sent Marcus back to town to be his fly on the wall at the mayor's office and report back in a few days. He spent the next two days devouring the books, not even showing Beth until he was confident he could broach the subject armed with the knowledge to get her excited about the idea and comfortable with natural birth. On the third day, she threw up early in the upstairs toilet. She couldn't hide this one, as she had done the others over the past week. Tex set down his book with a worried look on his face. What's the matter, babe? He said, slowly climbing the stairs. Nothing. I'm okay. Just have a tickle in my throat. The start of a cold, maybe. <laughs> Sounds a bit more than that, he replied. Maybe some bad food, she suggested. It's hard to tell nowadays with everything being canned or packaged. Thanks for checking on me, though. It's the third time this week, he said, knocking his knuckle on his front tooth in a nervous gesture. What are you saying? she asked, and soon wished she hadn't. Sounds like morning sickness. What? she asked adding the shock to her voice and hoping he bought it. She did think the first time was a bug, but even she knew a pattern was a pattern. Now time to get him on board if her circumstance was what she hoped it wasn't. Sounds like morning sickness, he repeated. Ah, uh, she paused, wishing she had rehearsed this part in her head. You know, we've been together a couple of times, and who knows what could have happened. Three. What? Three times in the past one and a half weeks, he clarified. Yeah, that sounds about right, she replied. 
I don't know much about it, but I've heard morning sickness can happen any time. Any time after the deed is done. Any time, huh? He asked. <laughs> That's what I've heard from more than one friend when she was pregnant, she said, walking down to the kitchen as he followed close behind. <laughs> Staring out the kitchen window, she saw him watching her through binoculars. Hank wasn't trying to hide and stood boldly in the middle of the road, lowering them to his side. Tex saw him too. How could he not? A friend of yours? he asked, reaching for the hunting rifle he acquired a few cabins down the road. No, I've never seen him before, she replied. Marcus brought me a couple of books from the library on pregnancy, he continued, never taking his eyes off Hank. Can you imagine? It says sickness in the morning can happen quickly in some women, as quickly as two weeks and any time after that once the sexy time has started. He paused, waiting for her response. Uh, uh, two weeks, she whispered. Two weeks. Beth was at a loss for words as they both did the simple math. That Trey fella? No, not him, never even once. Alex? he asked, turning red in the face and bawling his fists. I don't know, she replied softly, starting to cry. We hope you have enjoyed this story. If you have, please share this audiobook with a friend. Your friend will appreciate it, and the Gigabizzle Buppenheimers of the algorithm will like it too. Thank you.